All right, good morning, everybody. I would like to call to order the April 10th, 2024 meeting of the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors and this second day of budget workshops for fiscal year 2024 to 2025. Madam Clerk, can we get a roll call, please? Supervisor Nelson? Here. Supervisor Williams? Here. Supervisor Caps? Here. Supervisor Hartman? And Chair Lavanino? I'm here and Supervisor Hartman is on her way. There was a lot of traffic on the 101 today, so she'll be here in just a moment. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item of business is the CEO's report. Do we have a report this morning? No report this morning. All right. And then are there any announcements or changes to our agenda today? Chair Lavanino and members of the board, I have a couple quick announcements this morning. I would just like to note for members of the public that intend to address the board, there will be an opportunity for public comment at the conclusion of each functional group and special is issue presentation. If you are registering to provide verbal public comment through Zoom, please note which functional group you would like to speak on in your online registration. General public comment for today's for items not on today's agenda will be at the conclusion of today's budget workshop schedule. And for the Board of Supervisors' methods of public participation and to provide public comment on general public comment or a functional group, please see page two of today's agenda. Individuals who would like to provide verbal public comment may do so via Zoom by registering in advance via the link available on page two. If you have any questions, please contact the Clerk of the Board's office at area code 805-568-2240. Again, that number is 805-568-2240. That concludes my announcements for today. All right, and Supervisor Hartman is here. I mentioned the traffic was extremely bad today. So, yeah, let's go back to public works and figure out when we're gonna get that 101 Caltrans. All right, so that brings us to the second day of budget workshops for fiscal year 2024-25. I'll now turn it over to CEO Mona Miyasato. Thank you, Supervisors. Um, as you know, today we'll be hearing from the rest of our departments, hopefully. And so I'm going to hand it over to Stephen Yee, who will give the overview for this next group. Good morning, Chair Lavanino and members of the board. Um, we're gonna to begin today with the Health and Human Services Functional Group. Uh, this group is comprised of the Public Health Department, First Five, Social Services, Behavioral Wellness, and Child Support Services. This functional group makes up just over a third of overall county operating expenditures, and because this group receives the majority of their funding from state and federal sources, they make up just 7% of the county's GFC at just over $27 million. They do, have, however, make up 42% of the county's overall FTE at just shy of 2000 and it should be noted that three out of the uh, county's four largest departments in terms of total FTE are included in this functional group. Here we show the five-year trend of operating revenue, and you'll see that GFC allocated to the three departments that receive GFC has stayed flat over the five-year period. You'll also notice that operating revenues in BWell and DSS have increased substantially over the most three recent years. Increases in BWell are mainly due to increases in state realignment revenue, as well as state and federal grant revenue and Medi-Cal revenue related to CalAIMS behavioral health payment reform. Social services increases are mainly attribute, attributable to increases in realignment revenue, as well as various state and federal assistance programs. For the five-year trend of operating expenditures, you'll see that the trends largely match the operating revenue and GFC trends from the previous slide. Child support services, first five, and public health are all are mostly flat or showing slight increases, while BWell and social services are showing significant growth. BWell's increases are mainly due to increases in staffing and service contract costs related, related to the delivery of mental health and drug and alcohol treatment and prevention programs. Increased expenditures for social services are largely due to increases in staffing for protective economic assistance and workforce development services as well as increases in cash assistance payments. 
As for FTE, we see a recurring theme of child support services, first five, and public health remaining flat over the five-year period. You'll notice that BWL's FTE count increased in fiscal year 23-24, primarily due to the addition of about 17 FTE in support of the CalAIM implementation and ongoing requirements. But FTE are being held relatively flat in fiscal year 24-25. Social services FTE have been holding flat, but are showing increases in both of the two most recent years due to 48 FTE added in fiscal year 23-24 to expand various protective and economic assistance services, and 71 FTE added in fiscal year 24-25 to primarily support an expansion of the CalFresh program related to a change in state funding methodology. Here we highlight the major challenges and initiatives of the functional group. Major challenges include difficulties in hiring qualified staff, uncertainty of revenues driven by changing legislation, and lastly, there's an increased need for resources in providing jail, medi medical, and behavioral health care provider monitoring. Significant initiatives being undertaken are the CalAIM Medical Health healthcare reform implementation and the behavioral health linkages and Medi-Cal pre-release services in the juvenile hall and jail. Another major initiative includes establishing shared data systems and improving sharing to, to assist in referrals between departments and promote streamlined services to residents. Next, we'll provide a high-level summary of each department's budgeted sources and, and uses of funds. The majority of public health's revenue is generated through charges for services at nearly 57 million, which largely consists of Medi-Cal at their eight clinics. Intergovernmental state and federal funding is also a major source at just over 32 million and is mostly utilized by the Disease Pre Prevention and Health Promotion Budget Program. Here we see that the majority of first five sources come from state funding and is used primarily for their core investment and program support budget program. For social services, you'll see that the majority of their funding comes from inter intergovernmental revenue at 218 million, which includes realignment, as well as state and federal dollars for assistance and protective services programs. Most of behavioral wellness's funding comes from intergovernmental revenue at about 94 million, which consists of realignment dollars and Mental Health Services Act funds. Their charges for services are also a major funding source at 78.6 million, which is largely, largely comprised of Medi-Cal. These sources primarily fund the department's mental health outpatient and community services. And lastly, we have child support services whose primary funding source is intergovernmental state and federal revenue, which funds, funds the department's core case management collections activities. Bye. And that concludes the health and human services functional group summary. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Yi, uh, we'll kick off with uh, the Director of Public Health, Mohanad Hamami. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Supervisors. Good morning. I'm happy to present to you our budget for the Public Health Department. And with me, by the way they are seated, is Gus Pejea, who is our interim CFO. And next to him is Lars Seifert, who is our Chief Division for Regulatory Services. Dana Gamble, who is our Deputy Director for PCFH. Melissa Beebe, who is on her four-week appointment as our new Deputy of Administration. <laughs> and Dr. Henning Ansorg, who is our Health Officer. Our department provides comprehensive services that are not only pure, uh, purely public health in the sense of the essential services, the 10 essential services of protecting, preventing, and assessment of overall the general health of the public, but we also provide, we are a safety net that provide much needed clinical as well as social support and uh, to those that are vulnerable and the population that is mostly underserved in our county. Our operating budget is about $108,790,000. Uh, we are using a one time only about $5.2 million for ongoing operations. Approximately $4.2 million of these are used 
to fund our clinic operation. Our clinics have been uh, impacted by the loss of the 340B program as well as some other declining revenues. Uh, for, uh, the other part is about 435,000 for environmental health and about 460,000 for animal services. We do have capital projects. We, we will go into more details, about $400,000, and this is including some of updates for our public health lab where we are acquiring a droplet PCR, a new pharmacy software, as well as vision screening spot checks for our clinics. General fund contribution is close to $10 million, and of which mostly uh, goes to, uh, about eight million goes into our public health fund, and 1.7 million for animal services, and 110,000 for environmental health. Our total FTEs are 530. We do not have any service level reductions, nor we are uh, asking for restoration or expansions. More details on our capital projects. We are acquiring a new pharmacy software that would help with the administration inventory and uh, uh, billing for our pharmacies. This is a two-year project with a total of 360,000. For this year, we're allocating $121,000 and it started last year, so this is the second year. We also have been uh, using the $900,000 that we got last year with the help of the CEO's office and, the, and Congressman Carbajal's in uh, uh, a federally, uh, a congressionally directed federal grant where we are using this to remodel some of our clinics. For this year, we're allocating $745,200 to improve our Lompoc Health Center to provide better access for our patients, increase their, improve their patient experience, as well as purchasing a, and upgrading our emergency backup power. We also have another capital project for our Santa Maria uh, Health Center, where we are remodeling the entrance as well as relocating the clinical lab and adding more space for exam room, and that is a total of $140,700. We have a $100,000 that are allocated from the cannabis tax, and this, is, this goes to a 0.5 FTE health educator that works in our tobacco prevention and uh, cannabis education. So specifically, that funds half of a health educator that advocates for cannabis use and uh, advocates for the education of cannabis in uh, youth as well as pregnant women. And uh, our staffing summary uh, has changed slightly. We are decreasing by 3.6 FTEs. It's a combination of adding and, and deducting. Uh, in total, our major changes are we're increasing two FTEs that are going to be added to our whole person care. This is a new initiative that we are uh, doing as a pilot with several of our county, other county departments. And this is funded by the ARPA uh, funds. We are decreasing close to 4.4 uh, FTEs, mostly in the clinics. These are unfunded positions, so we're reducing those. Uh, three are AOPs at our Carpinteria, Franklin, and Santa Maria, uh, and Lompoc, and one MA in Franklin. So the AOPs, just to, to correct myself, in Carprin, Lompoc, and Santa Maria, and an MA in Franklin. Again, these are unfunded, and we're using that as a mitigation for some uh, cost. Uh, we are also decreasing 1.1 decreasing in our admin unit. One is an unfunded health educator, and we have switched one position for our new equity wellness promotion and prevention program that is funded by the Future of Public Health. Our operating budget is close to 109 million. Uh, it increases this year by 6%, which is almost $6 million. The increase is mostly 3.3 uh, uh, 3 .3 million in salaries and benefits due to negotiated wage increases and, and other expenses, as well as almost 2 million in services and supplies. And we have close to almost 1 million that is due to higher rates in utilities and charges from other departments. Our accomplishments are several. Um, we're, we're happy to report that some of those uh, relate to most where we need to be more efficient. Our uh, implementation of Project PetSafe in animal services is uh, preventing 
illness and reducing the incidence of illnesses in, in the pet in our communities. Um, our ECM, which is the Enhanced Care Management uh, Program, is uh, going to be implemented. We have started that last year in partnership with Shenkal, and this certainly is a, uh, a holistic approach to wellness where we are addressing clinical as well as social needs and other support services. Our uh, most uh, of our proudest, I guess, uh, accomplishments, which we hope to become our signature mark every year, is our back to school health fairs, where last year we held three big events where we served 1,600 attendees and families that were preparing to go back to school, where we provided school physicals as well as school supplies. This year we are adding uh, childhood immunizations and expanding our scope as well for services provided. We piloted our street medicine program, which built on our outreach program. You all heard the, the, the words of our employee of the month uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this is, again, one of the programs that we're very proud of uh, moving forward. Uh, the difference is that we added a provider that goes with the team now, a clinician. Uh, since J July of 2023, they devoted uh, uh, 328 hours of outreach, of which 100 hours were clinical care, and we served more than 150 patients with needs that vary from urgent care to counseling about substance abuse and referring to MAT. We also completed our community health needs assessment in partnership with health systems, specifically Cottage Health. This is a step towards our accreditation program where we are now working on our CHIP, which is our community health improvement plan that looks at where services are needed and what programs we need to establish. We also are moving as part of our Renew uh, commitment, we're moving into our data management system to establish one platform. We're moving many of our public health programs to be on the same electronic health record that the clinics have, which is epic, and we have moved several, but we are continuing to do so. Our goals and objectives stem from our strategic plan, which we started last uh, November, where team uh, of the leadership and staff agreed that we have four strategic priorities, specifically investing in our workforce. We need to make sure that our uh, team is well engaged, as well as we are providing the skills and talents and the training needed for our team to function as truly one team. We are enhancing our communication both internally and externally. Again, there is a lot of uh, work that is being done internally as part of how we communicate through programs, but also we want to make sure that the public know what we provide and the services that are available and make sure that we're visible based on our role as a public health department. We are also promoting health equity, and, and not only health, but equity in general. We're doing that both internally at the organization level. We are also looking at our services to make sure that we have an equitable service model, but we're also looking at our communities and with community partners. How do we ensure that equity is something that we practice across everything that we do? And finally, we're using data and technology as both a tool for management, but also a tool that tells our story. So we're using a lot of data-driven programming and program design, but we're also working on a dashboard that both have inter internal and external interface that can show a little bit of the progress and uh, uh, tell our story of what we are doing for the public. Our emerging issues are not different than any of uh, other departments, specifically in terms of recruiting and retaining uh, qualified staff. We have a high turnover due to retirements. Most of our team members are here for at least a minimum of average 20 years, and they are moving along, which we are very happy for their service. But with that, we also are losing a lot of, of uh, institutional memory and knowledge. So recruiting the right people, as well as retaining them with everything, all the challenges that we are having, is still something of concern. We also have to redesign how we are delivering services, and we are redesigning some of our workflow to accommodate new initiatives such as CalAIM and the EPT program, which is equity practice transformation specifically at relate, as it relates to our uh, clinics. Um, animal services is still something that we are uh, uh, looking for. We had a very smoother operation with uh, since our, our director and since I took over last year, um, but we are still seeing a lot of demand, a lot more strays, and we are 
uh, definitely looking for uh, better models and solutions. And we continue to implement efficiencies, specifically in our clinics. We're looking at productivity as well as increasing revenue while we mitigate costs because we don't want to be reliant on our fund balance as we are now. Uh, some of our performance measures are uh, uh, listed in, in the D pages, but just to highlight a few, uh, we are increasing our medical assigned uh, lives for our health centers. Um, uh, and as you can see, it's an upward trend, which is great because that means the more visits then the more services we are providing to our community members, but also it's more revenue. We also are looking at uh, health outcomes and population health management. As you can see, uh, for example, our uh, diabetes control has been steadily improving. Our WIC services are also expanding, and we are close to almost 100% for those that are enrolled in WIC that also are receiving food assistance benefits. And finally, we are focusing on customer satisfaction and many of our programs. One highlighted here is environmental services because we want to ensure that while we are the regulatory service, that we are doing that in a educational and friendly manner that it also is, is welcomed by those that we are trying to regulate. Our KPMG, uh, all of our KPMG recommendations are implemented are, are, and are in progress. We are using EPIC, as, which is our electronic health record, as a tool to monitor uh, financial performance as well as productivity in our clinics. We have established a five-year strategic plan for our health centers that is currently in execution, and we also are looking at animal services where we're using uh, monthly reports that report on KPIs, metrics, and other measures that are shared and are directing how we operate in terms of managing our animal services. There are no service level reductions as, as reported, and uh, in, in summary, um, it has been three challenging years for our team and our staff members. Uh, not a secret that we had a epidemic that, that we, we worked through, and the burnout has been quite uh, evident, and as we are now getting to whatever we can constitute as the new normal, then this is something that we are truly looking and, and is a necessity to invest in our workforce. We also, as, as mentioned, are communicating where we want to uh, eliminate the silos, we want to functioning, function as truly one department. We have came a long way in the last year, but there are still things that we need to do in terms of marrying programs together and making sure that we are, again, have a, a better service uh, across all the department. And definitely, uh, we are a department that is very rich in data, and we have tons of reports. As you saw, one example is the opioid uh, death data, but how do we use those data and reports into programs, and how do we use them to also monitor how effective our role is? Lastly, I leave you with the words of Halford Edward Lukak, who is, a, who is a prominent American Methodist minister, but also a professor of humilities at the Yale Divinity School back in 1938, which truly epitomizes how we function as a team. No one can whistle a symphony. It takes a whole orchestra to play it. We are ready for any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you. Questions from the board? Supervisor Williams. <clears throat> sure. Um, I'd say one of the big picture uh, questions is, you know, your department's personnel have put in so much hard work in uh, the, the response to COVID, um, worked very long hours, high stress, high scrutiny. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my, I guess my concern has been the, you know, the letdown that happens afterwards when the world partially tries to move on um, and, um, and they're still there having the mission. Um, and how, you know, what are you and your team doing to make sure morale improves, uh, which I think is an, a, just a vital part of retaining the amazing workforce that we have? Thank you, Supervisor. This is a, a one of our biggest priority and definitely something that I personally 
wanted to address upon uh, taking this role. I, I think, and I would probably ask the team to weigh in, we have implemented several uh, employee engagement uh, strategies as well as communication that are building on improving how we interact, but also towards the morale boost. So we have uh, put uh, several programs that recognize our heroes. We established our Public Health uh, Star, which is a monthly program to recognize the work of our heroes that are on front line. I personally established a open line of communication where we have coffee with the director. Anyone can have coffee. They, they bring the coffee, I bring the sweets, and I know it's not too uh, nutritionally sound, but we can cheat every now and then. Yeah. And uh, those meetings have been proven to be very effective in listening to some of the concerns that might be lost in the old model of going through the hierarchy. So this is an open communication where no boundaries, no filters, we do that. One of the things, and thank you for joining us, we did a staff appreciation cookout in, in celebration of uh, public health uh, week uh, where we decided, okay, the leaders are now going to serve our staff and we had myself, Lars, and Dr. Ansorg and many of our executives cooking and serving, again, not too healthy uh, treats, uh, hamburgers and hot dogs. But again, these events are certainly things that we believe are going to bring us stepwise into where we want to head. Um, and, and although these are simple things, but because of the pandemic, because of the isolation, they've been lost and we are now reestablishing. We are hearing a lot from our team members that, oh, we used to all have lunch together and now we feel everyone is so uh, isolated and all that, so, so that is one. Two, we are engaging them more and more in the, the um, decision making. So our strategic plan was not done by the top seven or the top 10 or the top 15. Our strategic plan was done as a whole department survey where we had about 160 people weigh in into what is important to them. Um, our cultural organization survey showed a lot of satisfaction in people with the role they have in understanding their mission and how they contribute to the mission. But we show also lower scores when it said um, we are not too inclusive and we're not too diverse. So this is something that we are working on. Um, for our cabinet re retreat, we expanded our cabinet from eight members to 30 cabinet members. They meet every week, uh, every month. And now this meeting is recorded and posted on our team channel that anyone from our department can look and, and, and know what is happening. Those were always that we don't know what's going on. Now it is so transparent, so out there, and they're welcome to provide feedback. So it is a slow progress, but I think, and, and again, I ask the team, and I see some head nodding, that um, we are getting closer and closer to whatever it is that we want as, again, the new norm. Um, I, I conclude to your question is that uh, it is unfortunate that we are uh, forgetting what happened. There's a, an Arabic proverb that says, in the darkest night, the full moon is mostly missed. And while we wanted that full moon during the pandemic, now that there is no pandemic, then they tend to forget the public or, or the funders in, in higher places about the role, the essential role that we play. And I hope that this is not the case. So, so we are moving towards that. Well, this board is not forgotten. So, um, and then just a, uh, more to move on to a micro question. You know, uh, we we desperately need a full time veterinarian. You, you know this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and um, I, I, I've spoken to the union. They're willing to uh, agree to a, a higher wage scale, um, and hoping that uh, we could have in the budget instead of this large chunk for contract work have a, a, a you know a position in it um, and and of course if we don't hire then we go to contract work but but the goal should be a, 
a, a full-time veterinarian, not the contract worker. I couldn't agree more, Supervisor, absolutely. And it wasn't that we were not trying. In fact, we were very close and we had a candidate that after offering the position and they saw how much we're paying and how much it's gonna cost to live here, they declined the offer. So definitely our work and we're working with our HR uh, colleagues in, and negotiating with the union to one, have it as a non-represented position, then negotiating an increase in salary because as you said, if we look at how much we're paying for contracted services and with a salary increase, I think it will be an even wash. So it is something that we're moving for and hopefully with that, then we are able to attract a, a full-time veterinarian. Great, Supervisor Hartman. Um, how long have you been here now, Director Hamami? Uh, by uh, April, it will be a month, and, uh, a year and three months. It feels like a month. Well, I was, <laughs> I, I was just kind of listing some of your achievements, uh, you know, the strategic plan, the whole person care, the equity, wellness, and uh, prevention program, the back to school health fund, uh, street medicine, uh, the data dashboards telling the story, the Cal AIM. I mean, this is, uh, within that period of time, I think just an enormous accomplishment and tremendously grateful for all the work uh, of you and your staff. And uh, I'm really excited to hear how you're engaging everyone who works in the organization to make it uh, better, but, but that spirit of innovation. Uh, and I, a, a special call out uh, to Lars. Uh, he's been just extraordinary in helping uh, on issues, for example, of uh, restaurant permitting and how to make that easier for people uh, on our website, even though the regulations can't be streamlined themselves, they come from the state, working on, on food trucks and just uh, all of that. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm just tremendously impressed by the direction of, of your department. Um, I, I did have a couple of questions. One, I just, the, the adult diabetic uh, the the going from 71 to 80 percent. I mean that <coughs> diabetes is a scourge on our you know population. How how did that happen? Uh, so uh, if you're talking about the A1C, yeah. So this is an improvement actually. We Th that's yeah yes. huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, better management, better follow-up. We are looking as well as to increase that, especially with the enhanced care management. So. We know that diabetes control is not only following your doctor's orders, but it's also something that you need to have the right nutrition, the right physical activity, and even something as simple as uh, having a refrigerator to, to store your insulin if needed. So these are things that with uh, looking at the holistic approach of complete wellness and the social uh, factors involved in all that is going to increase. But definitely it is something that our clinical team has put a lot of effort to improve. And uh, I am, uh, again, thank you for your kind words. The, the accomplishments we had were truly because of the talented and dedicated team that we have and we continue to, to do so. Uh, and then, uh, again, uh, so adult diabetes is changing individual behavior. You can't just take a pill. And so those numbers really uh, show, I think, then, that uh, dealing with the social determinants of health can make a difference. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a question mark for me. It's an experiment, but this is one piece of evidence that says yes. And not to spoil any surprises, but uh, upcoming attractions for next year is we're looking at a diabetes prevention program and we're trying to get a grant from the CDC to uh, not only manage better, but also to prevent it. So these are the pre-diabetics that, as you said, through lifestyle modification and, and nutrition and, and diet can be prevented into going into a full diabetes. And then, like Supervisor Williams, uh, as you know, I'm very concerned about animal services. I've adopted a number of your animals, uh, our animals as a county, uh, and glad to hear that about the veterinarian. I, I was just listening to uh, Los Angeles City as having uh, their, their shelters are overloaded two times, three times, in some cases, what they're designed to hold, so they've now uh, taken major measures to uh, limit 
any any breeding licenses i guess they've got that program there i know our shelters are are feeling increased pressures especially people get that they want to rent a new building there and and the rents are not allowing the rent the landlords aren't allowing pets to come and so they end up at our shelters people are after covid maybe they can't keep that dog that they wanted so much so uh, I'm really excited about our program that fosters, but I, I am concerned that with this increased pressure, how do we have enough resources? I know we're looking at license fees. I think that, that uh, trying to expand that is, is really an important thing. Anything I can do, uh, I know that canvassing has been suggested, has been used. I hope you will consider that. Uh, it, it's surprising how receptive people are when you're talking to them in person about how important these issues are. So thank you for considering that. Thank you, absolutely. So, so we, we definitely are looking at every way and every tool that can increase our licensing because it is, as you said, our revenue. So we looked at uh, previous years and um, canvassing was very beneficial. Then we started seeing a decline for the three years following. That was mainly because not only we didn't do canvassing, but those were the pandemic years as well. We are seeing a slight increase as we are moving along. We have established uh, or implemented since January the DocuPet program that would uh, facilitate and make it easier for licensing, specifically going online and doing most of what needs to be done in person. So it would streamline that. So far, it has been promising. I think we're, we're estimating about 7% increase in our licensing fees. We also are combining that with a fee study that would look at how much we can adjust our licensing fees. And we do, be, we do believe that between DocuPet and the licensing fee study that we are going to, as we're projecting in next year, we're looking at something close to a 32% increase. We are not opposed to revisiting the canvassing, but we would like to see where we would be based on those two versus going into that, but it is still an option. So I, I might suggest that our county PIO, when, when they send out information about our agenda, maybe we could tag that and, and our social media uh, and newsletters for the board. If, if, you, if you could provide us just with a snippet that, that we could send out Absolutely. about licensing so we can reinforce the message. Certainly, yes. I actually have to do that myself. All right. Uh, Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair Lavanino. And thank you, Director Homami, for your presentation. Um, really interesting diabetes conversation. Obviously, there's some exciting times with uh, some of the medications out there that, to address A1C, and I'm sure that's not yet available on the public health level, but I like to see those numbers go a lot higher, or at least that um, performance measure as those things progress. Um, the other performance measure that I'm really uh, happy to see in here, again, is the customer service um, uh, piece there, environmental health. I'm sure that was partly because of, of my um, advocacy, and I do appreciate you, um, you know, acknowledging that and is. continuing Thank to work on much. that. Yeah. So um, I, I know that there's a culture that that exists, and there's a lot of work to do to change that, and I appreciate you guys being responsive to that. So I wanted to make sure that I um, acknowledge that, as well as uh, I want to chime in on the conversation about the veterinarian. Um, you know, and this may be more of a conversation when we have a, with HR, is that we probably need to find some way in the county for these processes and these um, these hard-to-fill positions to get to a decision sooner, because I know there's some processes in place and it's a little bit over bureaucratic, and you know we don't want to have those, uh, we don't want to have to have the advocates come to the board to get through to that point to make these good decisions. So um, you know whatever we can do, maybe the CEO's office or HR to try to streamline that process on some of these really positions that are, are challenges. I know we're doing some stuff with the ma management classification um, study that's gonna hopefully help that out in other departments, but things like this, um, I really like to see us make additional efforts to to find why, uh, ways to keep that talent um, countywide. So, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, sir. Supervisor Caps. Thank you, I uh, completely echo uh, what Supervisor Williams shared. That's the main thing I wanted to, to just convey complete support to your department today with uh, all that they have been through. Uh, certainly the staff uh, vacancies that you might be experiencing are completely understandable and your efforts to retain folks and help with morale is much, much appreciated, and I just wanna thank everybody. Uh, I think we all, all understood the value of public health like we never had to even think about before. Um, and really the crisis uh, 
aspect of public health and, and seeing that tested. Uh, I did want to uh, pivot to a different crisis uh, recently and um, ask Mr. Seifert to give an update because I know that you know our, our board was concerned after a sewage spill about the communication and I, I really appreciate the work that has gone in to kind of tighten up our communications when there is a sewage spill and beach closures and I, if, uh, if I could put Mr. Seifert on the spot or if you wanna answer it yourself, Director, that's fine too, but because uh, I know some cha important changes have been made that would be important right now to share. I certainly would yield to, to Lars. Thank you, Supervisor Caps, through the chair, uh, Lars Seifert. I, yes, uh, we, in uh, reviewing sort of the incident that occurred, the Galuita West uh, sewage spill in mid-February, uh, thank you to your office for you know meeting with us and, and discussing pot potential ways to improve the communication, the response, and uh, tightening basically the relationships between the sanitary districts, environmental health, and the state. Um, at this point in time, obviously, uh, we've continued to do testing. Glita Beach has been open for some time now, and uh, there's no ongoing impacts. However, we also have developed uh, some spill report guidance that we've been providing to the sanitary districts themselves to make sure that they have a 24 hours or 24 seven communication yeah. line that basically can be reported to uh, environmental health and public health to make sure that our response is seamless and quick. And uh, so that work has been done. We've been uh, provided that and worked with the regional board to make sure that those sanitary districts also include those and that number in their sanitary spill overflow reporting. So basically even the state has uh, made sure that that communication gap has been plugged. Uh, we've also developed some internal uh, flow checklist for our on-call uh, hazmat specialists and environmental health specialists that would be responding. Uh, we've made some additional steps to, to reach back out to make sure that we're confirming the data that was, is received and making sure that basically they are also considering the spill and response from a public health lens as well. Mm -hmm. So we're asking those additional questions of the sewer agencies when a spill occurs to make sure that there's no public health impacts. Uh, they're busy trying to fix a pipeline or to respond to their infrastructure. We are busy trying to make sure that we're also protecting the public in those instances. So we've made a number of improvements internally and also to close that communication uh, loop and uh, we feel that we're in a much better place because of that. So thank you to your office for uh, having those conversations. Thanks and, th and I will just add because there's now a QR code that if a beach, clo yes. a, a beach is closed and you go up to it uh, the, on the signage, there's, there'll be a QR code that gives you more information. So it's another good step. So thanks for that. I just wanna share my colleagues' uh, support for animal services. Uh, we, no need to say any more about pets at home, but just I, I love the innovation coming out of Sarah and her team and the fact you can foster for a few hours. I tell people that at dog parks all the time. It's just incredibly helpful to help get our numbers up in terms of adoption. So uh, thanks for that and also for your um, public health affairs uh, involving kids and so many people that um, need our services and aren't necessarily as connected as they could be. So many thanks. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, and that was kind of leads into my question. Um, I, I really thought that the fair last year was really cool, well organized, well attended. Um, but there is one hurdle that I think I'd like to get over before we get to the next one, and that is, you know, it was right at the time, and, and it was back to school, and we were handing out backpacks and those kind of things, which was really cool. But I think there was a, a mis. Uh, I, I think some people that were attending were thinking they'd be able to get their back to school vaccinations there. So curious of if there are hurdles and how we overcome those before we get to the next one, because I think that would be a great service for people where they could show up and take care of all of them. Thank you very much for, for this question, um, Mr. Chair. Um, the ideal, uh, or the idea, the original idea was to provide back to school vaccines. And I'll let Dr. Ansor uh, answer that. We were uh, a little bit limited by regulations from the state of who we can give free vaccines to and who we don't. Um, I leaned on our guru of public health to uh, tackle that. And Henning, if you can share what we are doing for this year, where okay. we are providing school vaccines. Cool. Sure. Shia and Yino, good morning. Good morning. Um, so this, is, uh, this, this was news to myself as well as the director that um, childhood vaccinations are actually pretty strictly regulated 
um, if a child has commercial insurance, um, the free vaccine um, stash that is available to us for everybody on SENCAL must not be utilized. And vaccines are surprisingly expensive. Um, just one set of um, regular back to school vaccine requirements is, is uh, four to five hundred dollars a pop. So we are uh, thinking creatively for this upcoming one this summer that we will be able to provide vaccines to people who want it. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we did budget uh, in some money to purchase vaccine for those so that we don't have a closed door to anybody just because they happen to have commercial insurance. So yeah, stay tuned, but this year we will have our first actually back to school event, including vaccination. Awesome, well, thank you again. This is the spirit of public health is you saw a problem, you tackle it and overcome it. If there's anything we can do on the state side of, through our ledge committee um, or speaking with our state representatives to try to figure out exactly why that, that seems counterproductive to me. So um, we'll take a look at that as well, so. That would be really helpful. Okay. I think, uh, you know, the more pressure. Yes, um, to well, we don't like to call it pressure. We like to. <laughs> <laughs> Conversation, we're gonna be, one of our former colleagues is up there. The so we will. The diplomatic way is advocacy. Yes, we'll twist, twist very softly. Supervisor Williams. Uh, well, to, I think today is National Hug Your Dog Day. So I did. Um, you know, did. if you do not have a dog to hug, go get there one. There are a lot of <laughs> eligible dogs in our shelter, um, and uh, the I wanted to also just speak uh, in support of Supervisor Hartman's point about canvassing. You know, I think if you initiated it again, you're going to have the same situation, which is. The first year you do it, it will be very successful. Of course, it's gonna have diminishing returns over time because you tend to canvas the neighborhoods that are gonna be most effective first, and you, you, know, you tend to get people first that react to it, and then later on, the harder ones. Uh, but I, I just think that it would be enormously valuable to initiate at least you know, a year or two uh, to, to re-jumpstart the the program um, on licensing. And I'll just pile on, on I, I think it makes financial sense, and, and I know you're already moving forward with the veterinarian, so. Okay, um, any other questions? All right, thank you very much, Director thank Hamami. You. Appreciate it. Next is one of my favorite departments. First five with Wendy Sims Moten. Whenever you're ready. Okay. So good morning, Chair Lavanino and members of the board. I am Wendy Sims Moten, proud director of First Five Santa Barbara County. I'm excited and happy to present our fiscal year 24-25 budget, and I'm also coming bearing gifts that I'll spend later. Uh, today I have with me uh, Jasmine Ra Morales, is our fiscal analyst, and I want to give a shout out to her for staying staying in the struggle. This is her first to the beginning to the almost end of the uh, budget cycle, so I wanna give a shout out to her and also our assistant department director, Michelle Robertson, who is here as well. And the rest of our team is watching us virtually, Sarah, Liliana, Caitlin, Brianna, and Alexis. And I wanna thank each of them for their part in preparing this budget and this presentation. Despite some challenges facing first fives across the state, we stand here to present a balanced budget that meets our planned obligations and support the goals of our strategic plan and fiscal plan and approved spenders while simultaneously ensuring the future sustainability of first five. We have four key services that are mandated by first five California and by the statute. 
improve family functioning, improve child development, improve child health, and improve systems. And within those function areas, counties have their own autonomy to decide how they're going to fulfill those particular function areas. Improve family functioning, we're looking at making sure that ch children are members of safe, stable, and nurturing families. In improved child development, children enter school socially, emotionally, and cognitively ready, ready to fully participate and access the kindergarten curriculum. In improved child health, children enter school with their developmental health and safety needs met. Improved systems of care, the community in which children live provides a system of accessible, relevant support that support child development, health, and family functioning. Our budget is about $4 million, which is typical about where we are. It's a little bit inflated this year because we are uh, releasing dollars for unexpended dollars through our multi-year contracts. Um, <clears throat> and we also are in the second year of a home visitation grant that we get come from the first five of California. The use of ongoing operations, it is, it is planned through our fiscal plan to make sure that we're filling the gap of the natural decline of revenue. It's also slightly increased because we, again, will be releasing some of the unexpended dollars from previous years. Our staffing summary really has not changed over the years. We have always had eight FTEs. We've increased up to eight FTEs. We finally filled our last position of eight uh, today, but we are fully functional as, as, a, as a staff and ready to go and accept adapting changes that happen in the first fives that are going across the state. Our operating budget, as I said, not really changing from previous years. Again, it includes dollars that are unspent dollars, so we're right on where we need to be and not, not um, concerned that we're not able to meet our obligations. And although uh, we do, um, this budget also reflects a decline in revenue just in general because of the, the um, flavor ban that happened that is causing some, some, cr some um, crisis in local first fives. But we have really have a good solid fiscal plan that allows us to not have to, allows us to pivot a lot quicker and not have to pass that on to our um, contractors. Our anticipated accomplishments, some we've already started to do and others are coming. We hosted our second annual school governance brunch where we invite uh, school board members and talk about the importance of investing in early care and education, how that then decreases the cost for the later interventions that, that have come across in our later years. Um, we're also going to be doing an ed talk here pretty quickly. Um, that's really, a, a, that's a change as we said on the TED talk. So we wanna make sure it's an ed talk and we're educating about outdoor engagement. And it also allows us the opportunity to increase engagement and present data to the community. And we will be di disseminating nine regional briefs and four focus area briefs that highlight our annual work. We'll be sure to get that out to you because it also represents different areas of the county. And then we are launching or have, or in the midst of launching an evaluation database uh, for more streamlined operating and reporting. And I talked about, you know, the four mandated areas um, that are by the state and what our goals are there. And these are the strategies in which we hope to get to those goals. Uh, one is engagement, how we continue to uh, be present at county community councils, First Fives Association, our sister departments engaging on the importance of early care education of what we work, the work that we do. We collaborate and facilitate and participate as an early responder to the emerging trends our young children, Santa Barbara County can convene partners for efficiency and scale. And then we invest and program, where we invest those dollars in the, in the community and where our staff does the program support there. That's where we're investing those dollars. I also thinking back 25 years ago that this commission uh, made a mandate to make sure that we are always impactful despite the fact that we are have a declining revenue. We didn't want that to define, declining to, to define us, is that we're gonna figure out what we need to do and be efficient in the dollars that are before us and collaborate as well to ensure that we continue to be impactful in our community. And then obviously I talked about the measurement, how we continue to measure the, the, the services that we're providing, uh, getting feedback from families, or are they receiving the services that they want to uh, perceive. And we have emerging issues that continue to be, as I talked about the flavor ban, which was we were in favor of that. We wanted to make sure that we were including and uh, you know, preventing further de uh, declining in health as a result to smoking, and so particularly in communities of color. Uh, so we, we were very supportive of that ban, but it also, it took a fiscal hit there, and we were, we were aware of that, and we were here able to uh, predict that, but that didn't necessarily 
come across 58 counties are dealing with it, particularly counties who are small, and they have two or three deaths, uh, two or three births uh, in their counties, and they may be the only service that's being provided for early care and education. So we are working very uh, hard uh, across um, um, genres in terms of that. As you know, it was because of the legislation that Prop 10 became a part of this, and so it's gonna be, Again, we have to go back and look at the lecture, how we're gonna sustain those results, what was happening 25 years ago. We know that the changes that have happened in early care and education in the communities would not have happened if not Prop 10 being implemented 25 years ago. And so we will be focusing on lo local and state policies. We'll be coming to you and asking you for supporting different legislation that's uh, coming out and working with the government as well. And here are our performance measures. We have many, but these are the two main things as to meet our goals to ensure that children are entering kindergarten ready to learn. And this number here represents about the projected number of kindergartners. Our goal is 70%, so we're almost there in terms of them being ready. As well as we're working with the school districts directly, we have 18 school districts in this county. We're working with nine, and in the coming year, we're adding on the 10th year. So we'll continue to work with that. And then in summary, um, I think I want to say that we want to keep the main thing the main thing. Sometimes, it's, uh, sometimes it gets discussed about early care and education. It's all about child care, but it's so much more than that. Uh, and it's important to make sure that we protect the critical services for California's youngest children. And we also want to make sure that a dream that comes true, that the care and education of all children become an untouchable entitlement. Budgets come and they go, but we wanna, don't want to decrease the funding. We can increase it, but we don't want to decrease the funding. We know how critical that is. And the investment in the early years yields long-term well-being of our children and families, therefore changing the trajectory of communities. It is all about the children and the families. And of course, our signature talk, read, sing, it truly changes everything. And I just wanna say, what was at stake 25 years ago uh, when Prop 10 was enacted? That stake is even greater as we move into the next 25 years. We know how critically important the early years are to our children. In addition, early mental health, how are we looking at it? We saw some of those things come through during COVID. It's always been there, but it got exacerbated through COVID. And so we wanna make sure if we can capture things early, then we know that we'll be better. Because who we are and how we are supported, nurtured, and invested in as children is critical to, is critical to who we become as adults. So we wanna keep the main thing the main thing. And lastly here, as we've been uh, considering, this is the last year of our current strategic plan, and we've been looking at how we're going to do that. We're starting conversations with our, our commission, and we really had a theme of let's make sure that we are keeping in perspective the others that we serve, the contractors that we, that, that we provide, the, the surveys that we send out, what perspective are we looking at when we send those things out to do that? And, and, and before I say that, the best ideas emerge when very different perspectives meet by Franz Johansson. And this quote, unknown, author unknown, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his or her point of view. If there's any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see the things from that person's angle as well as from your own. And so as I said, I had gifts that I got to you. You each have a packet of storybooks uh, called The Other Side of the Story as Told Who Childhood Storybooks. Uh, I believe we can get a QR code, but if you wanna do that. You'll want to add these up to your library. So, so for instance, the other side of the story from the three bears is told by the baby bear, the Snow White as told by the seven doors, Beauty and the Beast as told by the beast, Cinderella as told by the wicked step stepmother, and the frog prince as told by the frog. And lastly, the investments in care and education of our children can result in the biggest return of long-term sustainability of the well-being of our children and families. With that. That concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Supervisor Caps. Thank you, Director Sims Uh I just wanted to talk to you about the external partners you referenced, and I just, sources tell me that a uh, school board meeting went till 11.30 p.m. last night, so I just, uh, there's yeah. probably no one who does more for our kids than this person yeah, right I here. I keep asking about, did y'all go to preschool? <laughs> did you learn how to get along with others? You know, I'm just saying, so, so yeah. <laughs> kudos to you and your tenacity. Um, so t talk about TK please, because I think that's really fascinating and how what that means for first five. You referenced it, 56% of um, 
sc our schools are going to be transitioning. Just what is, how are you planning for that? What's the, what's the plan? Well, we've been planning it for a long time. And Good. now we're being more intentional in the early learning plans that we have and working with the school districts has to get their planning on board because it's not really due into 2025, but we don't want them to wait to 20 to 25 to be able to do that and to be ready. School teachers need to have, uh, it's a different curriculum, so they need to have professional learning on that. And so we, we've always been at that and really been, uh, uh, enthusiastic and intentional about that, but I want to share, I uh, want Michelle to share from her perspective because she's worked both at that level as preschool and as uh, in the school district at that at that point. Great. Thank you, Supervisor Caps. Am I on? Okay, uh, through the chair. Um, TK is a game changer for us, mm -hmm. right? Because our legislative mandate is children ready for kindergarten. And so First Fives really started this work way back in 2006 with Proposition 82, which was preschool for all, which did not um, pass with the majority, but the compromise at the state level was a transitional kindergarten for all four-year-olds. And while it has been in place for about 12 years, um, just recently in the last few years did California say, oh, hey, school districts, you really got to implement TK. So there is a mandate that every school district has it fully rolled out and implemented by uh, 2026. We knew this was coming. Um, we knew that most school districts did not have that early childhood expertise embedded. There are some school districts that do. Um, but not all of them did. So that was an opportunity for First Five to start working on what we're calling early learning plans. Um, we started with four um, in our priority one, which were basically Title I districts. Um, we expanded that to um, nine, and we're adding our 10th uh, this year. Our hope is that out of all 18 districts, we will get all 18 uh, working with us, so that's that 50%. But you saw in that first uh, performance measure that with 70% of kids ready for kindergarten being our goal, we're still at only 35%. Yeah. Um, lots of contributing factors to that. Um, we're still recovering from COVID, of course. We're also um, still struggling in the early childhood sector of aligning and articulating um, between early childhood providers and the new K through 12 or TK through 12 system. Um, so that's where we're playing our, our part is we're helping to facilitate those conversations, helping them with their plan. We are establishing what we're calling model TK classrooms and outdoor spaces at each of those districts. Then the districts can replicate those um, at their own pace um, once they know what they're supposed to be striving for. Thank Add you. I mean, that. it is very exciting. I, I used the word game changer, and yeah. I couldn't agree more. So uh, it's all about those first five years, as the science tells us. Thanks for the critical work, work you all do. Thanks. Thanks. Supervisor Hartman. So if, if I understand, you're playing a major role in helping school districts uh, prepare, actually adopt, implement the TK programs and, and taking the best learning. Once that's done, um, how does that affect First Five's mission uh, of having children ready for kindergarten? I mean, does it mean then they get ready for TK? You'll leave. Uh, I, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'll start and then I'll let Michelle finish that. Um, there's always, because the, we all want to look from a whole child perspective in terms of that we get that in and we know that's going to take a while to be able to do that because there are environments that children not necessarily learning in schools, but they may be learning in family, friends, and neighbors, so there's still that work to be done. And that would be our goal and the happiness that we've achieved that the fact that you know it is embedded in the school system and not separate and apart, which is typically that it, that has happened. Um, it, what it means for First Five is we're going to continue to focus on the importance of those early years. It might be now focusing on a, you know intentional focusing on a different area that how do we support that once it's there how do we support it in what ways that we need to be able to do that things are constantly changing legislation legislation is changing and that's our role to look at a system to improve the system for care uh, for air, air care and uh, education of our children so it won't change in sense of us being uh, supportive of that but it's more supporting the fact that it's there and strengthening the system in which they're there so I'll also defer to Michelle
Um, but that's just one little piece, right? So we have about 32,000 children age zero to five in this county, and there's not been a lot of effort on the zero to three space. Um, and brain development tells us that's where we need to be focusing. So we are doing initiatives around that, especially in terms of early language and literacy, um, but we can do more. So as we get TK on the right path, we will also be coming from the other end as well. Right, and, and the 35%, that is our entire population. It's not sub subset. about 75% of all kindergartners. So we do have some very small single school districts, especially in Santa Ana's Valley. So um, as we add those in, it will only kind of change it a little bit. And do you know how that compares to other counties, benchmark counties? You know, I would say that one of the benefits of having 58 first fives in the state of California is that each has autonomy to do what they want to focus on, but the con to having 58 counties is we do not have statewide um, aggregated data to compare to. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I'm glad you chose that performance measure. It is absolutely critical, and, and it's wonderful that it's gone up, and your goal is to get it up, but it's way too low. Supervisor Williams. So the kindergarten readiness brings to mind the, just the, the question that at some point I'd love to have a, uh, a, you all chime in and of course United Way give us a report on how uh, the incentive funds that we've matched uh, for um, uh, expanding um, uh, infant care, infant care I, I put in quotations because it's actually you know, older than infant, um, uh, but a, a really important part of this uh, continuum and a real, and the, and the part that we're missing the most uh, in terms of uh, parents find, needing to find places. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes finding places, they find places, but they don't necessarily find places that will help from a kindergarten readiness as much as others. Um, I, I, and I see, you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, family providers uh, going uh, professionalizing, but, um, uh, and that's good, good sign. Um, but of course, uh, we need uh, a, a wide scale professionalization of this sector, and of course, just a lot more availability. Uh, so I know, you know, we can, you can't just whip that out of a hat, but I, I think that would be one of the most relevant things that you could bring, bring to us this, this year, you know, um, in conjunction with United Way. Oh, and um, I, I, love, I love the books. I think, I mean, I think right, children's books is one of the most remarkable ways that you can, um, you know, uh, help, help society and formation. Of course, somebody's gonna come up and say that this is like too, too uh, revisionist or woke or something to have uh, fairy tales from the wolf's perspective. But, um, you know, I always was interested in that kind of stuff when I was a kid. Yeah, actually, I'm looking forward to reading them. So <laughs> I do, so I have grandkids. I'm not just reading them by myself, so. Although sometimes sure. my wife walks in and I'm, I'm trying to watch kids' shows. I love Bluey, by the way, but. Sometimes she catches me watching it by myself without the grandkids, so that's a little weird, but Supervisor Nelson, you got anything? Okay, thank you so much, Wendy, really appreciate it. Oh, uh, was yes. gonna talk about bringing that report to uh, Supervisor Williams, so if you wanna expand on that. Oh, yeah, um, actually this is about one year in now to the ARPA child care project. There has been some significant findings and information, so when you're ready, let, let us know we're ready to present to you. Um, we have one more year um, of that allocation. Um, we actually have United Way as a lead as well as Santa Barbara Foundation. They're coming out of, with two very different approaches. Um, and I think you'll find it interesting what they've come across so far. Thank you. Very good, looking forward to that, thank you. Okay, I think maybe our smallest department now gives way to our largest department. 
Social Services, Director Daniel Nielsen. And you can, you can, we have a button in there just for you, Daniel. You can raise that up on the side. There you go, look at that. Thank you, that's very kind of you, especially <laughs> since I didn't bring any presents. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Lavanino and Supervisors. With me today to assist with any questions is Assistant Director Maria Gardner, Assistant Director Amy Kruger, Assistant Director Rachel Lipman, and our CFO, AJ Kinaveva. And um, popping in sometime during the presentation might be our Workforce Development Board Director. <laughs> We provide a safety net to the most vulnerable in our community through our Medi-Cal, CalFresh, CalWorks, job services, protective services, adoptions, and in-home supportive services programs. Our operating budget for fiscal year 24-25 is 23.7, excuse me, $237 million with a use of one-time funds of 6.9 million for ongoing operations and a general fund contribution of, a, of $11 million, which is less than 5% of our total budget. We have budgeted for 904 and a half FTE, an increase of 71 FTE from the fiscal year 23-24 adopted budget. And those positions were added through mid-year changes in the current fiscal year. Under the heading of general county program transfers, we have $600,000 for the in-home supportive services program. The state requires a maintenance of effort annual increase for the counties to increase their local share of cost by 4%, plus pay, any, plus pay the local share of any negotiated pay increases. Our increased local cost for the budget year is $683,900. If we have unanticipated 1991 realignment revenue in the budget year, we will reduce the amount of this transfer accordingly. As a point of context, the total cost of the IHSS program for the budget year is $111 million, and the local share of that is $13.3 million, which is 12% of the total. The provider wages are currently $17.72 per hour, and will increase by 45 cents per hour July 1st, with the current contract expiring in June of 2025. This slide reflects our staffing levels for the budget year, as well as our adopted budget staffing levels for the current and prior three years. Our operating budget for fiscal year 24-25 totals $237 million, an increase of $14 million from fiscal year 23-24. The increase in operating budget is comprised of salary and benefits of approximately $4.67 million, services and supplies of approximately $900,000, and other charges of $8.57 million, primarily due to increase in cash assistance payments and a $1.07 million increase in the charges for county IT services. We have several accomplishments we would like to highlight today on this slide and the next. Each month, the Department of Social Services serves over 170,000 county residents, or 38% of the county population, and over 60,000 children, or 61% of the county's child population. In July of 2023, we launched our Farm Worker Resource Center program and have engaged 10,873 farm workers and registered 4,640 of them, providing them with assistance in connecting to resources and in teaching them how to navigate programs and services on their own. I would like to take this opportunity to inform your board that the state grant that we previously told you we did not get during our last farm worker presentation, um, we have now been awarded because one of the other recipients backed out and we moved up on the list. Um, so, <laughs> can, I, can I just go now while I'm ahead? <laughs> um, so, this will be 9000 We gotta not clap, that's not in our rules, okay? <laughs> Are we all under control now? Okay. This will be, this will be $900,000 over the course of approximately 22 months, which ensures that the program will move forward in July in some way, shape, or form. 
um, the staff are meeting with um, the Employment Development Department from which the grant comes uh, tomorrow to look at the specific scope of work. Uh, but it's, it's a farm worker related grant, so we're not worried. Um, we're also gonna be hearing about four other funding opportunities within the no next four weeks. So I'm very confident that by the end of the first week of May, we will have at least uh, a couple of other uh, firm funding uh, opportunities to go along with this $900,000. Our IT staff have updated our laptops so that the staff working in the field have the same capabilities as staff in the office and have upgraded almost 1,000 workstations. We also completed a long-term project to migrate our servers and workstations to the county domain. The CalWORK system improvement plan was recently detailed in a presentation to your board. It was approved by the state in December of 2023 and by your board in February of 2024. While the work on the plan is ongoing, the next progress report will occur in February 2025. In collaboration with our cross-sector prevention committee, Together for Children, we implemented a community pathway program which provides navigation and evidence-based prevention services targeted at those families with children at highest risk for entering foster care. This slide and the next will address some of our goals for the coming year. To address the current emerging and future needs of older adults, people with disabilities and caregivers through cross-sector collaborations and transform transformational systems change, the department will complete a local master plan for aging. After the recent implementation of the automated eligibility system CalSAWS, we will be enhancing our self-service capabilities by installing kiosks in lobbies and promoting and educating our clients about the use of Benefits Cal portal so that they can interact with us at their convenience and no longer need to physically wait in line. The department aims to enhance its continuity of operations and disaster plans for several critical programs, including CalFresh, Child Welfare, Adult Protective Services, and in-home supportive services. These updates are strategically aligned with the overarching goal of coordinated community service delivery and strengthening the safety net. The Workforce Development Board is launching, is launching several initiatives this year to support business engagement. These initiatives include a special project with the Santa Maria Valley Chamber of Commerce to promote work-based learning, including paid work experience and on-the-job training opportunities with local employers. Secondly, a project with the Santa Barbara South, Co South Coast Chamber of Commerce to develop and implement strategies to create structured career pathways within the advanced manufacturing industry sector. This includes engaging with employers, educational institutions, and industry experts to identify opportunities for career advancement and skill development for job seekers. Some of our emerging issues for the budget year are, staff are working to prepare for phase one and phase two of the ERP with go live this fall for the financial systems and then next April for the human capital management. While we implemented CalSAWS in April of 2023, we have a strategic focus to leverage CalSAWS functionality to its fullest, and to do so, we will continue to gain proficiency in the functionality that best serves our programs. For example, shortly after Go Live, the project launched WelcomeBot, technology that was problematic for our callers as they were unable to voice authenticate to access us. We immediately opted out of that as, a keypad, as keypad entries were superior for our clientele. However, we were able to adopt the CalSAWS functionality for imaging, scheduling, and task management, and will continue in the coming year exploring additional functionality of the system. The CWS CARES will replace and retire the current CWS automated system, which is called CWS CMS, and go live across the state in October of 2026. CWS CARES is designed to improve compliance with state and federal policy and support the improvement of child welfare programs. The implementation of CWS CARES will require significant staff resources over the next two years to ensure Santa Barbara County is prepared for the go live date. 
In 2023, social services, public health, and community service departments joined with the sheriff, probation, district attorney, public defender, and Be Well departments to become new members of the Santa Barbara County Data Sharing Committee. The data sharing MOU is currently being updated to include the new departments and will provide a uniform process and framework for these departments to access an integrated information system, a platform that allows all parties to share and analyze and report data pertaining to shared clients as agreed by the departments. This slide highlights some of our performance measures. As you know, we did not meet our fiscal year 22-23 target for processing applications within our timelines for CalFresh, and we will not meet it in the current fiscal year. But with the addition of staff currently underway, we expect to again meet this target in the budget year. DSS continues to exceed state targets for child welfare services, timely contact for child abuse and neglect allegations. The department continues to strive towards 100% compliance in meeting these targets as the safety of children remains our highest priority. We are not meeting our self-imposed department target for our adult protective service referrals that receive a risk assessment within 21 days of the initial face-to-face -face visit due to staffing shortages and increased workload, but are on track to meet our target next year. The department is meeting our state target for Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Title I Adult and Dislocated Worker Program participants who exit the program and are in unsubsidized employment six months after exit. Regarding our KP KPMG recommendations, Demand-driven workload analysis occurs weekly for our normal work and a few times a year for special projects. In the Medi-Cal program alone, we receive, we receive over 100 informational notices from the state in 2023 with updated program regulations. When these communications are received, an impact analysis occurs and often business processes are reviewed and changed to ensure efficiency and effectiveness in service delivery. After the implementation of CalSAWS in April 2023, we began utilizing an automated scheduling system in our call center. This has been operational since July of 23 and has allowed us to have more reporting capabilities such as schedule ad adherence. This allows us to know if staff are performing work within their forecasted model and where adjustments need to be made. Two areas where we see families in crisis are in the Child Welfare Services Program and in, Cal, and in the CalWORKs Program, and sometimes those areas overlap. Instead of developing separate case plans for these families, we utilize the Linkages Program framework to align the efforts for more effective service delivery. KPMG recommended that we strengthen the lead worker model, and we shared with them that we, had already, we were already in the process of doing that, in June of 2022, all district offices were utilizing the multi-program model, which KPMG described as the lead worker model. Clients applying for multiple programs can be seen by one worker to have all of those needs addressed. We have no service level reductions. And in summary, the Department of Social Services continues in our ongoing work of serving those most in need in our community to the best of our ability, utilizing technology where possible and appropriate to maximize our impact. We work in an environment of constant self-improvement, whether mandated by our federal and state funding sources or by our own internally established goalposts. By utilizing regulations, policies, and technology, we maintain a constant focus on the fact that we are dealing with individual human beings each with a complex set of needs and aspirations. And we also maintain a constant focus on the most critical component of our success, which is our dedicated and hardworking staff. And our quote um, is, the test of government is not how popular it is with the powerful and privileged few, but how honestly and fairly it deals with the many who must depend on it, from Jimmy Carter and I'm happy to take your questions. Excellent. And my staff are even happier. <laughs> <laughs> they look like it. Any questions? Oh, Supervisor Hartman. 
Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for the Farm Worker Resource Center. That is, uh, uh, you have assembled wonderful grant writing teams initially, and, and now this is great news, and, and thank you to those who, who work so hard on those grants. Um, I also wanted to say thank you for the Workforce Development Board work. Uh, that is becoming increasingly important, and I think we have a really forward-looking, innovative program uh, compared uh, to the past. And working with employers uh, and, and getting the grants uh, in, in Lompoc, we're working on a workforce development pipeline, and we've had a lot of support from your office and the Workforce Development Board in, in doing that. So really, really appreciate that. Um, I, one of the issues and performance measures that always is of interest to me is um, because I worked as a CASA and I saw what changeover does to children when they have to get to know somebody new and eventually they just kind of pull back. Um, and so anything we can do to create, um, to, to have a measure of retention and anything we can do to support the longevity of those people who are working with children and families, I think is, is really important. I, I was really struck when a, a, a sheriff's dispatcher came in and said, you know, for women in particular, having some flexibility in schedule with to balance family life with, with everything else that they have to do. We know that women still have to do most of the work at home and do most of the work uh, in childcare, although men are starting to step up more and more. Um, but, but I think that that's uh, a, an important thing. So how many, uh, I, I guess, uh, maybe you could talk about the performance measure for retention, but just how many vacancies and what are you doing to create a, a, especially a women-friendly workforce? Um, Supervisor Hartman through the chair. So um, the vast majority of the staff in the Department of Social Services are women. Um, the vast, vast majority, um, and we um, do everything we can in terms of supporting that, uh, all of our staff, you know, male and female, uh, with flexibilities in their schedules when possible. Uh, we work with our staff if, if they need to uh, take off for a doctor's appointment or to take off to take a child to a doctor's appointment, and they're able to work their normal hours at other times during the week and then take off that time during the workday to go to those appointments. We support that wherever possible so that they're not dipping into their leave time balances in order to take care of those needs. Um, we have our uh, 980 schedules available like all the departments I believe in the county do um, so that people can have a set day off uh, once every two weeks that they could schedule appointments in as well. Um, and, and so we, in, in terms of, I mean, we do track our um, retention and our, our vacancy. I don't know that offhand right now exactly what today it is. It's a little higher than normal right now because of the positions your board authorized and that we're still in the process of filling. Um, but a year ago or a year and a half ago when I um, was making a presentation uh, to your board in um, Santa Maria, and, and we were very focused on vacancy rates across all the departments at that time. Um, ours, well, public health at that time was about 30%. Social services was down between 10 and 15, and I think we generally stay around the 10% average uh, as far as vacancy rate, other than unusual times like right now. Um, so I'll let, um, specifically because you, you um, I'll, I'll let, um, Assistant Director Kruger address a little bit more related to um, your question. Good morning, Supervisor Hartman through the chair. Um, in terms of child welfare services specifically, we have a- Could you speak up just a little bit? You have a soft voice and I'm not hearing as well. Is this better? Yes. Yeah, Thank you. Sorry. So in terms of child welfare services specifically, we have uh, quite a focus on retention amongst our social workers um, because we do tend to have a higher vacancy rate. Um, although I am very pleased to report right now, we have um, all but three of our social worker positions filled in child welfare, which is um, probably the best we've been in several years. So we're very pleased about that. And I think that is in large part due to our efforts um, to really engage with staff and figure out what it is we can do to support them. 
Um, I have, um, in past presentations to this board, uh, discussed our raft sessions, which are um, led by a therapist, which are focused on secondary trauma um, for our social work staff, and we continue to offer that. Um, and as a matter of fact, we've just expanded that to our adult protective services staff as well, recognizing that there is also, of course, a lot of secondary trauma um, amongst that population. Um, we have our, still have our social worker practice team that meets regularly and uh, interacts with our leadership team to report back from uh, the line staff as far as what their priorities are and what their requests are for support. Um, and so um, we are right now working with our leadership team on our plan going forward for the next year in terms of uh, collectively what we can do strategically uh, to uh, retain our staff. Again, we're in a good position now, but we wanna keep that momentum going. Um, so I feel like we've made a lot of strides and we're gonna continue to really focus there. And do we, uh, I mean, I think social workers are probably the most uh, tremendously valuable and not really paid what they're worth. Uh, and, and we're trying to figure out what we can do countywide for uh, many of our employees who aren't paid what they're worth, what other kinds of incentives we can offer. Uh, a job share, uh, flexibility to work from home or on the road, can, uh, other things like that. Is there a concerted effort to address that? And uh, I guess I was very impressed by Director Hamami's strategy of engaging the, the people um, throughout the organization in, in uh, the strategic plan and developing uh, ideas about how to improve things and focus things in his department. So could you talk about that in, in yours? Uh, yes, Supervisor Hartman. We, again, through our super, uh, social worker practice team, that's open to all staff, and they have the availability to meet with leadership monthly. Um, we also have an action team in Child Welfare Services that is open to all levels of staff um, to bring forward process improvement ideas um, and you know, solution-focused ideas about anything that um, is creating barriers. In terms of flexibility for social workers, I feel like because of the demands of that job and their need to be in the field um, working uh, at hours where families are available and after hours, that is a, where we have a lot of flexibility. Um, that was the first team where we did deploy the, um, the laptops um, that were referred to earlier by IT, um, another KPMG recommendation so that they could really have um, the flexibility to work in the field, from home, on the road. They you know, travel throughout the county and, and over, all over the state at times to visit kids who are in placement. Um, so you know, by definition, they have to have flexibility in their schedules, and we really try and work with them to do everything we can to promote that. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair Lavanino. And I just wanted to um, join the chorus of uh, excitement about the Farm Worker Resource Center and making sure there's ongoing funding there. And thank you, Luis and uh, Cesar Guerrero and his team. I think they've been doing an excellent job. And I think um, it's really important that we have that as part of our organization because I think it gives us insight into a community that we otherwise would not. And it's not just about the services that the Farm Worker Resources Center delivers, but it's about um, you know, engaging that community so that they can figure out the other um, programs that we, we offer at the county, whether it's public health, um, behavioral wellness, or social services, or any of our other um, programs. So again, my appreciation to you and your team for uh, the, continuing to find funding for that program without having to tap into uh, additional general fund. Thank you. Supervisor Williams. Yeah, I also want to uh, give uh, Luis and the team uh, and and uh, Daniel uh, thanks for the continue the creative thinking uh, to uh, uh, continue the work of the Farm Worker Resource Center, um, and then uh, I also want to um, reinforce uh, Supervisor Hartman's questions. You know, I think in a department where there are large numbers of employees that that cannot work remotely for some reason or other, other, it makes it even more important for the ones who can work remotely to faci be facilitated to do so uh, because of our policies as the county uh, and because of the need to actually, you know, attract and retain enough, you know, employees in this, in the context that we're in. And I just think that that's, uh, something I'd like to know more about, and I just I think something really important. I'm, I'm aware that there's constraints um, uh, in your uh, service 
delivery model in some cases. Uh, but in some cases, the, the constraints can be, um, uh, 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 can be ameliorated. And I wanna, uh, you know, uh, give uh, full support uh, to efforts that, uh, to facilitate folks that can be on a hybrid schedule to be on a hybrid schedule. Um, sure. When I got here 11 years ago, I was told by my staff that the board at that time supported teleworking and we should be doing that. So we immediately invested in um, assessing and coming up with telework policies and processes and forms and tracking and deciding how to handle people teleworking that were dealing with confidential information, protective, protective client information, um, what sort of parameters we needed to have in place. We went through the whole process of deciding, you know, did they have to supply their own equipment or would we supply it for them? It was a very robust process that we implemented about nine years ago. Uh, so when COVID hit and everybody was going, you know, we, you know we've got to get people teleworking, we already had the process in place and some people teleworking at that time. We expanded it drastically to the outer limits of what was possible because of COVID for health reasons. And then as that died down, um, you know, revisited and, and reevaluated what made sense because an important part for the department is getting the work of the department done, meeting our mandates, uh, being physically present for our clients that generally prefer to be physically, to be dealt with physically in, you know, in person. Uh, our client base uh, largely wants to be engaged um, in person which is why our prior attempt at kiosks five or six years ago failed and, and we're gonna be trying again um, with some new strategies. Um, so our policy, uh, which we actually changed into a protocol under the county's policy once the county policy came out during COVID, um, allows any person in the department to apply to telework and there's a process that, that goes up through their supervisor to their manager and sometimes up as far as me, depending on, on you know, what the responses are and the issues are um, for that to be considered um, and what, um, and then how much, right? You know, like can, can we afford for that to happen a day a week or two days a week or three days a week? Um, a complicating factor in addition to the fact that we, um, many of our, our staff serve people in person is the fact of, of the 980 schedule. And so when you factor in a 980 schedule and then you look at people's uh, vacation, like if you're working within a, a work unit, their vacation use, um, and then accounting for sick leave, and the need for a certain level of coverage, then that um, doesn't prevent, but it, it inhibits the amount of telework that can happen in certain areas. In other areas, that's not true, right? So we are committed very much on a uh, person by person, division by division er, uh, approach um, to looking at that and to allowing that um, where possible. Um, in fact, part of our KPMG responses that we didn't highlight today was that we had committed to uh, revisiting that topic um, in the eligibility ranks um, this summer to sit down and look at, you know, what are other counties doing and what could we do? Um, but always with, um, you know, the teleworking has to work for the employee and for the department um, and our business needs have to be met. And, and I think we do a very good job of having um, those individual conversations with people when they're proposing to telework, we, we do a very good job of explaining to them, um, you know, if it's yes, it's yes with the requirements, but if it's no or if it's only as a, a, a smaller amount than they what they wanted, the why, right, the why behind it and the explanation of, of the business needs. So um, all, of our, all of our staff under our protocol, all of our staff can apply to uh, telework. Um, on, on a um, as needed basis, if there's issues, um, for example, if somebody has to take their child to a doctor's appointment, but they're able to work in the morning and their job is something that can be telework done, um, that you know, rather than having them take the whole day off, it works for them, it works for us, for them to work that half a day for telework, and then go take their child to their doctor's appointment. So we're very much uh, pushing the envelope as much as we can in terms of supporting staff related to their leave time, but also to, to utilize that um, as much as possible. And it's an, it's an ongoing topic of, of conversation and review in our department. So I can assure you that um, the avenues for that on a person by person basis, um, as well as collectively are happening. And we're gonna be further looking into that this summer as part of our, our KPMG um, assessment. 
I think that's a, a good answer. I, I just think that, that we philosophically need to um, maybe get past the idea that this is something that is requested by the, and to suit just the employee. It's good for the institution, right? It's good for the institution if we are proactively trying to figure out more ways to accomplish it, um, not just from the most basic level of attraction and retention. That's, it's, that's, that's just sort of vital for us right now. But in the long term, you know, I, I think about uh, how much, we only think about the amount that we're spending in tax dollars to expand the 101 freeway on the Santa Barbara side. If you think about the Ventura side too, we're talking about probably a, by the end of it, a billion dollars, right? Those are a billion dollars that if we, you know, house people here or if employees didn't have to go to work would be totally unnecessary, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, uh, it, 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 that billion dollars would be, able, would be able to facilitate a lot of housing and services, right? I mean, uh, so I, I just think about this from the perspective of the long-term uh, uh, functionality of the institution. And I think philosophically we need to think about it from the, our, our needs um, long-term are very much to facilitate people um, not never coming into the office, uh, but not coming into the office five days a week. Supervisor Caps. Thank you, I think most of it's been said and I appreciate the clarification on telework, but um, I just, when I think about your department, I, I think of it, it's like the beating heart of our county uh, and the compassion and the, the, the basic needs that your folks help connect people to. Uh, but I just wanted to comment that also it's an economic driver, it's economic development. And uh, what so the, the retention of staff and the ability to, keep people connected and explain those complicated eligibility requirements over and over and over again and help folks get access. And just to uh, put a number to it, the two events that we did on tax prep uh, in February yielded a million dollars of state and federal uh, money into our county. So again, I just wanted to add that element of, of appreciation to the staff of being really the connecting point to an economic development uh, process thanks to state and federal programs. So thank you. Oh, could I, oh, could I respond to that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Supervisor Caps to the chair. I just am so glad you brought that up because I uh, wanted to mention at some point uh, on that front, in addition to what you just mentioned, uh, on our CalFresh program, we have over $10 million a year coming into our county through CalFresh benefit, uh, $10 million a month coming into our our county uh, through the CalFresh program. And the Medi-Cal program, which we do not run, we just establish eligibility for, but those Medi-Cal Medi benefits uh, total around $63 million a month um, into our community in terms of paying for health care, whether doctors, hospitals, prescriptions, whatever uh, it is. So there's, there's a huge economic impact to the stuff that we do, even when it's just the indirect secondary. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair Lavanino. And I just, just since we're having a little bit of conversation about telework, you know, I think the big important part of about telework, just countywide, is the accountability and making sure that we have um, our managers trained to be able to handle people that with uh, that are out there teleworking. You know, it's it's easy to send people off, but there's it's a lot harder to to um, have that level of accountability when they're not present as well as the culture that's missed it as well. So I appreciate the work you guys are doing. I think that's gonna be helpful for the rest of the organization. And again, maybe that's just a question for HR when, they, when they're coming up here about how are we doing that countywide and putting programs in place so that we can address those um, issues. You know, at the end of the day, these are taxpayer dollars and we gotta make sure that we're accountable for them and that if people are sitting, um, whether they're at their kitchen table or home office or actually in one of our county buildings that they're you know doing what taxpayer dollars are going towards their salary. So just want to keep that in mind. Supervisor Nelson, through the chair, part of our application process is a demonstration in the paperwork by the part of the employee and the supervisor about um, how the work will be tracked and how productivity will be tracked. So that's built into our process. Um, but I, one thing we've learned over the past year since the pandemic is that it's, it's a uh, hugely labor intensive process on the part of management 
to support telework and to you know go through this application and approval process and then to monitor it. Um, and so that's something that we keep in mind too in terms of uh, making sure that it works for for the for the department in terms of from a business perspective. Yeah, well, thank you again. The work you guys are doing, the, our biggest department probably would help inform the rest of the organization. So, um, thank you for uh, providing that background. Yeah, and I like to focus on the balance because you both are right. But I think the technology is there. It's it maybe five years ago it wasn't there. Uh, I know personally, my wife went and started teleworking and. The technology existed where her employer tracked meticulously how many phone calls she had, how much work she put out. Um, it was probably more so than if she had been sitting in the office. So um, there's a balance to it, though. The you know you need the camaraderie, you need somebody to talk to. So um, I'm glad that we're taking a look at that on the Farm Worker Resource Center. And something I don't think we talk about enough here is crisis avoidance. You know, you talk about what you've done but a lot of times it's what we're not talking about, which is important. And what we're not talking about is that the Farm Worker Resource Program did not blow up, which, and cause a bunch of problems, which was what a lot of people thought was gonna happen, right? So um, I think in the next, uh, also with Be Well coming up, it's the fact that we don't have, we're not talking about a bunch of billing errors and a lot of problems. So a lot of times us not talking about things is a good thing, so Luis, Excellent job, you guys did a great job on rolling that out to the point where we actually had farmers coming to us and saying, hey, how's this gonna get funded? You know, we wanna be part of this, where two years ago or a year and a half ago, you know, they wanted to put Bob on a, a spit so because he voted for it, so. It works for sure. Yeah, so, so you know, great job on the leadership there. And I also just wanna say you are the biggest department and we, I probably get more uh, questions about, you know, constituent concerns, and generally when they're associated with social services, it's somebody that either needs CalFresh or Medi-Cal eligibility approved. And just wanna thank Maria, your team, Daniel, uh, for the quick turnaround, you know, instantaneous, getting to the bottom of what the plug was in the bureaucratic mess, uh, because, and I know we have thousands and thousands of requests coming through, and they're all on a time clock but uh, for that individual, it's an emergency right then, right? It's either, they, you know, they're counting on us to, to make sure that they don't go hungry for the next week. So appreciate the fact that you elevate those, that they are, um, that they are given priority and, and uh, you know, you're changing people's lives. So we appreciate that. So thank you very much. All right, social thank services you. in the books. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, we're gonna try to get through two more before we take a break. So we will um, we'll finish up the functional group. So next up is Director Navarro and Behavioral Wellness. All right. I think we're okay. I know Daniel put this up. Good morning. Oh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, perfect, perfect. All right, good morning, Chair Lavanino, morning. supervisors and county staff. Um, Tony Navarro, Director of Behavioral Wellness here to present our 24-25 budget presentation today. I'm joined by our CFO, Chris Ribeiro, and I think as was the case last year, the remainder of staff um, who would otherwise be here are in the middle of an audit. We are in the middle of our annual external quality review organization audit. Uh, we are actually have pulled the lever and are one of the first counties to be doing an integrated audit of both our alcohol and drug programs and our mental health plan programs together. And so that's why all of the other staff are in various meetings throughout the day. I do know some of our staff are listening in today, so hi staff and uh, keep up all the great work. I know you're probably having a great audit. All right. So behavioral wellness, also known as Be Well, is the department responsible for the operation of the county's Medi-Cal specialty mental health plan and substance use disorder drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system. In fiscal year 22-23, just over 13,000 individuals of all ages receive specialty mental health services and just under 7,000 individuals receive substance use disorder services. 
In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and amidst growing opioid and fentanyl crises, the public, as well as local, state, and federal authorities have increasingly focused on addressing issues of mental health and addiction in our communities. Consequently, the past few years has seen an unprecedented focus in legislation, regulatory requirements, and funding opportunities targeting behavioral health care, and specifically county behavioral health systems in California. Beginning in 2022 and going through 2027, the county behavioral health system in our state is undergoing its biggest transformation since the early 1990s. The statewide initiative known as California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal, or CalAIM, has created significant changes to how county behavioral health services are to be provided, documented, billed, and funded. Additionally, starting in 2023, in July 2023, this fiscal year, CalAIM expectations were operationalized in the contracts between counties and the State Department of Healthcare Services and detail specific utilization and service delivery targets to be achieved in order for county behavioral health departments to be in compliance. In this next fiscal year, BeWell will continue with and execute new CalAIM requirements as well as take on additional mandates, including care court, the ongoing preparation for the implementation of Senate Bill 43, preparation for Prop 1, which although not officially launching until 2026, this system overhaul from going from the Mental Health Service Act or MHSA system to the Behavioral Health Service Act or BHA HSA system is so extensive that counties need to begin now to prepare in order to effectively execute BHSA on time. B will also be significantly expanding housing options for its unhoused clients with the expenditure of behavioral health bridge housing, housing funds that will support the La Posada Dignity Moves project and will fortify countywide shelter bed availability. Last and not mentioned in your packet, because this is new information from the state in just the last week and a half, BeWell in this next fiscal year will complete a number of operational and programmatic changes in order to leverage new funding opportunities under the state's Behavioral Health Connect 1115 waiver initiative, which begins in January of 2025. BeWell's 24-25 budget represents staffing and expenditure increases consistent with its revenue resources and in alignment with its increasing needs for staffing and infrastructure to meet the growing and multiple obligations just outlined. The BeWell system of care is made up of distinct branches of operations, including direct care programs and indirect system support units that collectively provide a full range of care and treatment services for both mental health and substance use disorder conditions to eligible county residents. The overarching key services within BeWell's operation are listed here in this slide. Okay, all right. Next slide. Here we have BeWell's budget summary, the details of which will be discussed in subsequent slides. In 24-25, BeWell has no service level reductions and no restoration nor expansion requests. The projects listed in the capital budget provide significant infrastructure support to both the overall system as well as persons BeWell serves directly. Specifically, the um, uh, one of our detailed projects is our enterprise electronic health record. Um, this will be the capitalization of the Smart Care, which is a semi-statewide electronic health care um, health record. We have a seven-year agreement. It was approved by the board in 2022. Our legacy electronic health record, Clinician's Gateway, was unable to meet the needs and expectations of CalAIM, and therefore the um, it, implementation of smart care was necessary. The next capital project is um, renovation costs for a 12 bed board and care facility being added to Be Well's housing capital. Specifically the Tecolote House, which will be located on the Calle Real campus uh, in the old Acasa Omega site, will serve eligible adults who have complex medical needs as well as severe and persistent mental illness. 
All right, and this explanation of our general county program transfer, uh, this receipt of funds from the cannabis education program provides educational and preventative services to youth and perinatal women across the county. All right, for fiscal year 22-23, be well had an average vacancy rate of 21%. We processed 136 hires and had 44 separations, 10 of which were retirements, which resulted in a turnover rate in 2022-23 of only 12.32%. We were really glad to see those gains. And in a recent survey, countywide survey, also noted gains in staffs um, expression of feeling like they understand the value of being a Be Well employee and are feeling really good about the services they provide to the county and intend on staying with the program. However, state and national workforce um, shortages continue in the behavioral health care industry with many leaving the field ongoing. So behavioral wellness continues to develop new strategies in the area of recruitment, while continuing to focus on retention by strengthening our onboarding and the demonstration of value, respect, and appreciation for each and every staff member in our system of care. The staffing change requests for 24-25 represent a net gain of 6.7 full-time equivalent employees over 23-24 fiscal year. These first three categories of positions noted, caseworkers, alcohol and drug specialists, and psychologists, are additions of direct care personnel to support the staffing of new programs, focus, focusing on increasing behavioral health support to eligible persons who are justice involved, including diversion and discharge post-release programming and the implementation of care court. The remaining positions are administrative roles that are needed to support departmental infrastructure in response to added fiscal monitoring and reporting requirements related to CalAIM, Care Court, and Prop 1. The two staff no uh, reductions noted in this slide are a result of changes. First, the three unfunded recovery assistants are from the, MH the Mental Health Service Act Innovation Plan heart program, housing and, oh my gosh, I just blanked on what heart stands for. But um, innovations plans under MHSA are submitted to the state with an idea um, that is a new way of programming and brings a new service to a county. And oftentimes in the implementation of those, what we thought we were going to need and how we thought that was going to roll out change. And so in this fiscal year, we, we unfunded three of the recovery assistants as they were no longer needed in that system. And there was an unfunding of a 0.9 psychiatric nurse as a result of our CSU, our crisis stabilization unit, no longer being part of um, the county direct services, but going out to a local community-based organization. Okay, Be Well's 24-25 budget represents a 17.1 increase over the current fiscal year, increasing $30.1 million from last year's $175,660,000 budget to now a budget of $205,766,000. Much of this growth is accounted for by increases in cost and revenue due to CalAIM payment reform. Payment reform has transformed the way we create and budget our contracts with outside providers and has expanded quality assurance functions. Additionally, there is growth in cost and revenue related to the expansion of key services for acute and inpatient care. These include the reopening of our crisis stabilization unit from a four bed voluntary to an eight bed involuntary facility, which will more effectively meet the needs for additional beds for acute care in our county. There are cost and revenue um, increases to support a pilot for additional four justice-involved diversion treatment beds at the Crestwood Champion Center, and to compensate um, the psychiatric health facility nursing staff, which the BO at, uh, Board of Supervisors approved um, salary rate increases in 2022 
And this increase also supports staffing patterns that are, were created to maximize consistent 16-bed utilization at our psychiatric health facility. In fiscal year 24-25, BeWell is also expanding its Mental Health Service Act prevention and early intervention programming in order to support, well, first, the vital homeless outreach services under the multidisciplinary team that were formerly provided by, uh, funded by ARPA, to create a justice-involved early intervention program to support effective discharge and post-relief services uh, from jail for those eligible for behavioral health services in an effort to um, address recidivism with our partners. And this funding will also focus on outreach, stigma reduction, and suicide prevention efforts countywide to promote awareness, early detection, and increase access for persons experiencing behavioral health issues. Now, while we know that Prop 1 is coming and the prevention dollars around these final um, programs that I talked about will no longer be controlled at the local level, it's imperative given um, payment reform and the other new initiatives we have coming on board, including Care Court, um, uh, some of the changes to the programming under Prop 1, that we really increase as much as possible in these last two years of funding, in this last year. Uh, year and a half of funding, our ability to increase access, awareness, and promote behavioral health services so that folks really get to our doors and get in for services and avoid some of the more costly services down the road when access and um, a lack of awareness of where programs are and how to get them um, continues. All right, so next up. We'd like to talk about our anticipated accomplishments. So um, this year, again, we implemented starting in July our electronic health record, um, and it is establishing technical capabilities to meet all of our new Calium requirements. We're really excited uh, to be reopening and establishing the Lanterman Petra Short designation of our South County Crisis Stabilization Unit, which is on track, that contract, to be before your board on April 23rd and um, planning to open again as an eight-bed locked facility uh, in mid-May. And we are also, um, in, this, in this fiscal year, have just designed and established new certified peer support specialist job classifications. Um, this also will be coming before your board uh, in the next uh, meeting or so. Um, we just finalized um, all of those uh, details with county HR. But the Certified Peer Support Specialist is a brand new benefit that is eligible to Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And so the establishment and creation of this further leverages new funding opportunities for this county to, to, to draw down federal dollars. And we're, we're really um, glad to, to be finally pulling the lever on that and we'll show you some of our performance measure outcomes that we're really already excited about in future slides. We also, um, along with establishing the new job classification, which has a trainee position for those who are peers but not yet certified, and then has the second level two, which are for those who have the state certification. We also hired a peer empowerment manager so they can lead the integration of certified peer support specialists throughout our system of care in both the alcohol, drug, and mental health services sides of the house. So yes, we have two slides of anticipated accomplishments. Helps us share out our accomplishments to get through everything we've got going on. So here, um, I'd like to, to highlight the completion of the grant deliverables um, to secure a, a behavioral health continuum infrastructure program funding, which will allow us to acquire and rehabilitate a new outpatient services facility. We'll be relocating our child and family services from way up on the Calle Real Hill, which has no direct uh, public transportation access and can be really uh, difficult for um, families and parents to get to who do not have that transportation on very hot and otherwise inclement weather days down to a central location here um, in Santa Barbara off Haley Street, which will um, allow for us to be closer to the, proper, to the proper population that we serve and also be close to public transportation, which will increase access and effective utilization of these services for children, youth, and families. We have developed and implemented a contracted pilot of four bed, justice involved behavioral health diversion beds at Crestwood. Um, uh, Champion Center, and currently we have one of those filled. 
um, and that was in partnership and is funded um, in conjunction with the Community Corrections Partnership. And we've completed and the design and, be, and started the implementation of our new cro mobile crisis benefit, which again is a state mandate that was given to counties this past year and actually also is a new service that is available and funded for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. These next two slides outline our goals and objectives. Um, Be Well's primary goals and objectives focus on the successful implementation of CalAIM, Care Court, Senate Bill 43, as well as timely Proposition 1 planning. So specifically, we want to ensure the sustainability of all of our Medi-Cal programs under CalAIM payment reform. The timeliness and, and implementation of our EHR will help us to improve service delivery, data collection, data reporting, and further integrate our inpatient processes. Moreover, the goal for us in 24-25 is to ensure that our contracts for mental health as well as the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery services contain sustainable rates and are aligned with CalAIM and the Department of Healthcare Services guidance. It's important to note that within all of our contracts this year, we have also provided incentives and we are meeting more regularly. We have two meetings a month with our CBO partners, one with the general CBO uh, leadership staff and myself and our CBO executive teams meet together collectively once a month to talk about how to effectively implement payment reform and allow and help our CBOs to also then gain incentives at, per their contract. Next up, uh, our goal is to implement the CalAIM Justice Involved Initiatives. We have received funding under Providing Access and Transforming Health, known as PATH, round three funding, which will help us design programming and get us off to a running start so that we can facilitate the required and ongoing program service delivery of something called behavioral health linkages under CalAIM, which begins in October. And finally, we also um, completed a justice early intervention program design. We will be, um, we've started that and we will be completing that uh, and implementation for post-release care and coordination. All right. Finally here, we have prop one. Um, again, uh, beginning in uh, this next fiscal year, even though we don't implement until July 2026, we will develop transition plans system-wide for the many and significant changes coming our way in our system of care. And then also finally, we will implement Care Court, the Community Assistance Recovery and Impairment uh, Act, Empowerment Act, excuse me, and complete our planning and implementation timeline for Senate Bill 43. I think the good news for Be Well is that in regards to the numerous changes happening and approaching the department, um, and many of these initiatives rolling out this current fiscal year and upcoming intersect and or complement one another. And it really makes the planning and successful implementation of one helpful for the successful planning and implementation of the other. So um, that is uh, how we are focused on managing all of these significant changes. All right, so here are some of the key emerging issues for Be Well. Um, as I was uh, reviewing my notes and uh, thinking to present on this slide, I thought of that old long cliche, which I think has been uh, debunked many times over about crisis is like the symbol is the uh, opportunity challenge as well as opportunity. And that's kind of how Be Well's feeling these days. And our emphasis, of course, is on the opportunity. We all know it's a challenge, um, but we are here to focus on the opportunity. So um, these emerging issues, of course, our prop one is here. Um, and we are looking to begin to identify long-term what we need to do to order our steps to be as prepared as possible to not only minimize the impact of service delivery within our county, but to maximize um, our leverage of funding opportunities and leveraging of federal funds to maintain any um, decrease in treatment funding that may occur. So other emerging issues are there are multiple CalAIM <laughs> justice involved initiatives, pre and post release programs that are launching, as well as then the ongoing implementation of uh, some of the other CalAIM um, 
uh, processes and protocols that we're doing. So uh, just when folks are feeling like the boat stops rocking, it's time for CalAIM to start up another initiative. So we are, we are learning how to get our sea legs, I guess. Um, the other emerging issue is the effective utilization of uh, the Medi-Cal mobile crisis benefit. Um, we're having some challenges related to the recruitment and retention of overnight staffing. Uh, again, I think you all spoke a lot. We've, we've talked a lot about the impact of the pandemic, the impact of that on everyone and in terms of work expectations, um, et cetera. So that is a challenge we're having. Um, we're also really still working to um, with our uh, dispatch partners on clarifying referral and response to protocols within the Legacy 911 dispatch and co-response programs. Um, and uh, I do want to note that I know that Chief Hartwig mentioned yesterday that we will be coming back before you in June to talk about uh, that portion of the mobile crisis benefit, which allows for behavioral wellness to partner with emergency services on a team uh, and um, uh, provide that beneficiary uh, service through that uh, avenue. So we'll be back in June uh, together to talk more about that. All right. Next slide. Okay, so here are our performance measures. Um, we're sharing out these four key performance measures related to the county-wide renew initiative that we're going to track. The first one, um, the access line requests aligns with the uh, respond um, measure. So access line requests for mental health crisis system services offered appointment next day, same day. We will maintain that target, I think. Um, as just discussed with the mobile crisis benefit and changes maybe to access and um, the dispatch of calls through our system may demonstrate a significant increase for us. So we, uh, while we have maintained um, a really stable performance on this target, we look forward to monitoring again this year in light of some of the recent changes that are, uh, have just started regarding mobile crisis um, and crisis access. The next, um, Goal is related to redesign under Renew, and um, it is about the number of calls, uh, individual, the number of individuals that will be served by the new crisis stabilization unit, which opens in mid-May. As you can see, we are anticipating a significant jump. Um, on average, prior to the closure of the CSU, we were, as you can see, seeing less than one person a day in a voluntary setting, and we anticipate and hope that we will have a minimum uh, of four people a day in the locked facility. But again, we have the potential to go much higher with eight. This next year, we're just gonna be ramping up. So again, we have a lot of also public relations work to do. I think folks um, previously um, had different experiences in utilizing the CSU and we need to do a lot of um, uh, outreach to folks to let them know this is now a locked facility and actually um, meet some of the needs that they were concerned about in the past. Our third goal is about the retain portion of the Renew initiative and it is about our certified peer support specialist staff. We created this slide, I think maybe five weeks ago or so and I want to, I'm happy to report that that number 10 and the estimated actual is now at 13. Um, in just the past month and a half, we've had three staff sit for their state certification board as peers and pass that. So we're really, really glad about that. And then finally, the PUF uh, days, the psychiatric health facility days, uh, length of stay days is a part of the rebalance uh, goal for the initiative of Renew. And while we continue to be higher than our goal of less than seven days for a length of stay, we will maintain that goal because that is a best practice standard across um, psychiatric health facilities. And so we want to uh, continue to work towards hitting or going below that mark. All right. Next up, we'll talk about the KPMG priority recommendations, CalAIM readiness. I'm happy to report that the first part of CalAIM readiness was participating in deliverables under the Behavioral Health Quality Improvement Project. And um, over the last uh, year and a half, BeWell has secured uh, $750,000 of incentive money uh, due to our uh, timeliness uh, and deliverables on the readiness for CalAIM. We're gonna continue to implement the various CalAIM initiatives um, and one of those is to meet with public health quarterly to collaborate and coordinate care. 
One of the other recommendations here under KPMG is the role a specific utilization target. And as I noted before, many initiatives and projects that we're involved in overlap and are connected. And our electronic health record smart care is one that is going to, has really um, allowed us now to take this goal and recommendation of, of KPMGs to the next level and get executed um, within the first quarter of the next fiscal year. Thanks to this new electronic health record, we have much better ability for supervisors and managers to receive training and access new utilization reports that they can work with staff on on, uh, on the regular to ensure that we are providing um, the right level of care at the right time um, for persons in our system. The next KPMG recommendation is around reviewing client acuity across assertive community treatment programs. Um, this past year, we actually renamed uh, ACT programs to full service partnership programs to accurately reflect how they were operating. And as a result, we have also uh, taken the full service partnership adult and older adult system here in Santa Barbara, um, using it as a model to conduct utilization review, identify new and improved processes. We hired an FSP manager in the uh, last fiscal year who is meeting quarterly with all of our full service partnerships uh, in the county to so that we can create, maintain, and sustain uh, a system of care across the county from south to north. Uh, and, and everything in between that is consistent. So um, that was really important because that was not necessarily happening when we had um, the different name because some were called FSPs and some were called ACTS. Um, one of the uh, things that we have added is advanced motivational interviewing training here in March and April, and we will begin to train clinical staff across each department. This is a high level um, advanced, again, truly advanced motivational interviewing training, which provides each staff member with four individual service, individual coaching sessions, in addition to the group sessions and training. Motivational interviewing at this level of expertise in both the alcohol, drug, and mental health sides of our house is imperative as we look to um, really engage and address those most in need in our counties. I know we've, we've talked a lot um, recently around the fentanyl and opioid crises that are occurring in our county and, and how do we help people get to care sooner and, and um, stay longer. But the other part of this is also when we look at some of the populations we will serve under care court and potentially Senate Bill 43, really imperative. Those are folks who are most reticent and actually suffer from diagnoses that impact, impair their ability to have self-awareness and easily engage in um, care and treatment. All right, and the final KPMG priority recommendation was a high, util high utilizer analysis. And I think you did hear uh, about Familiar Faces yesterday. It's a collaborative program between um, Probation Public Defender's Office and Be Well. It is launching, it is staffed, and the goals and objectives um, for criteria um, are being finalized, and we will focus on the high utilizers of our three systems collectively. And again, a real nice intersection for as we look to Senate Bill 43 implementation, as these are similar populations that we will be engaging. There are no service level reductions. And in summary, these three objectives highlighted here represent more than simply our top priorities for Be Well in the coming year. Each of these tasks or projects represents important values that we will need to guide our steps in this most transformative time in California's county behavioral health system. These values are efficiency, working harder, not smarter, and having an EHR that will help us to do that, sustainability, ensuring that we capitalize on all available and relevant funding opportunities, including maximizing the leveraging of federal funds via payment reform, and flexibility, um, that although it's not the outcome we had hoped for, Prop 1 is here, and we are going to, we are already working collectively, both internally within our department and with our external partners to, to uh, <laughs> wrap our heads around and bend our mindset <laughs> to completely change uh, our 20 year old Mental Health Service Act mindset to that of the new and integrated behavioral health system of care. All right, so in conclusion, 
Be Well has a lot going on, but hopefully um, I conveyed in this year's budget presentation, we are feeling prepared for all that is on our plate and all that is literally barreling our way. <laughs> and we chose a quote to reflect that. Um, from Donna Curran, American fashion designer, it's all about finding the calm in the chaos. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Hartman, thank you. Well, the onslaught <coughs> of, of new uh, programs, policies, uh, requirements for your department is absolutely staggering. And the fact that you're here with good humor and a can-do spirit and understanding how these may overlap mm -hmm. and, and that you've been working towards this gives me tremendous confidence and, and above all admiration for you. And I, I just am so appreciative because it would be so easy to just uh, get discouraged. <laughs> and uh, you're not that kind of person and, and no. good for you. Um, so uh, first thing, advanced motivational training. Mm -hmm. um, I could use that, uh, <laughs> uh, but I wonder um, how widely that could go. Could that also go to the nonprofits who are working with homeless individuals? I, I get the sense that uh, CityNet and, and others are, you know, making lots of contacts, but are they doing uh, mm. the best? You know, does everybody have a, a framework that they're using and, and trying to? you know, push a little harder each time because we, yeah. we want to get people in shelter. We want to get a roof over their head. They want to get stability in their lives a and just enabling them to continue uh, by providing, you know, everything they need. And so, so I, I'm intrigued by that and wonder if you could comment. Yeah, I, I think as with every kind of training opportunity experience we bring in-house um, to develop expertise within our system, we then hope to, to cultivate experts within our system that can be consultants and partners to our CBOs as well. And maybe we are not going to be a certified program as the National um, uh, Emotional Inter... The National... It's called MINT. Motivational Interviewing National... Mint is fine. Tea. There we go. Um, but we will be able to really uh, work with our CBOs, provide them the training ongoing, um, and uh, help them to, again, establish those effective relationships at the level that we And do you think are. that'll happen over this fiscal year, that, that is the next fiscal year? I think that some of it may happen in pockets, as we talked about, the full service partnership collaborative um, and collective meets quarterly, and one of their goals each year is to bring some level of, of advanced training to the group outside of our own internal FSPs um, to help them better uh, engage and sustain care for our most high need clients. And with Prop 1 coming um, uh, and the establishment of full service partnerships as a main category of care, uh, we definitely will be starting in that pocket of uh, And uh, before I ask about CSUs, um, sobering centers, are they, are they being used more now? Is, is law enforcement from different jurisdictions starting to bring people there instead of to emergency rooms or to jails? Yeah. I'm sorry I don't have the specific data as to which um, uh, entities are bringing folks to the sobering center, but we are aware that they are being more um, utilized and uh, that, that people are having a positive experience by bringing folks to the sobering center and seeing that that is a successful way to intervene ahead of other types of services. And so um, we are encouraged by that and um, we actually are looking to help our sobering center get to a more semi-permanent location ahead of um, the Kai Real Master Plan, um, given that that building they're currently in is having some challenges during the rain. So oh. um, we l are looking forward to being able to provide some funding for something a little more permanent and expansive for that group. And then have you learned things from the sobering center that you think will apply to the CSU, again, getting people to use it effectively? Yeah, I think that's what we're learning is that it's really about the outreach and public messaging that 
we're open, we're new, and countering some narratives that have just been out there ha dangling for a long time. So, but it's it's not so much general public as it is law enforcement. It's right? law enforcement and uh, our hospitals, and, and some of our other provider partners. Okay, well, well done. Thanks, Supervisor Caps. Thank you, Director Navarro. I think you covered it. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to acknowledge a few other uh, things that I see your department doing so well, and you're really out in the community. Uh, I mean, everywhere I go, I feel like Be Well is there, represented, and I just want to acknowledge, thanks for providing over a 1,000 units of Narcan uh, to our volunteers last week as we distribute them in Isla Vista, but I've been with you at a suicide walk, at a, a, a vigil for those who have died from opioids, so um, I just, you know, we focus, as we should be, on, on the need for uh, those who are in treatment, and, and but you are also just so public facing, and I especially wanted to appreciate your um, department's connection, working with our criminal justice partners, uh, familiar faces programs, really moving outside of your department and, and connecting with all of the, the more the better. That's definitely the trajectory, so many thanks. Thank you. I just want to say, your, your model at the Puff also is something we we all should learn from of how to deal with issues. So I want to give a big shout out to that team. All right, we good? All right, thank you very much, Director Navarro. Thanks. And our final one in this functional group is from Child Support Services, Meta Richardson. Good morning, Chair Lavignino and members of the board. I am Meta Richardson, Director of the Department of Child Support Services. With me today is our managing attorney, Justin Arnold, our child support manager, Maria Aguila, and our project manager, Lucy Reyes. We are pleased to be here today to present to you our fiscal year 24-25 budget. I'd like to start with a brief overview. Our department is comprised of a staff totaling 74 FTEs whose responsibility is to establish parentage, develop fair orders for financial support and medical care, and enforce those orders. We have a caseload of about 10,000. We are 100% federal and state funded. Our fiscal year 24-25 operating budget is 11.2 million, which funds 74 FTEs with no general fund contribution and no service level reductions. The 11.2 million is based on the initial fiscal year 24-25 funding allocation letter received by our department in January and is subject to change pending the outcome of the state budget process. If funding comes in lower than originally expected, vacant and vacated positions will only be filled as funding allows. As mentioned, our budget includes 74 FTEs. We have unfunded a child support investigation specialist position, which has been vacant for some time. Our requested fiscal year 24-25 operating budget includes a slight decrease from the prior year due to an annual reallocation of funding to local child support agencies based on average cost per FTE and FTE to caseload ratio. Anticipated accomplishments. We are collecting and distributing 28.7 million in child support. In August, 2023, we implemented two exciting innovations designed to increase access to child support services. Meet Now with a Caseworker gives customers instant virtual access to child support staff through our local website, while our virtual receptionist gives customers coming into our lobby 
the ability to check in via tablet and connect with their caseworker in an interview room. We have implemented recent legislative changes that have resulted in our department no longer receiving or receiving very few foster care referrals from the Department of Social Services. Except in limited circumstances, it is now presumed that payment of child support by the parent is likely to impose a barrier to a proposed family reunification. The department has reviewed and closed 555 child support cases as a result of this legislation, an extensive effort that was completed in March 24. We are also in the midst of a construction project in our Santa Barbara office, which is located in the county's Casa Nueva building. This project will result in a 65% reduction in our office space while retaining the same customer-facing lobby and a customer interview room. Similar reductions in office space are occurring throughout the state as local child support agencies find that many child support functions are able to be performed effectively by remote or hybrid employees. Our Santa Maria office was similarly right-sized in fiscal year 22-23. Savings from both right-sizings will fund approximately two child support officers. We have successfully onboarded our managing attorney, Justin Arnold, and we anticipate the successful onboarding of our new assistant director, Tiffany Rocha, who begins next week and comes to us from similar roles in Orange and Kern counties with 23 years of experience in the child support program. Department goals and objectives. Some of our goals for the upcoming year include implementing legal and procedural changes. These changes will have a significant impact on the program especially changes to the guideline calculator, which is used to determine the appropriate amount of child support. The change to the guideline calculator is designed to more closely link the amount of support payments to the parent's ability to pay. We're enhancing the customer referral process to and from other departments in order to assist with addressing the barriers to paying child support that many parents face. We're advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within the child support program through active participation in the State Department of Child Support Services new VOICE Committee, which stands for Visionary Outreach and Inclusion Committee for Equity. Participants were selected this month through a competitive process, and the committee's goals include reviewing policies and procedures through an equity lens to address DEI issues and supporting a DEI dashboard to monitor representation levels and the demographic impact of key decisions. We're also working to further streamline the process by which customers transfer documents to us and to the program. And we're developing strategic collaborations with local child support agencies statewide. Emerging issues. We don't yet know if the state budget deficit will impact child support funding. We continue to operate in a lean, efficient manner and to be on the lookout for cost-saving improvements in order to prepare for any variability in child support funding. Child support is a service. Our department wholeheartedly supports the state's goal of family-centered services that emphasize the well-being and empowerment of families. And we are working towards this end, including our recent implementation of a parenting court, which assists eligible parents with breaking down barriers to paying child support. We are responding to legal and procedural changes in the child support environment, including the guideline calculator changes already mentioned as well as Family Code Section 17400, which mandates that child support agencies stop the enforcement of certain arrears or past due amounts 
determined to be uncollectible. Performance measures. The department continues to perform well in all federal measures of performance and to exceed the statewide average in all measures. We are on track to exceed collections in the current federal fiscal year in comparison to the past two years. The last item there, the decrease in the ratio of dollars expended compared to distributed collections is the result of increased program funding in 22-23 and 23-24 that was used in part for one-time projects intended to result in significant cost savings over time, like the previously mentioned right-sizing projects. We have no service level reductions. In summary, in the upcoming year, we will be focused on implementing sweeping legal and procedural program changes. We're continuing to use program funding efficiently and to look for opportunities for cost savings. We're collaborating with others to strengthen service delivery and advance DEI practices within the program. And we're optimizing the use of technology to improve the customer experience. And lastly, the, the quote that um, really resonated with me was, change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. And that's by Barack Obama. And you probably notice I kind of tear up when I read that because <laughs> it just resonates with me so much. Um, and also, I think departmentally, it really shows um, it, that on a day-to-day -day basis, all of our child support staff are really striving to make positive changes for our families and children in our community. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for doing such a good job with that. And obviously, you're invested. So we appreciate that. Supervisor Hartman. Just a couple questions. The first is, could you talk about the virtual receptionist? What, what is that? Absolutely. Um, and I may call upon Maria Aguila, our, our manager who sees it in action on a daily basis, to speak to that. Hi, um, Supervisor um, Hartman. Um, the virtual reception is, is, is innovation uh, technology that um, helps the clients when they walk in into the office to check in in a tablet. So then we have a person working from home or from the office, depending who is covering the receptionist, to help the client. So we um, usually don't, we don't have to have the person or the, the staff member in the office to be taking care of the client. Yeah, so that sounds like a tremendous innovation. And have you found that, uh, first of all, so I walk in the office and there's a tablet and I press the button and and then somebody will come on and talk to me uh, uh, virtually? Yes, that is correct. Okay, uh, and and have you found that, uh, how, does, how do the people who are using it find that and how do your staff like the flexibility? Could you elaborate? Yes. So at the beginning, we needed to educate our customers on how to use it, and also, of course, our staff, because once the receptionist is um, reading the customers, they need to connect it with the child support officer, and that is a hand off, a warm off um, uh, to the to the I'm sorry to the child support officer, and it was like uh, the curbing of learning how to do that. But after I would say like two months. Uh, of learning, so people, I mean, staff and customers like it a lot, and they uh -huh. are, they got used to now. Yeah, well, good, that, that's great to hear. Um, the, the other question I have, um, I mean, you've brought in 28.7 million. It sounds like that isn't, we, we won't be able to use that measure necessarily in the future because the legislature is saying that there are barriers that you, could, could you just, you're kind of caught in, in two places. Could you elaborate on that? We are, and it's interesting you say that. It's, it's a comment I made. We had a, um, a regional director's meeting last week, and it was, that was exactly the comment I made. It's, it's an ironic time in the program right now. 
is that um, we we want to um, so in in many cases there's there's um, things that we can do to ease hardships on individuals, but in some cases that will result in less collections. And so yes, that we are, and we're not quite sure how it, how it's all going to to, um, to you know how what what will our caseload be because the caseload in the the caseload in the program is declining already. And for instance, the foster care cases, that, that resulted in an approximate 5% decrease in our caseload. So there is that, but um, it, you know, it just depends, I think, ultimately, what, how does the program wanna measure itself? And that may have to change with time because there's an informal um, concentration on caseload, but, but maybe over time that becomes not the proper measurement for what we do. Yeah, I mean, I think we want parents to be responsible, feel responsible for their children, and there's lots of different measures, and I guess your expertise is more in the financial piece of it, but uh, I guess more to come. Yes, and it, and it does, the, the types of um, service we wanna provide takes longer, and so costs more. Um, so I think those are the, the issues that the program will be grappling with going forward, yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you and your team very much, Matt. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that for agenda management, we're gonna do public comment on this working group, and then we're going to break for lunch. It's already here, Aaron. And then we will come back after that, so. Hold on a second, unless, what, where was the lunchroom? Is it somewhere you can hold off, or? Oh, it's cold stuff? Okay. Well, do you wanna do, you wanna get into that other working group? So would I, so I'd like to get the first three done if we could. Okay, agenda management. Yeah, so we're gonna do public comment, take a short break, then we'll do the top three from the next group and then we'll break for lunch. Okay, public comment. Chair Lavanino, members of the board, we have three requests to speak on public comment for the Health and Human Services Functional Group. We are going to begin here in Santa Barbara with Chris Yost to be followed by Lee Heller on Zoom. Chris? Um, good morning, Mr. Chair and Supervisors. Um, I am here from um, UCSB, and I wanted to talk about the Harding University Partnership School, the Community Resource Center, and it seemed really appropriate to be speaking after all these people who provide the services to our community. We hope that this new building that we are gonna be working on will be another space that these services can use as a satellite office to provide services to the community. Um, for more than a decade, UCSB has partnered with the Santa Barbara Unified School District at Harding, and this is yet another extension of that, really putting schools at the center of the community as a place for people to come together. Um, it, the new building will be approximately 3,200 square feet, and it is a partnership between the school district, the city of Santa Barbara, the county of Santa Barbara, and we will be relying on a lot of the agencies, our local agencies, and wonderful NGOs to provide services there. Um, the households at Harding with school-aged children are just one part of the community. So we hope to expand our ability to support um, the zero to five kids, the adults that don't have children, the adult households without children, senior households, and others. Um, could I have the next slide, please? This puts schools kind of at the center of supporting all these folks. So at the top in the dark blue, that's really the core of what a school does, serving the students and their families and their teachers. Um, and this looks at kind of expanding that to a larger group. Next slide, please. Um, this is the site um, of the building. There is a building there that is seismically unsafe. So we'll be demolishing that building and replacing it with a new functional building. Um, and it, so it really shouldn't have a lot of neighbor, neighborhood impact. It's replacing something that exists with something that will be more functional. Next slide, please. Um, that's the existing building as seen from Gillespie. Next slide, please. 
And these are some architectural renderings of what we'll have. So it's gonna be a very flexible space. Um, the west side really doesn't have a space. I'm gonna take one of these here and I'm gonna bring one to Santa Maria. I want you guys to Assuming that wasn't your architect. <laughs> All right. Wasn't my, my Go ahead, we'll give you a chair. couple extra seconds. In. Okay. Um, so we're just working with our community partners to develop this. Um, it's very exciting. And uh, next slide, please. You can see it's kind of a large, flexible space. Um, next slide. And this is just kind of our project plan. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about this more. I know we've been in touch already with um, Supervisor Capps and Supervisor Williams' offices, so we appreciate your support and thank you for your time. Thank you, to, thank you for being here. Apologize for the interruption on that. No problem. Okay. okay. Next speaker. We will now proceed to, with Zoom with Dr. Lee Heller to be followed by Jean Silva, who is our final speaker. Lee. Chair Lavanino and board members, I too want to express my gratitude to public health staff for their yeoman service and to Director Hamami in particular for his advocacy for his staff and for the program I will touch on today. I'm here to ask for a budget realignment to save on costs, generate revenue, and increase the quality and quantity of services offered by our animal services division. We are being penny wise and pound foolish regarding our veterinarian salary which is currently offered at about $50,000 below market rate, resulting in an unfilled position. Instead, we should be spending to save by increasing it to market rate. Currently, Animal Services is having to hire contract vets at a greater cost and to outsource care to private practice vets who also charge at a much higher cost. The lack of a staff veterinarian also leads to longer stays for animals in the shelter, resulting in higher costs for food, medication, and staff care. A market appropriate salary increase would look like it would save us close to $200,000 and that is not chump change. We are also missing an important revenue stream by not having staff that is needed to do license canvassing. This would be part of Project PetSafe, which Director Hamami mentioned in his presentation, is saving on costs by providing proactive outreach and care along with DocuPet. Prior to the pandemic, Project PetSafe generated license revenue of nearly a million dollars annually. Projections for the coming year are a 30% reduction in revenue because no one is doing canvassing and outreach, and DocuPen alone cannot fill that gap. Some of the money hate saved by hiring a staff veterinarian could be redirected to licensed canvassing staff who would then raise the money to pay their own way and more. However, we should not wait for a new vet to be onboarded as that could take up to a year. If your board would authorize $50,000 to hire short-term extra help, this canvassing could begin immediately. That upfront outlay is likely to generate roughly $110,000 in the first year, paying for itself and more very quickly. And DOS results don't diminish after time because once these folks are in the system, automatic license renewals are generated and we don't need to go back to those doors. Another way to fund this budget reallocation would involve releasing some of the TSAC money that has gone to medical and dental services for unhoused persons and is no longer needed as many of these clients have been enrolled in Medi-Cal. So I urge you to move forward with short-term extra help to kickstart revenue generation, to update the veterinary salary offered, and to explore how TSAC funds might be released towards this end. Thank you so much. We will now go to Jean Silva, who is our final speaker on this functional group. Jean. Thank you very much. Um, I too would like to commend the Public Health Service staff and Dr. Hamami um, for the work that has been done, um, particularly by uh, Sarah Aguilar, our director, on restoring the animal services, um, public services to pre-COVID levels. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I do have uh, two concerns. Um, in our business, one of the ways you control cost and workload is to manage the population in the shelters. And spay neuter is one of the ways that you decrease the number of unwanted pets. Um, and then of course, the other thing that we do is to return pets 
owned pets to their homes more quickly. And we do that through licensing and through microchipping. Um, since 2022, we've not had a vet. And that's affected our ability to do affordable spay neuter. And indeed, during COVID, the entire system reduced the availability of public of, of affordable spay neuter. And we're feeling that in our increased populations today. So I'm heartened to hear that the of the progress that Dr. Hamami's staff has made towards uh, getting our vet salary. Um, increase to a competitive range. Um, you know, they say that time is money, but in our business, I think we have to say that time is baby bunnies and puppies and kittens. The other issue, of course, is licensing. We want to send pets to their homes when they get lost. And the side benefit is that licensing produce revenue. So this year, in 2024, we're going to be making a significant effort to bring the licensing and the license revenue up to $766,000. But the 24-25 budget includes $300 of $300,000, excuse me, of revenue that is one time as Dr. Hamami pointed out. So Next year, we need to raise at least, in fact, over a million dollars just to cover that gap as well as what we raised this year. And we will, we all know there will be other increases in costs next year. So anything that we can do to increase the amount of the number of licenses that we sell is incredibly helpful. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, that is your time. Thank you. And that concludes public comment for this functional group. Okay, thank you very much. So once again, we're going to take a, we're going to come back at five after. We're going to take a short break for our interpreter. Then we're going to do um, the functional group summary, auditor controller, tre treasurer tax collector, and clerk recorder assessor before lunch. So if you're after that, you'll be after lunch. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you.
All right, we're reconvening this uh, budget workshop for the 2024-2025 Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors budget. We're gonna kick it back to Mr. Stephen Yee for general government and support services. Thank you, Chair Lavanino and members of the board. As noted in the intro slide, the uh, general government and support services consists of auditor controller, treasurer tax collector, public administrator, debt service, clerk recorder assessor, human resources, information technology, and general services. This functional group makes up almost 10% of total county operating expenditures at 143 million and receives 13% of the county's overall GFC at 50 million while making up nearly 10% of the county's overall FTE at 421. In the five-year operating revenue and GFC trends chart, the most glaring changes are seen in general services and the information technology departments starting in fiscal year 23-24. This is due to the formation of the standalone IT department where funding was carved out from general services and established in the new IT department. You'll notice that that both, gen, uh, both departments generate substantial operating revenue as general services contains multiple internal service funds such as motor pool and utilities, and the IT department now consists of IT and communications services, all of which generate operate, operating revenues through charges to county departments. The large increase seen in fiscal year 24-25 in general services is mainly due to an increase in charges for services in the fleet fund, while IT's increase in 24-25 is also due to increased charges for services. Here we see the five-year trend of operating expenditures mirroring the operating revenue and GFC trends in the previous slide. All functional group departments, with the exception of general services, show fairly moderate increases over the five-year period. General services increases have been mostly in services and supplies, which includes all of their maintenance costs and formerly included their IT software costs. Turning to FTE, the five-year trend shows fairly stable across all departments, with the exception of general services and IT due to the creation of the IT department. Additionally, IT's FTE are increasing by 11 F FTE in fiscal year 24-25, mainly due to additions approved by your board in the current fiscal year relating to workday implementation and support, and other positions requested to round out their technical team. Major challenges and in initiatives. Uh, major challenges include the implementation and ongoing support of Workday, recruitment and retention of qualified staff, and office space needs um, is a challenge identified by the Elections Division of Clerk Recorder Assessor Elections, the Treasurer Tax uh, Collector, Public Administrator, and the IT Department. Major initiatives uh, that will be undertaken include implementation of SB 43, development of a multi-year HR strategic plan, digitization of the assessor's property files, a focused effort on the internal audit function, completion of the public safety radio network, and implementation of a three-year countywide IT strategic plan. Next, we'll get into department summaries. As mentioned earlier, the majority of the auditor's funding comes from GFC at almost nine million and primarily funds their accounting services activities. The majority of treasurer, tax collector, public administrator's funding comes from GFC at just over five million and funds the public support, tax and collections and admin and support budget programs. They also generate charges for services at 3.4 million, which mainly consists of administrative revenue from the treasury and is primarily used to fund treasury operations. Most of debt services uh, revenue is generated through other financing sources consisting of operating transfers from departments for debt service payments, followed by intergovernmental revenue, which is made up of the redevelopment agency debt service payments. The majority of the clerk recorder assessor's revenue is re received from GFC at 12 and a half million and mainly funds the assessor, elections, and admin and support budget programs. Charges for services are also a significant source at over six million, consisting of various property tax administrative fees that help fund assessor activities and rec recording fees that fund the clerk recorder function. 
Most of human resources funding comes from GFC at nearly $8 million, which is used to fund all of their budget programs, with the exception of the County Dental Insurance Fund, whose funding comes from dental insurance premium contributions classified as miscellaneous revenue. IT's funding primarily comes from other financing sources at $32.6 million, consisting of transfers from other funds to support the public safety radio network project, followed by charges for services, which are revenues from county departments that pay into the IT shared services and communications operating funds. And as previously mentioned, general services revenue consists largely of charges for services at nearly $30 million, primarily made up of fees received from departments for fleet and utilities operations followed by general fund contribution. Sources support various county functions, including facilities maintenance, capital projects, purchasing, and fleet operations. And that concludes the general government and support services functional group summary. All right, thank you very much. We'll move right into our auditor controller, Betsy Schaefer's. I was gonna say Betsy Schaefer's office, so <laughs> Betsy Schaefer. Is this on? It yeah. sure is. Good afternoon, Chair Lavanino, supervisors. Um, I want to start today just by thanking everybody. Um, I have a list of thank yous, so if you'll bear with me, I think um, it's important. Um, I do want to thank you, board, for considering our 24-25 AC budget. Uh, thank you, Mona Miyasato, um, for being a great CEO. Um, thank you, our assistant CEO, Nancy Anderson. Um, she's assigned to our office and really, I think she's been more like a therapist lately than <laughs> um, anything else. Um, thank you, C our analyst, um, Stephen Yee. You guys may not know this, um, we didn't put it in our thing, but um, in our presentation, but we've been really short staffed um, this past year. And um, this past year, we lost our business manager, I think you remember him last year, Lamont. Um, and so we didn't have anyone to do our budget and um, Stephen, you just, just stepped in and did a great job. So he knows our budget better than I do. So if you have questions, we're gonna just, <laughs> and he knows there's no um, leasing of our budget. So um, I also wanna thank our, um, the CEO business manager, Don Holden. Um, I don't think I've actually officially met her but um, she helped recruit um, very uh, several positions in our office over the last few months. One of which is, is um, Courtney Kramer. She's our new business manager here. And so um, really appreciated all the help from the CEO's office this year. We would not, literally would not be here without them. So um, I also wanna just kudos to Paul Clemente, his second year, he's a veteran now, so. Um, I also want to introduce and thank our AC budget team over there. I know this is, um, I'm, I'm sure they're a little embarrassed. This is a day, you know, in the second day into budget hearings, but um, we are trying, you know, it is part of the County Budget Act to have the Auditor Controller's Office here represented. Um, they do that, it's, you know, part of the Budget Act, but I think they, it's there because um, it's a second set of eyes, it's, you know, checks and balances, it's all those good things. So um, we have Juan Esquerdo, um, he's the one in the blue tie, right? And we have Vivi Shiloh, she's um, our financial reporting division chief. Um, and we have Nick Knocker, um, and he's our financial reporting supervisor. And they all work with Paul and Stephen and all the analysts to, um, uh, you know, reconcile the budget. I will say they're all three CPAs also. And I think collectively you're looking at probably 50 years of county experience. Um, they look very young, so. <laughs> but, and mostly all with the auditor's office. Um, uh, Nick went renegade and went to the SB SERS for a little bit, but he's back. And um, so I want you to know that they're a great team and normally I'd be sitting there, I just thought it might be overkill with, um, you know, six people up there. So, um, so I really appreciate them um, there and feel free to, ask questions, they'll route it to me. I'm on speed dial with them, so, yeah. Um, I also wanna, of course, thank Ed Price, the best assistant auditor controller. 
Um, we always say that, we kind of joke around, but it really is true. I really appreciate him. Um, and um, um, Mike Struven, you don't know that, but he finished our budget after, um, you know, after Stephen did the initial work, and so the baton was passed to him. And I also just want to thank the whole AC team back at the office. They're eating pizza right now, so um, enjoy. <laughs> and then um, all the department CEOs. Um, I think I've mentioned this before that many of the CEOs and assistant um, uh, directors have started in our office, and it's a really, really proud thing um, and a proud history of our office. So, okay. I think, do you want to go ahead and, there, thank you. Um, our first slide here, I hope I didn't forget anyone in that, thank you, but, um, okay, our, our first key services, key services, our key slide here, is we maintain the counts and records of the financial transactions of the county. You know, that's seen a lot um, through our payroll and through paying the bills of the county, and just every financial transaction comes through the county of Santa Barbara. Um, comes through our office and has my signature on it. So it's very, um, you know, it's a very big responsibility. We provide the reports, um, policies, and systems necessary to manage the county's financial operations. Um, we levy a portion and distribute pro property taxes. Um, we furnish customer focused financial decision support to the Board of Supervisors, the County Executive Officer, and Department Directors. And we really do that through our ACFR, through internal control reviews, and um, uh, supporting our financial systems. And we provide independent, objective, and cost effective audit services. Okay. I will say, you know, listening to the other presenters, I feel like they gave you a meal you know, you could sink your teeth into. Um, you know, this is probably good because it's before lunch, but ours are more like appetizers. So um, I hope it does leave you wanting more from us <laughs> and um, wanting to more, know more about us. But our operating budget, um, almost $12 million. Um, our capital budget is 27,000. General fund contribution is 8.9 million. And our general county program transfers 1.3 million, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we have 55 uh, full-time equivalents, also known as people, humans, so. Yeah. Um, and these transfers, the 1.3, um, that's really primarily due to support and pay for the workday support division. Um, you'll see, yeah, you'll see that um, we added four FTEs uh, mid-year, which shows um, an increase from prior year. And so we went from 51 to 56, or 55 FTEs. Um, we have some proposed budget changes. And again, this is all related to those four FTEs, so nothing in there. This is really a theme you'll see throughout. We have three themes here. Um, our anticipated accomplishments um, for this to take us through June 30 of 24. Uh, we want to continue to support the ERP. We want to continue staff, professional staff development. And we have to keep doing operations. And in that operations, $1.2 billion of property taxes to local agencies and processed um, 121 uh, county payroll payments. You know, we talk about the ERP. I'm sorry, I'm going off script. Um, and just that $1.2 billion is really um, important. I mean, it's really $4 billion that goes through our financial system. I'm saying four because it's two billion in and then two billion out. So I just think that's um, a really important number. Um, again, this is what we plan to do next year, which looks a lot like um, current year, and that is um, supporting, um, you know, doing our operations. We wanna implement the ERP, um, and we wanna strengthen internal audit. I do wanna just, you know, that second bullet under the ERP, it says we are trying to do phase one, which is financials, the accounting. And then it's, you know, we're definitely gonna be in high gear to do the human capital piece, which includes payroll. Um, we're gonna do the best we can. That's a very aggressive schedule, okay. Um, if you go back, thank you, Courtney. Um, we, in, under strengthening internal audit, 
um, we really want to have enough staffing and internal audit to complete um, several engagements, which includes responding to whistleblower reports and strengthening internal controls across the county. I don't think people know that, and we do plan on bringing back a whistleblower, just summary, high-level summary, um, to the board soon. Emerging issues, um, no surprise here, just the enterprise resource planning system. We need to get that done. We need it to go live, and um, then we have to do the care and feeding of it going forward, and then building up um, internal audit. Uh, we still want to continue to produce great reports. We have um, our ACFR here that was presented to you, I think, just a couple uh, weeks ago. Um, we still are really trying to automate our disbursement process. Um, we're um, really good at 85, 90% there. Um, and other counties, other governments are not at that high. You know, I've said that before. They're probably like at the 50, 60%. And us doing as, as much as we do is really good. Um, our payroll dismir disbursements, they always ask me, why can't we get it night at 100% of, you know, ACH direct deposit? Um, and really, we, we just have some holdouts there. We have some um, people who prefer to get that piece of paper and for their own personal reasons, and we have to accommodate that. Um, and then um, I think that last one is uh, retention, and that's a new one, and that data is given to us, and I'm, I'm really happy about that. We're, we're at, what is that, 80, 100%, so. No service level reductions. Um, and summary, again, sorry, you already know the end of the story, which is, um, you know, the ERP system. Operations don't stop, um, and I have there, nor do we want them to. We don't want payroll to stop. We need to keep paying the bills. We need to keep closing the books. We need to keep issuing, um, you know, uh, our financial statements. We need to keep claiming um, all of our federal and state monies. So we have to keep doing all of that stuff. And um, as I mentioned, our internal audit positions, um, we have, I believe, two vacancies we're trying to fill um, right now. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't know who this person is, Richard Turner, but, um, but I thought his quote was good and is in theme with what we're trying to explain about what accountants do. And it says, in the realm of finance, every accountant is a translator, turning numerical chaos into financial clarity. So um, that was our theme this past year, was us being translators and bridges and uh, pathways from stuff to accounting. So that's my presentation. Take any questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, Supervisor Hartman. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for another great report. Uh, I use this a lot uh, when, when I have to explain county government to people. This is a, a, a great place uh, to direct them. And I also love your introductions. They, they make uh, the abstractness of accounting and, and auditing and how important it is to the functioning of government uh, human. And I always like those stories. Um, I, I wanted to talk, uh, ERP is the same as Workday? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, I remember last budget, uh, Supervisor, now Chair Lavanino, asked a question about how many vacancies we have. I think it took three people uh, or, or one person working three days to actually pull that information out and, and make it available. Uh, and, and now Workday or the ERP, that will allow us to do, be much more efficient and much more effective. And so I, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I think I speak on behalf of the entire board that that is a very high priority for all of us, for our staff, for our county as a whole. So I hope that uh, I'm glad to see that reflected here. And I just uh, want to reinforce how important that is to all of us. And, and your office is really at the heart of it. And, and so we, we need that. From, from you. Uh, and the other thing is um, internal audits. Uh, I, I know we do audits uh, in different parts, but uh, you know, over half our budget is coming from other sources and audits are important. And when I first met with you, you explained uh, how your office is really 
critical to um, giving us all confidence that the money is being well spent, well tracked. And so I'm so glad you're doing that, and I, I just wanted to reinforce how important the auditing function is to all of us, especially those of us who aren't, don't have a lot of background in that, and, and we rely on high quality auditors to kind of give us a grade and we know, okay, we're, we're safe. Mm -hmm. So um, that's all I have to say, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair Labanino. Uh, ditto. I mean, she, uh, Supervisor Hartman took all of my, my notes. Uh, are you reading off my notes here? It, so, yeah, the ERP system is such a huge priority to this county. And I, right now, we're paying for two systems, you know, because we've got ER, we've got Workday going as well as our legacy programs. And so that's not really efficient as a county. Um, we need to be moving to the next generation here. And so just to whatever... It's one few times I get to, you know, we get to have this a public discussion. You know, I just want to stress... That's a huge priority for, for us that that moves forward as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. While at the same time making sure that I know that there are controls in place and I understand why there's hesitations and why we want to make sure we get it right. If we get it wrong, it's a huge consequences for all of us. We want to make sure that all 4,600 people continue to get paychecks and as well as uh, you know everything else that goes on in this county. Um, but it's, it's really important that we get it right. Am I allowed to respond or do I wait <laughs> until... Um, I think as the auditor controller, you're required <laughs> to respond, so that's um, good. But we, what, we love you so much <laughs> just for asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, you know, I, you saw, I think, 90% of our slides talked about the ERP project, and it is a high priority for us, too. Um, and I would say um, we're doing our best. It is a resource uh, uh, magnet um, and it takes a lot of work to get these systems up and running you know we have it in it's supposed to be in three phases the first phase is the financial piece um, and that first phase um, is the foundation and it is not like um, i'm trying to put the words um, you know it's it's more like engineering this first phase you have to put it together correctly um, that is going to be the foundation for the second phase, which is, includes um, HR and uh, payroll. And then um, I think they're going to try and do budget um, in a separate system, and um, that's supposed to be the third phase. But what's happening, and it's very difficult, is that there, it's, especially if things are all happening at once, we want to be very careful about that. And focus on getting the financials done. Um, and we have the best people on it. We're doing the best we can. And I just, there's a lot of stuff to do to it. Okay. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah. Chair Levin, you know, I guess the, the question for us then is, you know, how can we help, help us help you? And because I would, yeah, and I would say patience. Okay. Because um, I am, uh, I'm telling you, we're doing, we're, we are making progress. Okay. But there's a lot, we, the configurations, the integrations, you have to remember, every department is putting data into that right. system, you know, and we want to make sure that all it goes well. Um, there's a lot of knobs and dials for a better, for lack of a better way of, um, you know, explaining that, that needs to be tested, uh, and it takes time. You know, we have three million transactions that go through that system a year, three million. So, and I just talked four billion dollars. I'm not going to take that lightly. Of course. So, and I'm not trying to spend extra money. I'm, you see me, I'm prudent. We have not asked for people. These are people provided to us to do the project, you know, not our regular staff. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my job as the independently elected auditor controller. I feel that, okay? So, Understood. but I understand and I'm going to, we're, we're moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for being here. And I did not know that this, that was a mandated, I always thought, wow, it's cool you guys are here, but <laughs> you're required to be here, all right. <laughs> By the Budget Act, so don't move. All right, thank you very much, Betsy, appreciate it. All right, next up, Treasurer Tax Collector, Public Administrator, Harry Hagan.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair LaBonita, members of the board. I am Harry Hagan. I'm your treasurer tax collector for the county. And I'm joined today by Kim Tesoro, the assistant treasurer tax collector to my right, and several members of my management team sitting behind me. Um, from your right to left would be Leanne Haggerty, their treasury finance chief, Rebecca Fawfall, who is cannabis tax collection, and Arlene Diaz, who is our public administrator, public guardian, veteran services manager. So the key services that we provide to the county residents, um, public guardian conservator services, veteran services, um, tax collections, which for those that own property in Santa Barbara County, realize today is a significant day. It's April 10th. It's the deadline, delinquency date for property taxes. So really, probably the second busiest day in my office is today, December 10th being the busiest. So the assignment I heard was to keep the presentation to 10 minutes. I understand the assignment, and that's exactly what I'll do. Um, We're apparently taxes. into appetizers. <laughs> so taxes are much more than just secured taxes. It comes with cannabis taxation and TOT also. Um, the banking and investing, uh, Dan Chandler, my chief investment officer, he manages and selects securities, and the pool is about $2.5 billion. We don't have money managers. Dan does that um, with Leanne, myself, and Kim backing him up and consulting with him. Our budget summary, um, it is what it is. The general fund contribution is about half of our um, operating fund, and the rest is made up from fees and different sources like that. And I'm not going to go through every single slide. Um, Stephen, thankfully, went through a lot of the stuff already, um, so I won't reiterate some of the stuff again. The cannabis uh, program is $615,000. We have two employees in our office, and that includes HDL2 and then the uh, software services too. Um, that is our staffing summary. It's been pretty static. We did fund an additional FTE in the Treasurer Tax Collectors, uh, Tax Collection and Treasury Division um, out of existing revenues this year. So we didn't ask for, it's not an expansion, we just did it internally. Again, that's our operating budget. And so let's go to the anticipated accomplishments. As you know, I was here a couple weeks ago with the COP um, and the CEO's office and our office and uh, county council and the auditor's office met with S&P and we're still waiting on our rating for that and we're getting an issuer rating, now, an issuer rating also. Um, I gotta say um, it was we had a dream team. I mean, having Jeff there and Mona and Paul from the CEO's office, I, they hit it out of the park with their part. It really was a well-orchestrated presentation. And um, I think they were impressed with, I think Mona said it in her opening statement, we have policies and we actually follow them, which is about, is, is not the norm. And so um, I'm still optimistically hoping for something quickly, but we were hoping to have something that we could share today, but we don't, so. Um, the secured tax collections, it, it's, it's pretty amazing how that tracks every year, even during the pandemic. Um, we usually have about 99% of the secured roll collected by June 30th, and so 1% will go into the redemption, and we have to work that um, out in the field and you know, on the phone. And then the TOT, we sent out about 300 letters to people we were suspecting were doing vacation rentals. And we invested some money in a company that um, would do some data mining for us. And we have had about 200 people sign up, additional people sign up for TOT certificates that were previously not signed up. We've got another 100 that we're gonna be following up on. And so, um, that's why we have that number on there. We think it's going to result in some additional revenue. Emerging issues. Oh, sorry. I've got two slides on each side. Okay. Department of Gold. 
that first goal is predicated on obviously getting an expansion. That's directly related to SB 43 for the Public Guardian's Office. It's three um, case managers and then an administrative person too. I don't expect it to be filled. I, I mean, I understand it's not until January of 26, but I want to keep you guys informed that there's going to be a need. And so we put it on there. It is a goal and it's an emerging issue at, at the same time. The development of a new property tax payment website on the internet. So in my office, we have people that can do multiple things. Dan Chandler, who I mentioned is our chief investment officer, he wrote that program 20 years ago. And so we are going to be updating that so that uh, people will have probably a more modern experience paying their taxes on the internet. Um, Dan will be consulting with it on that, but we have um, in-house IT staff that would actually be writing the, uh, the update. It's similar to what we did with our cashier system um, two years ago. Rebecca Falfall, who sits behind me, she does our cannabis uh, taxation collections. She was one of the integral people that actually put that new system in place. And so we do all these things in-house with people that can do multiple functions. The next one, we've had that on there a couple of years now. We just haven't been able to get to this, but we're hoping to do it, to look at implementing an online and you know, TOT system that people can pay online. And then the cannabis audits, they are progressing. Um, we had an update from HDL that they are, um, they are moving forward and they are matching and being able to um, tie things out. So that is uh, progressing about the speed I would expect it would have when it comes to a financial audit. The emerging issues, we talked about SB 43, that's gonna be an issue for not just us, but you know, other departments and the county in general, right? The problem for our office is office space. And so we hit our max some years ago as far as our space. And it, it, part of it was caused by cannabis, right? We lost, our conference room was converted into a private office and then um, multiple you know, cubicles for cannabis. Um, our veterans, that is, uh, you've been really good about funding veteran services. You've given me additional positions, but all those positions I've had to put in the North County because we don't have space in the South County. So currently 80% of my staff that work in the veterans um, work out of Lompoc and Santa Maria. And so with the implementation of SB 43, we won't be able to hire those people unless we have places to put them. And so Mona and I had some early in fall too, um, some preliminary discussions. I don't like just creating a problem and throwing it at Mona's feet without some kind of solution potentially. And so we are talking about you know what we could do, but um, it's more on there because it's really tied to SB 43 also. So just so everyone's aware. But one last thing on that, to, just to kind of drive home how critical it is. My office is now being used for other purposes, my personal office. I won't be in there 100% of the time um, because we need it for um, meetings with people. So that's kind of, that's the critical nature of where we're at in our office now. But it's kind of torn up from the floods anyway, so it's, I'm, not, I'm not missing a whole lot. <laughs> Performance measures, um, I would just, point out that the, uh, the taxes are where they should be, and um, we're proud of being able to do that because cash flow is money. No service reductions, but that's because um, the cost for ITD and for insurance went up that amount, 82.5, and so that was covered by the general fund. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be able to fill that other position that, that we funded internally um, that we needed that, that we had done fund a couple years ago. Uh, expansion requests, we talked about that. Um, it takes about a year to recruit and train people um, for that, but you know, if we have to compress things, then we will. That's just the way it is. You know, we'll do whatever we have to do. In summary, um, the office space we've talked about, SB 43, High collection rates for property taxes. And I put TOT last because I 
want to end on a good, you know, good story for you. Not, it's not just me up here, you know, complaining. I don't want that to be the, the final item. So the TOT questions, that's a good story for you. And you, and you invested in an additional person in our office. We haven't been able to fill it because we haven't found anyone yet, but we've had some interviews late recently, and we're feeling um, we should be able to fill it soon, I think. We're, we feel confident that we're going to find someone. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, it's 10 minutes, but if you ask questions, the deal's <laughs> off. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to ask questions. Supervisor Cap. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Uh, if, if you could just kind of break down the connection between the Public Guardian's office and the, the care court, um, because again, it, you're, you have an expansion request. I just want to understand more what the implications are if you're able to do that. Okay, so for the LPS, uh -huh. um, we do the investigations, we do the conservatorship of the LPS clients, and so that's where we come into play, is that we have roughly three LPS case managers right now, and um, so we're expecting that caseload would double, and with more people qualifying for LPS conservatorship. So they're tracking what that you said the case the caseload would double. You That's believe? what we expect. Well, we're hoping it only doubles. To be honest yeah. with you, supervisor caps. And how do you track those? I mean, what is the current caseload roughly? Just ballpark. I'm going to say, and I'll look back to Arlene. 150. 161. And you expect that 300 ish. Okay. Um, and if you could just, I was interested in the, in the good news about the uh, short-term rentals and the fact that you sent out this letter, you said to 350 people? About 300 letters went out. Yeah. And 200? Said, yep, but we didn't know. Well, that's Various pretty, reasons, but that's, that's uh, promising. That is promising, yeah. That's, Maybe. we think it's a good story, and, and um, that's Leanne's group that does that. Mm -hmm. She's done a fantastic job, um, Ryan and Victoria, who work for her. They've worked that into their, their existing schedule and, bud and budgeted work. And so they built that out of nothing. And similar to way, the way people can pay back taxes, would this be applicable that, that, that someone who comes forward and has been doing a short-term rental without uh, non-legally, they can go retroactively too? We can go back three years. Okay. Yeah, in the ordinance. Yep. Let's hope they do. Thank you. All right. Supervisor Hartman. Um, well, one of the most surprising things I learned about your office is the role that you play in social services, both with the guardian and, and then veterans caseworkers. Uh, and uh, I, I'm glad that you touched on uh, the, the increased role that your guardians uh, that conserve people. It seems like the state is looking to conservatorship for more problems to try to get people who otherwise wouldn't get care. So. Uh, that's a really important function. And, and for veteran services, I think it's really important that people know that we have this, this new act from the federal government that allows more veterans to, uh, <clears throat> to qualify for services when they were exposed to toxic chemicals. So I think that has increased the workload tremendously, and uh, your staff deserve enormous credit for understanding all of this and getting our, our veterans the the support and services that they deserve. Mr. So, Harbin, you know what I, I would say, um, I appreciate the compliment, but really it should be directed at Rhonda. She is a superstar. I brag on her everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she's Everyone a star. Does. We got to keep her uh, for as long as she's willing to work for us. Um, the, I just wanted to give you another heads up. We're likely soon the board will be getting an ag enterprise ordinance, and in that uh, we'll have not only home stays like we have now, but farm stays on ag two properties. And so that's a TOT source of revenue. Uh, another issue the board will have to decide on is whether we will allow small scale campgrounds on large agricultural properties. That's another source of TOT. So um, is there, you're doing tremendously uh, better than we've been before uh, collecting that. Do, are we doing enough? And will you be ready for these new programs? Um, Supervisor Hartman, through the chair, I, I'm not aware of those programs, so I can't really speak with a lot of certainty. But I, I assure you, we will do everything we can. And um, if there's some reason I think I need more staffing, I would come back to you. But I, I always like to kind of let's start with what I have and let's see what I can do. Um, 
And I, like I said, we've got tremendous people that work for you know the department and spe specifically in that area. So um, I would say yes, we will be able to do it. But so so just so I understand, we we have a consulting firm that that is looking for advertisements. Walk yeah. me through it, just because I want to understand it, because people are always asking me. Yeah. So um, they are a consultant that um, they do look at advertisements. Um, they're looking at different postings and trying to zero in. As you know, a lot of Airbnb and VRBO, you don't really get the exact um, location, but they've got a way of looking at things and, and giving us addresses. And they gave us, like I said, 300. And um, I don't want to do a commercial for that firm, but it's, um, it's, it's really interesting and they're fun to work with. Yeah, well, that uh, that's terrific because I think, I mean, you've shown that's a revenue stream that uh, I think there's probably still more out there. Well, uh, and, and if you think about it, the biggest TOT provider before the pandemic hasn't been even operating since, months. right? Yeah. Right. So a lot of these surrounding ones and things that have, have really kind of picked up some of that, that, that you know, Slack. vacancy, right? <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's good things to come, I think, in that area as far as discretionary revenue. Good, good. Well, I'm, I'm just glad you're on it. Okay, I have one comment and a question. The comments about Rhonda and the veteran service officers. Um, for those that out in the community that don't really understand it too much, too, there's a, there's a letter that actually comes to us every year from the state that talks about the tens of millions of dollars that come back into the community that these veterans mm -hmm. earned yeah. that don't really know how to access it. And so that's what our veteran service officers do. So do tremendous work. Um, question I wanted to ask is about, there was a question yesterday we had, um, we had uh, a presenter asking us to tap into the strategic reserve. And I just wanted you to talk about how important that was when you went to talk to the rating agency and how important that is for us to make sure that we have a fully funded strategic reserve. Yeah, Supervisor Levin, you know, um, you're absolutely correct. You know, SMP does look at how well we're managed and do we follow best practices and the GFOA has best practices on strategic reserves and things of that nature and um, I would expect that it would not be looked upon favorably if you tapped into your strategic reserve. I just, okay. it, it's, a, it's a calculation they're gonna do. And um, again, Mona's done a great job, you know, getting that thing stocked up and keeping people's hands out of it. Yep. Yeah, it's always, it's always confusing when you look at it and you're like, okay, well, what are we using it for? But it does, it, 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 I think it's also a symbol of, to an outside agency that we're serious about how we handle our, our money and how we do our business. Well, and I think it's not, it's supposed to be used for those tremendous, you know, 100 year issues that come up, not for. Which for some reason in Santa Barbara County happen every 10 years, right? <laughs> or every two years. Yeah. yeah. I think we've had a 100 year flood like three times. Uh, Supervisor Hartman. Uh, Chair Lavanino, I'm so glad you asked that question, uh, and I just wanted to drive the point home. Uh, when we have a higher credit rating, then we get lower interest rates, right? So it, it saves us money, uh, and so it might be yep. foolish to undercut that. Right. It's absolutely correlated that way, yes. Okay. Well, you still kept it short, and probably in your, in your time frame there, so we appreciate it, and we hope we can work on your uh, office space soon. So. Great. Thanks for being here. All right, our final one before lunch will be uh, Clerk Recorder Assessor, Joe Holland, I believe is on Zoom, and we have Melinda Green, our Chief Deputy Clerk Recorder in the house. And then, uh, so this is Joe Holland, can you hear me? We sure can, loud and clear. Yeah. Um, my apologies for not being there and, and coming in on Zoom. I had back surgery, and it's just a little too difficult for me right now to walk through the county administration building. But um, anyhow, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Lavagnino, members of the board. Um, 
As you mentioned, we have Melinda Green, Chief Deputy Clerk Recorder, Vanessa Graff is our um, finance manager, and then we have Martin Kobos from uh, elections as a manager. So our, our key services are, um, as you know, elections, clerk recorder, and assessor. And they're really like three separate departments within our department. Next slide, please. So you can see there our operating budget is 21.5 million. Our general fund contribution is 12 and a half million. And the difference is really just fees for services. We charge uh, local jurisdictions for property tax administration and for elections we conduct for them. And then clerk recorder is entirely uh, self-funded and doesn't use any general fund contribution. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just $100,000 that we have every year that if we have any serious appeals, assessment appeals, we can hire outside counsel. We haven't had to use this in a number of years. Next slide. And then you can see here, we're at a, a, about 107 employees, which is down from 109. Um, and those have pretty much come out of clerk recorder, uh, again, which is separately funded with no general fund contribution. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see here that uh, we're requesting 21.5. That's down from 21.7 million in previous years. And you can see the reasons why there. Um, so we're good. Next slide. Uh, anticipated accomplishments. Well, uh, as you know, we just did the March 5th. 2024 presidential primary election, we had a 42% turnout, which is not very high, but it's high compared to the state. So um, folks in Cal I mean, in Santa Barbara County, they uh, continue to, to vote. Um, the, the next uh, accomplishment is we are working on uh, digitizing all of our assessor real property files, and uh, that's going to free up some space in our office, and um, that'll also allow us to um, do maybe more mass appraisal going forward. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is our main objective. Um, the current facility that we have for elections is really inadequate. That this building that we're in now, we share it with the Veterans Administration. If two thirds of this building uh, was was vacant for years, and General Services was looking for someone that could um, fill it, so we agreed to fill it for elections, and um, it's really not ideal. And then if you look at the master plan for Kai Real area out here, um, it's hard to fit elections in. We really could use more space. It's crowded, it's uh, inefficient, and KPMG even recommended that we look into getting uh, a replacement space. So we're gonna be working with real property division and, and general services and just seeing if we can identify some place to go. I mean, I think this building that we're in is pretty much at the end of its life. Um, so that's going to be a real challenge. And then, of course, we're like I said, we're going to digitize the um, the assessor files. And then uh, we are looking to perform a STIFA a fee study uh, so that we can collect more fees uh, uh, really across the department and, and for elections. Emerging issues. Well, <clears throat> We got a big election coming up. November 5th uh, general election is probably going to be about as challenging an election as we've ever experienced. Uh, I said we had 42 uh, percent turnout in March 5th. We're probably going to get 80 to 85 percent, if not higher, for um, for this November election. <clears throat> and you know that's 85 percent of 238,000 registered voters. That 238,000 is up from typically five to 10 years ago, we would have had about 195,000 registered voters. So um, 
we're, we're looking forward to that. I think we're going to be able to handle it. And um, that's our, our main challenge. And then in the recorder, uh, it's interesting. And if you have questions on it, Melinda could um, answer them. But we are seeing a trend in elder abuse and record, recording fraud. And so people don't think as a, of the recorder as a front line in defense to this stuff. But we really are, and we work with the district attorney and the sheriff uh, when we need to. Next slide. So I'm not going to touch on all these performance measures, but um, you can see that digitizing of the assessor files at the bottom there is really kind of a high priority of ours. And we're, we have 132,000 files, and so we're at 20% now, and we're just going to continue with that effort. Next slide. And then similar to what Harry was saying, uh, we had increases in IT expenses and insurance, and the CEO came in and covered that increase. And we really appreciate that because that would really hurt to have to um, suck that up. So, um, and basically I touched on all this stuff in the summary. So I think that's, all I've got, if you have, it, we can go to the, to our quote, uh, we do not have government by the majority, we have government by the majority who participate. And uh, like I said, that's going to be 85% of the registered voters in November. And so, um, yeah, Thomas Jefferson. And, and him that's we it. have heard of, him we know. All right. So... <laughs> Okay, any questions for Mr. Holland or Ms. Green, Supervisor Hartman? Uh, yes, I did have one question, Mr. Holland, and that was about Prop 19. If we have any, I, I guess that went into effect in 2020, if we have any sense on the impact on our property tax revenues, total impact from those transfers. Uh, Supervisor Hartman through the chair. At this time, we're working on that. We're supposed to provide a report to the state. Um, you know, what's the impact of that? And we don't have that report done yet, um, but we are working on it. So I don't have numbers for you, but um, we can send that report to you when we do send it to the state. When, so, when is it due? You know, I, I forget when it's due. I don't think it's quite due yet. Um, well, one of the problems with Prop 19 is you have to count on other counties to process the Prop 19 application for the house that they sold because they wanted to move to Santa Barbara. And so it's there's a lot of things that are kind of out of our control with Prop 19. It's very messy. Yeah. And I think uh, county assessors throughout the state are, are having challenges with that. And so but we don't know the financial impact of the reduced... Um, Assess, assessments that have been transferred into Santa Barbara County, but we are working on that and we have a really good staff that uh, should be able to get that out. One final question and I'm going to put you on the spot. We're, we're getting a lot of comments here in public comment uh, about the um, reliability of our elections process uh, mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd like you to tell us what we should tell them. Well, um, most of those folks that speak in general public comment, they've been out here. They've witnessed what we do. We have folks come and observe our elections. We have the grand jury come through and observe what we do. Um, we are very secure. I'm not going to go into all the security precautions we take, but we work with the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, um, the Sheriff's Office. Uh, we have multiple layers of security and um, you know oftentimes they ask for contracts of our vendor systems well that's all public information they're more than welcome to it um, and then individually for for your board if you guys ever want to if any one of you wants to come out and take a tour I would um, encourage you to come out in the 30 days before the election and you should see what we do it's pretty darn impressive I, I might add that the district that I represent has had a number of court cases and uh, your office has one that even was denied cert at the Supreme Court 
uh, and your office always withstood uh, intense uh, scrutiny, so thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, Chair, thank you, Chair Labadino. It's not a question for um, Mr. Holland as much as it's a comment. I think these last three departments, uh, the auditor's office and um, tax, uh, tax collector and, and clerk assessor recorders, they're looking for new space. These are all departments that don't necessarily need to be in Santa Barbara as we're trying to deal with and look at, you know, um, you know, job housing and balance. You know, some of this stuff is under our control. We have 4,600 employees. You know, we can put some of these employees up north. So I really think as we, as a county, uh, look at investments in other places, um, we may want to look north for headquartering some of these, um, these departments that um, may not necessarily physically need to be in Santa Barbara to be successful. Supervisor Caps. Yes, thanks, Chair Levin. You know, uh, Mr. Holland, I, I just wanted to say thank you to you and your team. My staff and I took a tour, as you suggested, uh, a week or so before the election. It was in incredibly impressive to see the level of precautions that you all take. Um, so thank you for that. It was uh, very informative. But I wanted to ask you um, about how you, you're talking about how uh, dramatically uh, more robust this coming election will be and what that means uh, for the mail-in ballots. How are you preparing for that? I think I heard the statistic that about 91% or roughly um, of folks now vote not on the day in, in the booth, but actually mail-in. So correct me on that number, please, and just talk about how you're preparing for that and specifically how you communicate what that means to uh, understanding the results of the election. Yeah, so... Um... We're 100% vote by mail in California now. Right. So everybody gets a ballot. Now, in Santa Barbara County, we have 75 polling places open on election day. So we do provide the opportunity for anybody that wants to come in and request a live ballot. They can vote it there. Um, it's It works out really good. And the, the thing I like about that is that we have 75 locations where if you have a disability, you can go in there and vote privately and unassisted. Um, we are getting very low turnout at these polling places. So it's it's actually around, I don't, it's like 3%. So, um, you know, it, it's expensive, but it's important that we have these polling places on election day. So. You know, I always uh, like to encourage voters, when you get your vote by mail ballot, turn it in, vote it. Uh, the last election, I got my vote by mail ballot. I mailed it in that day. It was a pretty simple ballot. Um, so uh, I, I think, well, I, I know voting by mail, having 100% vote by mail, that increases overall turnout. You're more likely to vote if you have a ballot in your hand than if you don't. Um, but we do provide that alternative to go to a polling place on election day. Thank you. But that also means that, that, that results aren't known immediately. So how's that shifted sort of your staffing and um, specifically, again, it's a question I've asked to other departments as well, but the communication to the public, who's on point for that to make sure folks understand sort of the timing of when these, uh, when these, this information will be known. So, you, you know, actually, it's the, on election night at 8 o'clock, there'll be a huge amount of ballots that the results will go up. Those are all the ballots that have come in prior to election day. We have all those counted. And then um, you might have noticed that in March, we certified the election like 10 days after the election day. And that was a record for Santa Barbara County. Uh, in the past, it's taken up to 30 days. But the new election equipment we have, it's very high speed. And so whatever arrives on election day in terms of ballots dropped off at drop boxes and polling places, uh, those will be accounted the days after the election. Um, and then we're allowed to accept ballots that are postmarked on election day, and we get a significant amount from the post office on the Wednesday and the Thursday after the election. So we have to wait for those, but um, our new vote tabulation system 
it's very efficient. And so we're looking at ways to prepare for November. And at eight o'clock on election night, like I said, you're going to see a significant amount of ballots already processed. And those results will go up. And then whatever we receive in the days after um, that, you know, people just need to be a little bit patient. Thank you. And if your name's on the ballot, it is extremely hard to be patient. So you're sitting there hitting <laughs> refresh about a thousand times. Mr. Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair Lavanino. So, you know, I, I didn't think this discussion was gonna get much into this. Um, with the election integrity, and I, I do think that there's probably some value for us to have actually a, a standalone item on this in the future. I know that there's a lot of pressure that's being built up about this. Even if we may disagree with some people's opinions on it, I think it would, it would be good to daylight it have Mr. Holland, um, if he's willing, present this so that we can have this conversation in a more in a more appropriate um, setting, not just up here during a budget workshop, because I think there's a lot to be asked. Um, and I think the, the more transparency in this process, the better for gaining people's confidence. Um, you know, I do think one piece that uh, we, we heard in the days after election were um, the frequency on updating the results. I know that that was something that um, was kind of slow coming. And I think that there's um, a fear out there when um, there's you know there's something happening behind the scenes that there might be something um, nefarious. And I don't you know I'm not um, suggesting that in any way, but I do think that there's might be some things that we can put in place or help suggest to help you um, so that we can um, make it a more transparent process and gain um, the confidence of, of mostly electric. Yeah, I think. Yeah, well, oh, I'm supervising Nelson through the chair. Uh, just remember what I said. We processed the ballots in nine days after the election. We certified, I think, on the Thursday of the following week, and we updated with about 97% of the ballots voted on the, on Tuesday, a week after the election. So I think we're, we're making record time in getting those um, results out and the... Uh, you don't want to just incrementally re release results um, on, like on a daily basis. I'd rather wait until we get 95% of them in. Uh, otherwise, you just kind of heighten people's anxiety. So uh, we'll see what, what happens in November, but I'm uh, expecting that we're going to be able to um, get the results out uh, pretty darn quick. Uh, in, 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 in years past, we had to wait the whole 29 days to certify the election. To, to get it certified within 10 days, that's incredible. I, and I don't disagree. I think that's really impressive. I, I think that um, regular interval uh, updates are something that the public would, would likely and candidates would, would want to see. I, I was involved in the San Francisco County close election about six years ago, and I think we actually got updates from um, um, Tommy Gong twice a day as ballots came in. And, and I, do, I do think that that was actually a positive thing. Um, obviously that's up to you as an independent elected official and how you're gonna run that department. But I do think that there's maybe a desire out there in the public to get um, more frequent updates, especially when we have these close elections. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think we got, we, we probably, I could go another 20 minutes on, on elections, but we'll, we'll We'll let this go. Uh, and we do think you're doing an outstanding job. I think 99% of this is just education on people that, I mean, we all live, breathe uh, elections. Not everybody does. It's very complicated. And um, I know you're doing an outstanding job. I have 100% faith in the outcome of our elections. Um, but I think for some people that are kind of new to it or don't really completely understand the mechanics of it, it can be very confusing and it can leave people questioning some things. So I just think better education is, is where we need to go. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Holland. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And we hope you feel better. Good luck. Thanks. Okay, we are going to take a 35 minute break for lunch and we will be back with our human resources department.
Okay, I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the budget workshops. And we are moving through the General Government and Support Services Functional Group. And we are ready for human resources. Thank you. Christy, is that you on Zoom? That is me on Zoom. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Lavanino, members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Christy Schmidt, the Director of Human Resources. And I'm pleased to present my first budget to you as the Director of Human Resources. I'm sorry not to be there in person today, but I will be ably assisted by our top HR staff who are present today in the chambers. Uh, Yvonne Torres, our Assistant Director. Uh, Aaron Jeffrey, who is our Fiscal and Workforce Planning Division Chief. Carlos Silva, who is our Employee Relations Division Chief. Natalie Alvarado, our Employment Division Chief, Katie Torres, Benefits and Wellness Division Chief, as well as Oren Rowe, our Acting Supervisor in Organizational Training and Development, and our Acting Budget Manager, Luis Hernandez, who helped us put this budget together. These managers and their staff are committed to implementing our mission, which is to, to promote a county culture where our employees can do their best work so that our community can live its best life. And now I will ask my valued partner, Assistant Director Torres, to come up to the podium to present our budget. I'll uh, remain available for any questions at the end, and I'll specifically address two questions that I've already heard come up, one being about the veterinarian and the other uh, about remote work and managing remote workers. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Torres. Thank you, Christy. So I want to move on. Yes, okay. So good afternoon, Chair Lavanino, members of the board. I'm here to as the star director in presenting our budget. So our key services, the human resource department focuses on the following key service areas, administration and operations, employee relations, which includes labor, employee benefits and wellness, organizational and talent development, including employee training, employment and workforce planning, and we also administer a self-funded dental plan. Our budget summary, our operating budget is almost 11.3 million. We are supported by just under 7.8 million from the general fund and receive about 775,000 in program transfer. Uh, the department has 40 full-time employees. The approximate 775,000 in program transfers is primarily attributable to temporary additional staffing for the Workday ERP project. However, it also includes 60,000 for a leadership training program to develop the county's future leaders. Our budget includes an additional three three positions versus this time last year. However, we are not requesting additional staff at this time. We had four positions approved in August 2023, three temporary ERP position and one permanent leave of absent administrator. We are proposing the reduction of one temporary recruiting staff position for the coming budget, which results in the net increase of three positions. The increase in our overall operating budget of just over 713,000 is attributable to the addition ERP staffing and leave of absent administrator position that were approved last year, an adjustment to our salary savings estimate, which was a little high, and a correction of our overall salary model, which had undervalued certain flexibility, um, flexible staff positions. Other increases for increase to HR software charges. We also have an increase in employees enrolling in and using the self-funded dental plan, which increases both our revenues and our expenditures in that area. Anticipated accomplishments. Some of our accomplish accomplishments anticipated this year are, uh, we are scheduled to implement the multi-year management classification and compensation project, which is scheduled to come to you on April 23rd. We conducted 35 executive recruitments, uh, created an interview guidance for candidates and interviewers, conducted an employee engagement survey, held DEI speaker series, 
uh, made website improvements, hired a leave of absence administrator, and attended 15 job fairs. Our department goals and objectives. Our biggest goal for next year will be to implement phase two of the ERP project, which will focus on the HR and payroll functions on the new software. We also plan to keep building on the good work we've already done in response to our KPMG evaluation and the Renew Initiative to set a path for the next couple of years through a strategic plan. We'll be bringing phase two of our recommended updates to the civil service rules to you, and we will be redesigning our leadership training model, model and launching a mental health symposium. The key challenges will face include the workday ERP implementation, supporting the new and changing operations like fire dispatch and increased social services staffing, negotiating multiple labor contracts and remaining competitive in our ability to attract and retain top talent with limited resources, as well as maintaining and enhancing HR expertise throughout the organization. We've been consistently hitting our performance measures and plan to maintain that effort. We continue to make progress on our KPMG priority recommendations. Next year, we'll be working on phase two of our civil service rules toward the goal of defining delivery ownership of HR services and governance of HR policies and procedures. We've completed our transition to better support our departments as a business partner, and those changes are working well. We also continue to implement an organizational and talent, talent development and employee relations data management strategies. As we mentioned earlier, we'll be revisiting these goals as we develop our upcoming multi-year strategic plan. With our increasing costs related to salary model changes and increased costs of business would have left us in a deficit situation. The addition of the, addi the, addition of the additional 212,000 GFC budget recommended by the CEO will keep us balanced for next year. In summary, Workday ERP implementation will remain a top priority and workload issue for human resources. We are not requesting a major any major expansions or proposing service level reductions next year. And our focus in the next year will also be on maintaining excellence in core HR functions throughout the county. Uh, I'll leave you a quote from Mary Meyer, the CEO of Shake Shack, who said, the only way a company can grow, stay true to its soul, and remain consistently successful is to attract, hire, and keep great people. Thank you, and we are all here available if you have any questions. All right, questions for HR. <clears throat> Supervisor Hurton. Well, I, I just wanted to highlight one thing. Um, I, I've worked for different government agencies in much of my career, and um, looking at individual employee career development was never a high priority. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of the Santa Barbara County HR Department for, for making that a priority. I have the opportunity to speak to the halftime highlights, uh, people who've been here about six months or a little longer, and get their impressions of the county. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's just really positive. People feel like there's a career path for them and uh, that, that they're being invested in. And I think that's um, a really key thing to retain high quality people. So kudos to your department. Thank you. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair Lavanino. I just wanna give uh, Director Schmidt an opportunity to answer some of those questions that we had earlier about um, veterinarian or, and more importantly, I guess my broad question about that was, um, in these really specialty positions or these hard to find positions, how are we able to, you know, what can, else can we do to eliminate some of the bureaucracy that, you know, that impedes us from making good uh, fiscal decisions on, on hiring? And then I guess the other question was about, um, you know, uh, some of the strategies on remote and telework that we're um, looking at countywide. Okay, I am available if, uh... Can, can, oh, there I am. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, I will address some of those questions. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the veterinarian position. We did some research into that in anticipation of answering your questions that had come up. And um, staff did do a study last year on veterinarians looking at our regular competitive labor market and determined that we were within the competitive labor market average or median for um, that position. Um, staff and SEIU tend to focus their attentions and their discussions on those positions that are not at uh, the labor market median. And so uh, I think that's where this one sort of was put aside, but it's a really good example of where our cost of housing can sometimes mean that simply paying a competitive wa uh, wage in our labor market uh, is not enough to attract good people. Um, and we need to be flexible with that. Um, also, especially where we are resorting to contracts to fill a need, uh, it may make more financial sense for us to pay more than market to a position in order to fill that need with an employee. Um, we do have ways to respond to this kind of thing and be uh, more flexible. We can offer a hiring incentive. Our policy allows up to $20,000, and we do plan to offer that with our next posting. Um, we're also expediting review of the veterinarian salary, uh, kind of expanding our um, comparative uh, agencies a little bit to, to see what's really uh, likely to draw the right candidates to the position. And we'll be discussing it with our partners at SEIU and hopefully coming to a, an agreement quickly. And I, and I do agree, we need to have a way to be able to respond. Um, and I do think that um, just with the negotiate, with the bargaining environment, um, it, sometimes we do get bogged down in that, um, the processes. And uh, I think we can explore with SEIU ways that we can, we can break through that a little bit. If I can add a little bit more to the discussion for a moment, I, you know, it seems that like veterinarians or other specialty, especially along the medical side, um, many of them often have a lot of debt. I know there's a lot of per, uh, public service loans that are being repaid, I mean, a lot of nodding heads from county employees right now. Um, a lot of uh, loans out there that are uh, repayment through federal programs, but maybe we might um, have our own local program, might be something we wanna consider to incentivize some of these uh, positions. So just wanna throw that out there as, as an idea um, moving forward. Supervisor Caps. Yeah, I just thought of a question. Thank you. Um, we we hear so often, uh, understandably, about staff vacancies and departmental vacancies. What what would a director do? What what are the resources that your department offers? I know that's a big question, but uh, and and our department of directors taking advantage of that. You don't have to get into specific people, but just want to make sure we're we're doing all we can to take care of that vacancy issue. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, Christy will probably say something, but I wanted to first um, hand it over to Natalie Alvarado, our uh, recruiting manager, to um, discuss what she's been doing with her staff. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Uh, Supervisor Caps through the chair. So there's a few different things that we do whenever we're looking to open a position. We will typically host like a kickoff meeting with whoever the hiring manager is and discuss a few of the recruiting strategies that we have, depending on if it's a difficult to fill position, and that's us looking at the history of the position, how the last recruitment ran, what were the application rates, how many qualified candidates, we might suggest to the hiring manager to consider having a new hire incentive on the front end. And that new hiring incentive, I think Yvonne Torres spoke about it a little bit, um, can look like a sign-on bonus, that can look like accelerated vacation accruals. So that's one strategy. We'll also talk about marketing and advertising. Are we willing to put more money towards advertising? who's the candidate pool, are there internal candidates? So all of that goes into the discussion when we're hosting a kickoff, and that kind of guides the recruitment process. I think when we look at really difficult to fill positions, it can be challenging. Some of that's creativity around, especially if we're looking at some of our management positions, what are we looking for in terms of the best quality candidate? Is this something that we can invest in training the candidate to, to get them to the place that we need them to be? I think we're also at times looking for unicorn candidates and, and that's part of the conversation as well is it might be really hard to find a unicorn candidate. Can we invest the time to actually develop this employee and get them to the place where they need to be? So all of those are some of the considerations that go into when we're recruiting. Hey, Supervisor Williams. I wanted to just appreciate HR's willingness to help solve this problem. Uh, you know, it's. It just, you know, I, I understand 
the calculation and, and sometimes these calculations uh, don't take into account, say, hyper-local conditions, right? right? That we are, uh, you know, there's seven veterinarians just a block away, seven veterinary physicians just a block away, and uh, that's probably a more meaningful comparison of what we're competing with than, than jurisdictions, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the region. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the, um, uh, and of course, you know, some of this, uh, I, I also think we should be thinking ahead of time, as you indicated, uh, instead of hoping that we're just going to get another rock star retiree from another jurisdiction to like come in and 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 fill a position that we can't normally fill, uh, that that maybe we need to be thinking about these ahead of time and go, eh, you know, there's some vet techs there, maybe we put them through school, right? Maybe we do some things, get them get be be thinking about it ahead of time and and see some other ways that we can. Uh, fill these positions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yvonne okay. and Christy, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you to the HR team. Next up is the Director of Information Technology, Chris Chergwin. Okay, well good afternoon Chair Lavanino and members of the board. I'm here to present the IT department's budget request for fiscal years 2024 and 25. Before I begin, I'd like to thank my two assistant department heads, Andre Monastori, Kyle Slattery. I'd like to thank Mark Garcia, our Workday Support Org leader. And I'd like to thank Onelia Rodriguez, our finance manager for IT. It was Onelia and her finance team that did a wonderful job putting all of this together, including this amazing colorful binder that I'm using. So thank you, <laughs> Onelia. Appreciate that. We have an experienced and committed and talented team in ITD, and I'm grateful to work alongside each member of our team. As you're aware, ITD became a standalone department in July of 23. In less than a year's time, ITD has made significant strides in improving service delivery, bolstering cybersecurity, improving relationships with departments, educating and training staff, and ultimately leveraging technology more effectively to serve our constituents. Over the past year, my focus as CIO has been in three primary areas. One, restructuring ITD to be more strategic, proactive, and focused on fostering stronger partnerships and relationships with all county departments. Two, working to modernize and secure the county's technology systems and processes. Three, improving governance and standing up several new working groups to foster innovation and learning. ITD's key services are the public safety radio network, which includes the upgrade project currently underway that will benefit our entire county through improved radio coverage for our emergency responders. Maintaining a reliable network and voice system, including the county's data centers continuing to support and improve our communication and collaboration tools such as Microsoft 365, Teams, et cetera, minimizing risk to the county's data, operations, and reputation through cybersecurity services, improving data usage, integration of applications, modernizing websites, and improving our reporting, unifying our GIS systems and data to, meet, to more efficiently meet our constituent needs, managing dozens of technology projects, including Workday, and lastly, providing timely technical support to departments. ITD's operating budget for this upcoming year is projected to be 32.4 million. Our capital budget is 41.6 million, which is almost entirely comprised of the, the public safety radio network project. Our general fund contribution is 646,000. The bulk of the capital budget, as I just mentioned, is the public safety radio network, which is 35 million combined out of that uh, 41. 
for general county programs, Department 990 transfers. Uh, with What we did there was when Kyle Slattery moved over from Auditor Controller into ITD, there was that transfer from Department 990, and that occurred a few months ago. On the staffing summary, as you can see from the staffing summary slide, we are projecting 71 FTEs in this upcoming year. This growth is largely due to adding the workday support team into ITD as was approved by the board earlier this year. The five requested positions would complete the original recommended plan for ITD to be a standalone department. These positions would allow ITD to work more closely with departments, address the growing needs around data sharing and data reporting, and bolster the county's GIS capabilities. Operating budget. We are projecting our operating revenue to be 32.4 million in fiscal year 24-25 with 646,000 in GFC. The increases are primarily due, as mentioned earlier, to the addition of the workday support team, additions of the key aforementioned positions within ITD, and a significant increase in the cost of software renewals and hardware from our vendors. For the anticipated accomplishment slide, in our first year as a standalone department, ITD has successfully completed dozens of initiatives. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our entire ITD staff established goals at the beginning of this fiscal year. To date, our team has accomplished over 300 goals that improve how we deliver IT services to the county. Some of the highlights include launching the new business relationship program to better understand the needs of each department to improve collaboration and communication, and to provide strategic technical guidance. We are in the process of establishing a dedicated cybersecurity team to help reduce risk to the county. We are also bolstering countywide cybersecurity protection through the recent completion of the firewall modernization project, upgrading device protection on all devices, and most recently by our current project to upgrade ITD's data backup solution this new solution will give us data backups in both the cloud and on-premise, as well as provide anti-ransomware protection. We are on track to complete the countywide IT strategic plan by the end of June. ITD launched the technical support division of the new Workday Support Organization, which will provide technical assistance, development services, and training to county staff. We have made significant improvements in governance this year, including improving the visibility and workflow of technology projects and procurement. The county's GIS capabilities have been enhanced through the implementation of Esri Enterprise. Lastly, ITD is leading the formation and facilitation of several new technology working groups, such as GIS, broadband, and AI. ITD's goals and objectives for fiscal year 24-25 are to begin implementation of the new countywide IT strategic plan, to establish a countywide data governance committee to promote data standards, data classification, data sharing, and improved reporting, establish AI governance and AI training for county staff to leverage AI tools that enhance productivity and services to constituents, complete the next phase of the new public safety radio network upgrade. Continue providing IT project management services to all departments, including the Workday project. Continue the conversion of departmental internet sites or intranet sites from Civic Plus to Microsoft SharePoint to improve communication and knowledge sharing. Assist county HR with modernizing non-management IT classification and compensation. This will improve retention and recruiting through clear career paths, modern job descriptions, and compensation that is aligned with similar counties. A core network router refresh project to improve the resiliency, performance, and security of the county network. And lastly, to complete phase two of the wireless access point expansion, adding over 100 additional wireless access points to improve network connectivity and performance in many of the facilities across the county. Some of the emerging issues that we're facing, um, you may have heard, but Assembly Bill 1637 is an unfunded mandate that all government in, I believe it's in, in California, um, they have to change their domain names to .gov. And so as you know, we're .org today, so that is a pretty big undertaking that we have to move uh, to .gov. 
It's, it's a good decision, I believe, to do that. It's just gonna take us some time, um, but we do have a, a, a window of time. It's gonna go quickly, so we wanna get going on that uh, soon. Uh, the Public Safety Radio Network Project, it's a very large project. It's, a, it's about a six-year project, as you know. Uh, we are getting close, I would say, to maybe a third to halfway through that project right now. And there's been a few delays uh, in the project. Uh, one of the delays has been just working with the U.S. Forest Service, and I've, I know I brought this to some of your attention, um, just getting them to be responsive with some of the sites that are located uh, in the national forests. Rapid advancements in AI technologies and AI-related risks. It's on our radar. It's something that we're paying very close attention to. There's always the risk of a cyber attack, and so it's something that we can never let our guard, our guard down on that. And then we're just seeing, uh, due to inflation, we're seeing a pretty significant increase, uh, more, than, more than usual, in the price of software licensing, renewals, things like that. So it's just something that we're, again, watching very closely. ITD's performance measures uh, remain, uh, continue to remain strong. On the KPMG recommendations, we have completed nearly all of the KPMG priority recommendations, including becoming a standalone department, integrating ITD's service desk into the new service delivery team, developing a scoring system to determine technology project prioritization, and a revised government governance framework through the EITC committee. <clears throat> We have no service level reductions. And in summary, as you've heard in our presentation today, ITD has achieved many goals and objectives in less than a year as a standalone department. I wanna thank the board and the CEO's office for having the vision to elevate IT in order to foster greater innovation, improve departmental collaboration, and increase countywide operational effectiveness. The ongoing investment into the right technology vision, leadership, and solutions is having a significant and positive return for the county. ITD is setting a new vision and roadmap through the soon to be completed IT strategic plan. We are playing a strategic and active role in projects such as Workday, Enterprise GIS, data sharing, the public safety radio network, and dozens of other multi-departmental initiatives. We have a talented and committed team today, and by implementing a modern, comp and class system, we will become an even more desirable place to work. We will continue to prioritize the county's cybersecurity posture and improve governance, training, and education. We are committed to building strong and trusted relationships with departments to help them better achieve their goals. We are grateful for the board's support and we're committed to driving this county forward through the strategic and effective use of technology. Creating a strong culture that aligns with our core values is something that we are actively working on building within ITD. Our five core values are collaborative relationships, innovation, pursuit of excellence, open-mindedness, and empowerment. I'm proud of our team and the hard work they put in each and every day. My quote to leave you with today is this, treat employees like they make a difference, and they will. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair Lavanino, and thank you, uh, Director uh, Cherwin, for your work. Um, you know, it's a really exciting department, I, especially with the AI. I think that's going to transform uh, the county organization over the next couple of years, um, especially um, maybe we want to talk a little bit about, um, like, uh, what's it, Copilot is the, the Microsoft product that it should be coming and be available on a government level that's already um, available for the public Correct. and the business uh, users, but can you talk a little bit about those uh, programs and what maybe an internal um, AI network might look like for us and what the benefits might look like? Yeah, so we actually formed an AI working group a couple months back and we meet monthly now. Uh, I think at our last meeting we had close to 40 attendees uh, from the county that attended from most of the departments were there. So it was great to see, uh, you know, just everybody's interest in what's happening in AI. And part of the meetings what we're doing is we're bringing in a guest speaker um, to educate us on, on what's happening. So this last, uh, last month in March, we had Microsoft, uh, an expert from Microsoft actually present on, on Copilot and what Microsoft is doing within AI. And so, as you mentioned, uh, their licensing for the government sector won't be available until sometime this summer. We don't have an exact date yet. But when Copilot is available, there's, there's different levels of Copilot. So there's the level of you can just go to like, let's say Microsoft Bing search engine, you'll see the Copilot tab on there, you click on that. 
You can enter in you know, your questions and it'll give you information, right? Uh, and that's kind of the, love, the first level of it. So it's just a, you know, a, a much better search engine, so to speak, than what, you're, what we're used to. Um, but I think what we're more interested in as a county is in what they call their internal engine for co-pilot. So we can implement that technology internally within our network. And so now we can ingest data from whether it's you know, the HR employee manual, whether it's uh, board meetings, whatever the case might be, we can ingest it into the co-pilot engine and now we can use AI to help us find things faster, to give us answers faster, and it's not necessarily accessible to the public, right? And so um, there's different levels, and so we're researching what those, you know, what those levels are, what makes sense for the county, and the working group will do a lot of the research and make recommendations then up to the EITC where the standards and policies committee will review them and okay, make decisions on, on you know, how can we make sure we have safeguards around this technology as well. Okay, a very exciting time. Uh, the other uh, area of interest for me is GIS, and I understand that we have uh, many departments that use GIS. You guys are starting to central, centralize that as well. Can you talk, speak to that? Yeah, so similar, we've formed actually two working groups. We have an external working group where now we're bringing cities and other counties that are part of it. They meet monthly, and then we have an internal uh, GIS working group as well. And um, our GIS, super, GIS supervisor, Jenna Larkin, has done a fantastic job of really launching the, the GIS efforts here, uh, or taking GIS, I should say, to the kind of the next level. So what we're really trying to do is help departments start to uh, share data more effectively. So instead of having GIS data spread all over in different silos, we're starting to do a lot better job of sharing now, um, and then educating uh, our users on how can we be more effective at using GIS technologies. Um, and then through the implementation of Esri Enterprise, now we have access to a lot more tools that we didn't have before. So it's kind of a multi-pronged approach, but making significant strides and leveraging the new technologies that are out there to, to benefit us and our constituents. And my last question is about Acela. We were talking about that with planning um, earlier, and that's yeah. going to hit multiple departments. My understanding is planning says they're taking the lead on that phase two. Um, how are you guys able to help facilitate that? Yeah, so that's just it. We want to come in and help facilitate, whether it's you know getting public works and planning and development and fire and, and others that are using Excel and saying, hey, how can, again, how can we collaborate and start sharing some of the same data where, where it makes sense, um, having some standards and some policies there where we can just be more efficient in how we use tools like Excel so that you know, our, our residents uh, have a better experience when they're going to get permits and things like that. So yeah, we're involved with those discussions and helping drive those forward. Well, again, thank you. I couldn't be more pleased with the ICT department and you know your leadership, especially coming from the private sector and having that user experience make, is, is at the forefront um, of the work you guys are doing. So again, on behalf of um, you know the board, thank you for the work you're doing and your staff. Supervisor Caps. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Director Turwin, and I appreciate your energy. We're all dragging a little bit after lunch, and you're, you can tell you're, this is a new department, lots, of, <laughs> lots to get done. But um, my question predates the two of us uh, about the lawsuit involving Cox and SBTV, and I know this board approved funding to be used for, I think, more um, connectivity up the 154, but can you give an update on that briefly? Uh, because I do see the interest in community benefit and perhaps Wi-Fi sure. and parks or something like that. Yeah, yeah, so I can summarize that. So Thank you. Originally, those funds were going to be used to, as you mentioned, it were when it, we were going to try to reach some communities up off of the 154. The cost of that was just enormous, uh, way more than the funds were, uh, were we could have used to do that. And so we started meeting with Cox again and saying, okay, if, if that's out of reach, then what are some other viable options where there is still gonna be community benefit from those funds. And so even just recently within the last week, I've uh, been having conversations with Cox around um, identifying areas within their footprint, which their footprint is South County only, they're not up in North County. Um, and we have identified, I've worked with our community services division and the parks team. We've identified multiple parks within South County that currently do not have any public Wi-Fi. So you can Great. imagine like events or retreats that are at parks and things like that where they might have cell coverage, maybe, but they don't have Wi-Fi. Right. And so we're looking at using, uh, or having Cox use those funds to put up outdoor wireless uh, at many of the county parks in South County. 
The other location that we're looking at, two other locations we're, we're working on uh, right now is uh, within Isla Vista as well. Uh, so putting in wireless at, at, in certain areas of Isla Vista. And then thirdly is uh, the, ex, the, the grounds here at the county courthouse. Okay. So right now, you know, there's a lot of events uh, they, they use in the sunken gardens. And, and again, maybe there's cell coverage, maybe not, but if we could put in uh, wireless uh, for the community in the, uh, the grounds of the courthouse, I think there would be a benefit to that. And so Cox is supportive of that. And so now we're just working with them on more of the logistics, the technical logistics, how's that gonna take place? And so we'll keep you informed, but progress is being made. That's excellent, thanks so much. Yeah. Great. I, just my two cents is, you know, I think since I've been here, we've been trying to uh, work as a board more of trying to come up with data-driven decisions. First off, we didn't have the systems, we didn't fund the systems, which we now have done. Um, but we didn't really have the expertise until you got here to kind of really f get it all under one silo and really make it happen. So um, I think you're here at the right time. All you got to worry about now is cybersecurity and <laughs> AI. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> uh, so I just want to thank you and your entire department. Very responsive too. So really appreciate all your work. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. All right. So next up is General Services, Kirk Lagerquist. All right, good afternoon, Chair Lavagnino and Supervisors. I'm Kirk Lagerquist, the General Services Director. Here with me today are my three Assistant Directors, Lynn Dibel, Patrick Zaroski, and Skip Gray, along with my Business Manager, Brant Markley. I wanna extend my sincere appreciation to the General Services Finance Team and the Department staff who work so diligently on this budget. And much appreciation to the CEO's office and budget team, specifically Paul Clemente, Dana Grossi, and Ted Tabor for their support as, as we sorted through all of our numbers. Last year, this briefing was one of my first official acts as the new director. I feel much more seasoned this cycle and I'm happy to present the fiscal year 24-25 budget request for general services, plus highlight the department's accomplishments, goals, programs, and projects that we will focus on over the next year. The term general services does not easily identify what our department delivers to the county. I would say that we're a bit of a hodgepodge of divisions that collectively support all other departments, enabling their success. Through our dedicated team of office professionals, project managers, procurement specialists, real property agents, and highly skilled tradesmen in automotive and facilities maintenance divisions, we build and renovate county facilities. We maintain aging infrastructure to keep it operational. We buy and lease properties. We operate and maintain the vehicle fleet. We purchase goods and services to support the county. And when a crisis arises, we are there in the Emergency Operations Center to support logistics and, field, and in the field protecting our facilities. This is our budget summary. Our total operating budget has grown by roughly $5 million, covering all of our general fund programs, vehicle operations, utility costs, and energy division program activity. Our capital budget is still being finalized, and you will see the proposed capital projects in the upcoming special issues presentation after this on capital and facilities maintenance. Our general fund contribution increased by about $2.2 million, and our full-time equivalents increased by one position. Under our recurring annual capital program, we continue to address countywide accessibility improvements to meet Americans with Disabilities Act requirements, renewable energy goals, roofing replacements, and security improvements funded with our recurring general fund department 990 allocation of 1.8 million. In addition to our annual general fund contribution, we receive annual funding from the general fund department 990 program. And next fiscal year, we project 10.4 million to support our countywide deferred maintenance program, Northern Branch Jail maintenance, tree maintenance, and our one ERP related position. And as mentioned on the previous slide, 1.8 million towards our annual capital program. 
in our staffing summary. So during this fiscal year, current fiscal year, we recently added one full-time equivalent, a project coordinator position that will focus on deferred capital maintenance projects. And there are no changes to the 98 and a half FTEs for next fiscal year. And as a reminder, the big drop there in 22, 23 was when ITD moved out. Under, for our operating budget, grew by about eight and a half percent over last year. And again, the big drop there was when ITD moved. For our anticipated accomplishments, after my first six months in the seat, the general services leadership and management team met over three sessions to create a new vision, mission, values, and department-wide goals for the next five years. Our real estate and capital teams assisted with the lease and construction on county property for two new tiny home villages in Santa Maria and Goleta to support the unhoused population. Our energy manager, Brandon Kaysen, has developed facility standards for building energy management systems and started, to process, started the process to get eight facilities updated and aligned to county energy goals. Our capital division and energy manager completed the installation of the Betteravia campus solar, solar photovoltaic carports and battery energy storage system, providing a microgrid to support operations during power outages, as well as supporting the county renewable energy goals. Our real property division assisted the effort to find suitable county properties to further study for possible workforce housing. Our fleet division has expanded the county electric fleet to the north with additional EVs and installation of more charging infrastructure to support. Our fleet division implemented telematics and GPS technology to improve data and mileage reporting. And our procurement division has made several enhancements to the master service agreements, increasing efficiencies around the county. Our procurement division, in collaboration with public health, incorporated equity and inclusion into the contracting process. Our procurement division also hosted their second annual vendor connection event in Santa Maria, bringing together vendors and county departments. And our capital division is nearing completion of the Regional Fire Communications Center and Office of Emergency Management facility upgrades at the EOC campus off Cathedral Oaks. These department goals and objectives are the results of the General Services five-year strategic planning process that we recently finalized and implemented. Our goals and objectives support our ongoing commitment to financial and organizational excellence, sustainability and climate resiliency, and stewardship of our facilities and infrastructure. Our goals are aligned with the overall County Renew initiative as well. These are the remainder of our five goals. As Chris Snedden highlighted yesterday during the Public Works Department brief, we are highlighting the California Air Resource Board, or CARB, advanced clean fleets regulation as a high priority emerging issue today that has countywide impacts. The ACF focuses on medium to heavy duty vehicles, meaning three quarter ton pickups and above. Starting January 1st of this year through 2026, half of our new vehicle procurements in this category must be a zero emission vehicle, meaning electric, hydrogen, or other technology that supports zero emissions. Starting in January 2027, all medium and heavy duty vehicles purchased must meet the zero emission vehicle requirement. This is a bit of a chicken and egg scenario as the availability of vehicles in these categories are not readily available yet. Plus, we do not have the level three charging infrastructure to support adoption, but we are diligently working a plan to install chargers with these vehicles or where these vehicles will res reside. Between all departments, the county has 262 vehicles that fall into the medium to heavy duty category with Public Works having the majority. We estimate that over the next seven years, 40 to 50 vehicles will be due for replacement and will need to comply with the CARB regulation for advanced clean fleets. The financial impact will be substantial. As an example, a Kenworth electric tractor costs about a half million dollars compared to about $180,000 for a traditional internal combustion diesel engine. Additionally, the cost to install a level three charger is in the $100,000 range. Additionally, there are very specific reporting requirements required by CARB to document the advanced clean fleets transition, and that will require additional manpower and resources. Our rough estimate for the county over the next five years is between five to $15 million in order to comply with the mandate. Now for a look at some of our performance measures within general services. 
With three quarters of the fiscal year complete, we have essentially met our renewable energy goal with an even higher target for next fiscal year. We are below target on dollars spent with local vendors. We have far exceeded expectations by double on our greenhouse gas emissions avoided and gallons of gas avoided. We are on track with our electric vehicles purchased. We are below target on our preventive maintenance work orders completed within 30 days. And we are on target with our capital projects being completed within expected timeframes and budget. We've made significant improvements and progress towards completing the implementation of our KPMG priority recommendations. Our capital division made great improvements on the capital improvement plan process this year. We recognize that there's still further room for improvement and we will continue to work with our counterparts in public works and community services going forward. And we continue to expand the use of our asset management database. Fleet has made great strides in training their mechanics on modern vehicles, have hired staff to fill vacancies, which has helped with the response rate on maintenance and breakdowns, and is utilizing data from the vehicles to assess usage and right-sizing our fleet. Procurement has implemented the master service agreement process, which has been very beneficial and is pushing information out to our customers to help shape their decision-making and process purchases. We have no service level reductions. However, entering this budget cycle, we did have a $1.5 million budget deficit due to increased rates, franchise fees that transitioned to ITD, and project management reimbursement was pushed off to next year on some projects. So with the help of the budget office, they provided an additional 1.5 million to balance our budget so we don't have to take any service re reductions. In summary, general services had a great year. We've taken our vacancy rate from 20% to, to under 10%, which has afforded us to provide better products and services to our customers, the other county departments. With our newly adopted five-year strategic plan, we will continue to improve take care of our people and support this county. We have an amazing group of professionals within general services. I am proud of the men and women within this department. They continue to make a difference every day. Our climate is good, morale is high, and I feel fortunate to have joined this team a year ago. I look forward to the continued success of general services and this county we are here to support. And for our quote, uh, not as pithy as Thomas Jefferson or uh, Anne Frank, but uh, once again, I reached, <laughs> I reached back to a legendary athlete, the great Lawrence Peter Yogi Berra, uh, a rather underrated ball player. No other player in Major League Baseball history has more World Series rings than Yogi. And as a fellow Navy veteran, I have deep respect for his heroic actions during the invasion of Normandy on D-Day, where he refused to accept the Purple Heart Medal for being wounded in action as he didn't want his mother to worry. Known for his many Yogiisms over the year, over the years, I felt this one most fitting. A nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Standing well, by for questions. if my dad is watching, which he might be, you just went way up in his world. Big, <laughs> big Yankee fan. So, well, I, did, uh, I couldn't put Yankees on my paper there. No, that's a long Red Sox fan. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Williams, is you the right hand? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I just uh, want to say. Uh, especially as someone um, who has a history of being a pain in the rear to general services staff, we, I, I really appreciate the great work that's been done on, on EVs um, and on charging infrastructure. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the BIF that I requested, uh, you, know, you know, I had, what it, what it reveals is kind of like a very interesting situation, right, where uh, general services are really implemented uh, this EV mandate with vigor, but let's just say not every department is, is on board as, as, yeah, as other departments. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I, I will not name names, uh, uh, but I, I, I think it really kind of speaks for itself because some folks have really embraced it and are um, acquiring the majority of their vehicles in that way, and some are hardly even touching it. Uh, and I understand that some of them uh, have very specialized vehicles but every department has the need to transport people to meetings. So there's no department who, who d doesn't have a suitable vehicle you know, category uh, for, th for the mandate. Um, and you know, uh, it's important that you put the statewide mandate um, uh, challenge uh, uh, you know, to our attention. 
Uh, but to me, what this means is um, we better move quick because you know we're in a uh, we're in a CCA territory that includes five counties, and they all have general services departments or public works departments that are going to be out trying to get some of these vehicles. But right now, none of them are. And so we just have pot of incentive monies, 3CE, that is not being underutilized. So instead of sp spending our energy hoping that the state's going to change the mandate, let's try to make a, a nickel into a dime <laughs> um, at, while we have the, res the resources there, the pots there to, to do it. Absolutely. I, I, uh, we're all about finding grant money. Uh, and other incentives that are out there to take advantage of in the installation of our EV charging infrastructure. We, we took great advantage, advantage of uh, various grants when we bought our electric vehicles, um, getting up to 30% back on some of the vehicles. So yeah, I'm a big fan of other people's money. Mm -hmm. All right, well, and I just appreciate your can-do, find yes department right now. And, you brought up KPMG, and I didn't want this budget cycle to go through without really highlighting the work that our CEO did in getting us to move forward into the um, the world of KPMG and finding out. I think it, it it hit right at the right time because we have so many new department heads, and we are really in this transition period at the county with a lot of our, you know, brain trust leaving, and it was really cool to kind of bring somebody in from the outside to say, hey, here's some recommendations of, let's look at why are we doing what we're doing the way we're doing it. And uh, when you look at the recommendations and the acceptance on a part of, especially the newer department heads, it's been refreshing. And so you're one of those that uh, just grabbed onto it and really appreciate it. And it's made a big difference, I think, in the way that we deliver our goods and services. So thank you. And with that, finishes out that group, that functional group. So Madam Clerk, is there any public comment on this functional group? Chair Lavanino and members of the board, yes, we have five requests to speak on the general government and support services functional group. Okay. We will begin on Zoom with Cheryl Trosky to be followed by Rhonda Houston. Cheryl? Cheryl, we have unmuted you on our end. If you can. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Services. Thank you. And with that, oh. finishes out that. Cheryl, if you can. Is that AI? Or <laughs> <laughs> you've been replaced. Please mute on your end and then proceed with your comments. That would be greatly appreciated. Okay, you want me to mute myself? Oh, no, not yourself, just um, whatever viewing device you had in the background. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay, thank you. Members of the board and staff, thank you for all the great information in this workshop and the great access. I appreciate all the comments made regarding the integrity of our elections. The Deputy Registrar of Voters, Michael Daly, is doing a great job. His staff welcomes our observers, and while we would like more access to observe, what we have observed indicates staff does their very best to make sure our elections are secure and every qualified vote is counted. Where confidence erodes in our election process is that the system cannot be audited, and the process has become very complicated and cumbersome. Not too long ago, we knew results election night. It is great that the March 5th, uh, 2024 election was certified within 10 days uh, instead of the allowable 29 days, but it is still too long and makes voters naturally suspicious. As an election integrity advocate, my interactions with voters has revealed a complicated voting system is tantamount to voter suppression. Many people don't trust the post-COVID system uh, given uh, lots of credible evidence, there is a growing desire amongst voters to return to same-day voting and hand counting, which is done in France and Taiwan successfully. They, those countries count millions of ballots 
and have results election night. It can be done for a lot less money than we are currently spending. Thank you. We will now go to Rhonda Houston, and then we will return to Santa Barbara with Alvin Salji. Rhonda? Rhonda, if you can hear us, if you can please unmute your microphone to provide your comments. Rhonda Houston on Zoom. Yeah, I'll start. Well, since Alvin's ready, we will go to Alvin Salji, uh, uh, okay. and then we will return to Rhonda. Okay. Alvin? I apologize. <laughs> We're getting ahead. Well, good afternoon, uh, Chair Lavagnino and the supervisors. I'm Alvin Salji, the chair of the Santa Barbara County Veterans Commission. I'm speaking today to in favor of Harry Hagan's uh, request for spaces for the veteran service representatives in uh, Santa Barbara. Three years ago, we in the commission started a mission to get three additional county veteran service representatives. So there would be a veteran service officer and five VSRs to adequately support the county veterans in obtaining their VA health care and disability ratings, and many other veterans' benefits. Harry became our champion in putting funding in his budget to achieve our mission success. I have been before you supervisor several times in the last few years to ask uh, support for our mission. Thank you for supporting Harry's budget request to add three additional rep veteran service representatives in creating the veteran service office officer management position. Our mission is almost complete to obtain the support county veterans deserve. The additional veteran service representatives to date have provided outstanding needed support to county veterans. But we need one more VSR in Santa Barbara to complete success. For mission success, please find spaces in the Santa Barbara County offices so the sixth veteran service representative can be hired and join veteran service representative Joe Fletcher to serve the Santa Barbara veterans. Thank you. We will remain here in Santa Barbara with Peter Hustlin to be followed by Rhonda Houston. Peter. This is almost my first time doing this. Last time I was here, I think I was participating in a ceremony welcoming Bill Wallace uh, to succeed Jim Slater as a member of the Board of Supervisors. Usually I'm sitting on that side of the dais. This is, this is interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm here to support what uh, Al just said. Um, I've been involved with uh, Santa Barbara City College and veterans for a very long time. I've been a faculty member at City College for, for 40 years and served as a member of the Board of, Super, Board of Supervisors. No, 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 Board of Trustees for uh, 12 years. And, it, and it's interesting that some of the issues are quite the same and finding space for a VSO is, is going to be challenging. I understand that, but we can't hire somebody and not have a place for that person to work. Uh, I, I know that for a fact because in the early days I volunteered to work as a, as a counselor for uh, the Veterans Center when it was on Santa Barbara Street. At that time, we were dealing with veterans from the Vietnam conflict. And their concerns are enormous. Their needs are enormous. Their, the level of confusion is enormous of how to navigate just ordinary stuff. That's what our VSOs do. So uh, with that, I will uh, leave you with an extra minute to complete your business, but urge your support for, uh, for Harry Hogan's uh, efforts. Thank you. And we will now return to Zoom to see if Rhonda Houston is available. Rhonda? Rhonda, we have unmuted you on our end. If you can please unmute to provide your comments. I 
assuming Rhonda is away from her computer at the moment. So that concludes public comment on this functional group. Okay. All right, that takes us to our special issue, maintenance and capital projects. And I believe Dana Grossi is gonna lead us off here. Are we gonna go to, yep, yep, okay. Okay, well, good afternoon, Chair and Supervisors. Uh, my name is Dana Grassi. I'm a Fiscal and Policy Analyst with the Budget and Research Division, and I'd also like to introduce the other presenters here on this item. From Community Services, we have Jill Van Wee. Um, from General Services, we have John Green. And then from Public Works, we have Mustafa Saji. So I appreciate you all being here to present with me. Additionally, we have ACEO Wade Horton and Principal Analyst Ted Tiber in the room to provide support on questions as needed. So as far as the structure, I'll start out by summarizing the purpose for the special issue, a background on the county's existing maintenance funding policy and funding trends over time, and then each of the departments will update you on their anticipated accomplishments and for maintenance projects funded in current fiscal year, as well as projects being planned for next fiscal year. And then I'll conclude by sharing staff's recommended capital projects for funding. So as a reminder, the board adopted a maintenance funding policy back in 2014. And this policy allocates 18% of the county's total unallocated general fund revenue growth for ongoing maintenance needs. And because this presentation discusses both maintenance projects and capital projects, I did want to make a distinction between what is considered maintenance versus capital. Uh, maintenance projects are generally smaller in scope and involve facility repair or component replacement, while capital projects are larger in scope and involve constructing new facilities or more major alterations that increase the size, capacity, or function of an asset. And on the topic of capital, please note that the county's 24 through 29 Capital Improvement Program, or CIP, will be presented to you in May. But for today, staff are asking for your board to review and affirm or make adjustments to capital projects recommended for funding with available one-time funds. So this graph here shows various funding sources that have been dedicated towards maintenance needs each year, going back to fiscal year 2021, as well as the proposed spending for next fiscal year. So you can see with the dark blue bars, those represent uh, the 18% policy funding amounts, which have increased each year in alignment with discretionary revenue growth trends. You can see that there was particularly significant growth seen from prior fiscal year to current fiscal year. So overall positive trends, um, then when you look at the proposed 24-25 spending for 18%, uh, that amount will be the same as current fiscal year at $15.8 million. And this is reflective of the county's overall fiscal picture. The other bars on this graph represent other ongoing as well as one-time sources that departments receive. And the only funding uh, that you don't see here on this graph are baseline maintenance funding amounts that each department receives each year. And so departments have been receiving a combined total $2.3 million in baseline maintenance funding for a number of years. And these funds date to prior to the 18% maintenance policy. And so looking to this table, uh, this shows you the county's proposed maintenance funding specifically for next fiscal year, and it's broken out by department. And so you can see in the top row the baseline maintenance funding amounts that I was just mentioning. And altogether, when you look at all the various sources, general fund and um, other sources such as grants, the county is budgeting a total of $32.6 million in maintenance funding for next year. So this graph uh, shows you the county's deferred maintenance needs over time. For general services and community services, which you can see in the orange and gray, the estimated deferred maintenance needs have increased over time, while public works deferred maintenance needs have, for the most part, trended flat. And altogether, for all three departments, the countywide deferred maintenance needs total $568 million at this time. A key takeaway here is uh, that existing revenue has not been adequate to address deferred maintenance. 
even though funding has increased over the past several years. And so solutions would require additional revenue or trade-offs in other spending. Uh, so that was just a brief introduction and background. Um, but at this time, I'll let the departments share with you their maintenance projects in progress and what's planned for next year. And we'll go ahead and start with Jill. Good afternoon, Chair Lavanino and fellow supervisors. Always nice to see you this time of year. Um, the first thing I really wanted to address was um, Chair Lavanino's uh, comment last year about what's going on with the, why is the, how are we doing with the rising costs of deferred maintenance? So if you see the CSD Parks has 92 million this year, we actually have $22 million of projects in process. Uh, a big one of those, of course, is the Kachuma RV renovation project. So next year we anticipate hitting about 70 million, which lowers it, but we obviously need outside funding to help reduce that um, huge maintenance backlog. Um, and when we do our um, numbers each year, we usually use a um, construction cost index of about 5%, that's the average. So you can see even with 70 million next year, we would probably be at 3.5 million higher. So even- Jill, can you just yeah. pull that microphone a little bit closer to you? Oh, sure. Face. Hi, can you hear me now? Is it better? better. <laughs> okay, perfect. I heard, I, just... I heard maintenance was going down. <laughs> so that, that, then I wanted to hear more. Yeah. So. <laughs> but even with the 5% uh, construction cost index, we right. still, okay. So I just wanted to at least address your comment from last year. So um, if we look at what we're doing this year, the two things I want to do with this slide is just uh, say that we have um, about a third of the cost, no, half the cost going towards grant leveraging project, grant matches. We have about 40% going to safety projects, and we have about 10% going to storm repairs. Um, and as we try our best to evenly distribute the deferred maintenance funds throughout the districts, um, sometimes we have to adjust, mostly we have to adjust for emergencies and or grant leveraging. What we are able to do out of the, we have, CSD has 20 grants. Eight of those are solely for deferred maintenance projects. And the next few slides just show some of the damage. Uh, Manning Park Tennis Court is currently closed because of the damage. We were able to repair uh, Toro Canyon Park from the 23 storms. Thanks, Tina. Um, this just shows you the Galita Pier Pile. That was actually repaired less than 10 years ago, but yet it still ended up on the beach um, during the 23 storms. Uh, we will be replacing some equipment at Waller Park and we are in the process of repair, uh, replacing three of the Hallmark Beach restrooms. And this is ideally what the pool at Kachuma will look like in a couple of months, and the Kachuma cabins as well. And then if we look at next year, we anticipate a third of the cost going to grant and resource leveraging. Um, projects, a third going to storm repair projects, and a third going to pavement and playground replacement projects. I think, and if, um, and that's about it, yeah. If you have any questions, we, just let I me know. I think we'll wait, we'll Thanks. wait till we get done with the whole presentation, then we'll Perfect. go back. Perfect, Thanks. Thank you. So, good afternoon, Chair Lavanino and members of the board. I'm pleased to present the General Services Department's portion of the maintenance and capital special issue presentation. General Services continues to be very busy with approximately 94 active projects and with 30 or 23 projects in the planning phase. Facilities maintenance has processed approximately 9,252 work orders and capital projects currently utilizes 13 project managers and one project coordinator to manage the projects. So this list of programs presented or represents the various program categories funded in each fiscal year or in fiscal year 23-24. General Services has completed a significant number of projects from our annual funded programs portfolio and we currently have many program funded projects underway. Let me go to the next, there we go. This slide highlights the specific completed or soon to be completed deferred maintenance projects totaling nearly $1.2 million. 
This is General Services shock and awe slide and represents a few of the numerous deferred maintenance projects that, we, that were accomplished in fiscal year 23-24. As you can see from the images, General Services is consistently chasing failing aging equipment and the impacts to our county facilities. General Services expended approximately $1.7 million on emergency repairs in fiscal year 23-24 to, to address sewer line failures, water line breaks, tripping hazards, downed trees, HVAC failures, storm damage, and electrical failures. General Services is proposing a similar program's budget structure in fiscal year 24-25 to continue to address the facility and infrastructure needs of the county's facilities. This funding is essential in addressing the backlog and future preventative maintenance needs of our county facilities. General Services appreciates your time today and continued support, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and members of the board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to uh, uh, present the capital improvement and capital maintenance information from Public Works Transportation uh, Division. Next slide. Uh, so here's- uh, Mustafa, could you move the mic closer to you? It's hard for oh, us to hear. Sure. Great, Sorry thank you. Um, so here's a, a summary table of some big ticket projects that we have in progress or completed uh, during the current fiscal year. Uh, the first two are our bridge projects. The first one, Foothill Bridge Replacement Project is, uh, was completed a few months ago and now a structures team can focus more on pushing forward Bonita School Replacement Project. Uh, and uh, we also have lots of uh, active transportation project listed here. Phase one of Modoc Multi's path was completed a few months ago and uh, we're resuming the pro pro progress from via Senda all the way to Oberyn to provide a protected bike uh, and also pedestrian path for our uh, community in Santa Barbara and Goleta. Uh, and also uh, we're starting to work on the phase two of Refugio path. Uh, some last uh, punches items from phase one to be worked on, but uh, we're wrapping it up uh, in the next few weeks or so. Uh, Santa Maria Levy Trail is right now on their uh, permitting review process. Uh, coastal access projects are also going to be advertised very soon. And uh, same as last year, we have a good amount of attention to our capital maintenance efforts uh, in multiple areas such as countywide rehabilitation pavement preservation and hardscape. And in the past year or so, uh, with the storms, we've been uh, paying a good level of attention to uh, different areas of disaster efforts in terms of disaster recovery, disaster repairs, and uh, so on and so forth. That I'll share some details uh, in the next slides. Uh, here's a snapshot of the current roadmap for 23, 24, and where we're standing in all the uh, produced projects. Our asset management team was able to procure four contract packages this year, and the rest of the work will be done uh, in-house. On the top, you can see uh, two rehabilitation projects. We had to split the project uh, for rehabilitation for one for South County and one for Central and North County with the list of roads that are shown here. Uh, we have also North County Hardscape that was contracted out. The rest of the Hardscape work uh, in other parts of the county were taken care of in-house. Uh, and with the total rehab work, we were able to uh, cover a total of 20 lane miles of rehabilitation this year, which uh, the work will be starting in the next few months. Next slide. And then uh, with the uh, preventive preservation project, we are able to cover more lane miles, obviously, because the treatments are much cheaper. So we have a longer list of projects included here and we are keeping it under one countywide uh, project that will be out in construction in the next few months. Uh, here are some construction photos from the work that was carried out this year. Uh, on the top left, you can see the hardscape operations on Evanshire uh, in the top right. Uh, you can see uh, San Simeon uh, Drive. Our maintenance crews, our in-house maintenance crews are actually uh, doing the paving operations. On the bottom left, uh, you can see uh, 
one of the steep and narrow sections of Refugio Road on the south side of the summit, uh, the switchback area, and we were able to cover or pave uh, one line, one mile uh, long uh, portion of this road, uh, which was a good achievement in the roadmap in the past year. And uh, one other example, uh, the DG path that we were able to provide on Barker Pass in the first district. Uh, some more examples, uh, in the Vanderberg Village area on Ave uh, Aldebaran Avenue, we were able to uh, apply a more comprehensive rehabilitation strategy by adding fabric and a thicker overlay. Uh, on the top right, you can see uh, the finished product of the pedestrian path phase one on North Refugio Road, and some more hardscape repair projects in Orchid area in the bottom. And uh, with the same momentum, uh, we prog programmed uh, the next fiscal year work, uh, two main funding sources, same as last year's general fund contribution and RMRA. Uh, the total contribution for general fund is $7.9 million, and we allocated $8.7 million of RMRA uh, for capital maintenance and different assets that we have in transportation division. Same as again last year, the majority of the money will be allocated to pavement asset, a total allocation of $14.5 million this year. Another $800,000 will be spent on pedestrian and safety improvements, and uh, the remainder total amount of $1.3 million will be spent or allocated on other assets and in different areas and scopes of work, such as bridge maintenance, drainage repairs, striping, traffic signals, and so on. Uh, and here's the updated uh, public works transportation asset with a total estimate of $313 million this year. Um, uh, this number is 6% higher than the number reported last year, mostly due to inflation and increasing construction costs. Uh, about half of the backlog is actually sitting our, in our pavement asset, uh, which uh, comes down to an annual need of $14.5 million to be able to maintain the current PCI. With the uh, $600,000 additional general fund contribution that we received uh, over the past few months, we are hopeful that we'll be able to hit this target without any request for budget expansion. And uh, I'm going to wrap up my uh, report uh, with some highlights on the uh, storm efforts. Uh, so we're following slightly different strategies for 2023 storm efforts and 2024 storm efforts. Uh, for 2023 storms, uh, we are focusing more on the long haul of the disaster recovery efforts, uh, focusing more on the uh, permanent repairs and working more closely with our federal partners from FHWA and FEMA sites and also our uh, dedicated staff in the county working on the disaster recovery efforts to be able to maximize reimbursements and also be able to recover costs uh, as much and as quickly as possible. For the 2024 storms, we've been um, focusing more on coming up with a priority list of projects that could be uh, constructed sooner than later. So we uh, came up with a list of uh, high priority uh, projects that need immediate attention. Uh, and we were able to work with CO's office to secure a $3 million uh, funding to be able to support these projects. And um, we're working on that list currently. Two examples are shown here, uh, Dominion Road, the sinkhole and Dominion Road. This, is, this uh, photo is becoming the headline of 2024 storms for us. And uh, the second example is a slip out. Uh, we had a slip out on a steep section of Harris Great Road. Uh, that both of these projects are currently under construction through our emergency contracts uh, that we've established with different contractors countywide. And with that, I'll hand it back to Dana. Okay, um, thank you. And now shifting gears, I'd like to present the recommended capital projects for funding next fiscal year. Please note the recommended funding amounts include general fund as well as non-general fund sources. And as part of the budget development policies that your board approved in December, staff utilized the criteria that you see here to prioritize the projects. These criteria have been in effect for several years and staff did focus on priorities one, two, and three, which are the imperative, essential, and important categories. 
and as an example, issues such as correcting dangerous situations, structural damage, or satisfying legal obligations would all fall under the imperative or priority one category. Here are the recommended capital projects. The total recommended funding equals roughly $12.7 million. These one-time funds would consist of 8.2 million of general fund and 4.5 million in non-general fund sources. There are four projects that were prioritized as priority one imperative, and I'll note that you do have detailed descriptions of these projects in your materials, so I'll try to move through these with uh, brief summaries. So as far as the priority one projects, these include the Santa Barbara Courthouse Roof Replacement Phase 3A. This proposes to replace the courthouse roof on the Anacapa side of the building, and this is part of a multi-year project in progress. And Phase 3A is recommended to be paid for out of an existing courthouse facilities fund and criminal justice facilities fund. Next is the Santa Barbara Veterans Hall project. This will address structural needs to support a planned HVAC system upgrade. The HVAC is being funded through a federal grant, but additional funds are needed for completion of the other project elements. Additionally, the Kyriel Water Loop Phase 2 is a project also in progress with Phase 1 completed. The water line has experienced numerous leaks, so funding would allow for replacement of the water line loop. And the last project in the Priority 1 category is the Northern Branch Jail Additional Pod Design. This funding will pay for architectural design documents needed for the jail pod and step-down facility designs that are being considered. And so these costs are recommended to be paid for with existing Prop 172 fund balance. And then you see projects in the Essential 2 or Priority 2 category. These include the Santa Barbara District Attorney Building Weatherization Project. Funding would address water intrusion issues in this building by allowing for needed repairs to restore and seal the exterior structure. Then the Behavioral Wellness Kyriel Headquarters is seeking additional funding, which would pay for Phase 2 design services. The Goleta Beach parking lot project will allow for repaving of the entranceway and two of the parking lots at Goleta Beach, and this was per a recent assessment of paving needs that showed significant deterioration. The Santa Barbara Administration Building funding would allow for a continuation of HVAC project work currently uh, occurring in the basement, and it will allow for a completion of these improvements. There is uh, also an existing HVAC system in the public health laboratory that has become obsolete and a new unit is necessary for energy efficiency and to meet air quality mandates. And please note that costs for this project will ultimately be recouped through the county's cost allocation plan. Additionally, the Santa Maria Public Defender's Office lacks basic fire protection. Fire smoke alarms and water sprinklers uh, need to be installed and this funding would allow for that. And the last project prioritized into the essential category is the Surf Beach parking lot, which has fencing along the Amtrak Railroad at this location. The fencing is no longer serving its intended purpose, and sections will need to be repaired or replaced. And then uh, for the Priority 3 category projects, the first is the Public Defender Santa Barbara Courthouse Office Design and Tenant Improvements. Currently, there is a portion of the office occupied by General Services. This space will soon be occupied <clears throat> by public defender staff. This funding would allow for necessary master space planning and tenant improvements to address the longer term needs of the public defender's office. Funding is also being recommended for the purchase of equipment, furniture, and electrical upgrades needed at the county's backup emergency operations center, which is located at the Betteravia campus admin building. And then finally, uh, as you heard Mr. Staji discuss, additional funding is needed and being recommended for public works to move forward with needed emergency work resulting from the February storms. So this uh, concludes our presentation. And you know, at this time, we're of course here for questions and would seek direction from your board to affirm or revise these priority capital projects being recommended. Thank you. Well, if we're talking about maintenance, we got to lead off with D4. So that's right. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Lavanino. Um, I'm very pleased to see the amount of money that we're spending on maintenance and capital in the county. This is my 12th budget that I've been a part of. Um, and um, I think I went back and looked at the budget from 12 years ago, and I think we're four times the amount of money we're spending on capital 
than we were back in um, 2013. So um, kudos there, very excited about that, appreciate that. Um, I, I am also excited to see the, the, uh, the lines on the deferred maintenance backlog starting to flatten out. You know, um, my dream is to actually see them point down in the future. Um, I guess my first question comes to uh, Public Works. I wasn't quite sure whether we're gonna hit the number this year to be able to at least maintain our 57 P, uh, PCI. And for the public's benefit, that's still a failing grade, but we're, we're happy to not get any worse. Um, and eventually we wanna see that go up. But it, are we gonna be able to maintain that in this year's budget? Uh, Supervisor Nelson, through the chair. Uh, we are hopeful at this point. One out of four projects has been advertised and we have updated unit costs that came from the contractors. And as of now, that one project that was out, we saw 30% increase in construction costs. Uh, but we're waiting for three other projects to, have, to be able to have a comprehensive estimate on like what's the financial hit. Uh, yeah, I think that's as accurate as I can say. That's so that's for this year. So we wanna make sure that we're funded for next year to make sure we can maintain that. So um, does next year's budget currently have the funding to maintain our PCI at the level that we're currently at? Oh, sure. Uh, um, Supervisor Nelson through the chair. Uh, yes, with the allocations that we made so far, we have enough funding and the total amount is $14.5 million that was allocated for pavement assets and that's pretty much close to the target we're looking for to maintain the current PCI. Great, and I think that's really important for the public to also understand. So if we can at least maintain it, we're not debt financing with these budgets. You know, if, if we are not fully maintaining that, at least that baseline, we're pushing on future debts to um, other budgets and um, and not a balanced budget as far as I'm concerned. Um, in contrast, we see those numbers start to go up in general services and in um, uh, community services departments. So um, maybe to, to those two departments, you know, what more do we need there? Um, and I guess, let me just throw this out there too as we address this, is that um, are we spending some of our deferred maintenance funds on capital or, or are we keeping that strictly to deferred maintenance? Supervisor Nelson to the chair, at least for CSD parks, we only spend the maintenance funds on maintenance projects. They turn into large projects, like replacement projects as opposed to just repairs when it gets to that life stage, but we do not spend um, maintenance funds on pure capital projects. And then the degradation, it's, it's, we're, we're gaining on our deferred maintenance backlog, but it's getting more expensive each year. So um, would you guys be able to uh, give us a number in the future of what the number that we need to maintain our deferred maintenance backlog in? Absolutely, okay. yes. Yep. Ron? Supervisor Nelson through the chair. Yeah, so we are, um, you know, we utilize our 18% programs funding towards capital projects, kind of aside from the facilities projects. Okay, all right. And then um, as far as work orders are concerned, I understand that we have a significant backlog in for general services in the, in the South Coast. Um, what are you guys doing to continue to address that? I know the North County um, yards or shops are getting after our, our lists, but the South County lists are pretty extensive. Supervisor Nelson through the chair. Can you repeat that? I didn't um, hear the charge, last. Uh, I guess the work orders for maintenance. Yeah, so right now the majority of our, about 35% of our work orders are in the North County shop and 53% are in the South County shop. Um, I don't know if you're looking for specific metrics on you know, the backlog, I would have to consult with facilities. My understanding is it was extensive in the South Coast that many of the, the items on there had been on there for a long time and are needing additional resources to attack that. So I was just wanting to encourage the department to make sure that they're using those deferred maintenance dollars to, to really get after the, some of those backlog um, issues. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so my, my next comment though is um, looking at the capital improvement plan. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I was disappointed. Um, last year I, I pointed out that um, you know, for our county, about 10% of the capital improvement plan um, was gonna be spent in the Santa Maria Valley, which, you know, that's a big chunk of our population in this county, about 40% of the people um, in our county live in the Santa Maria Valley, only about 10%. And in this year's capital, you know, and so I thought it couldn't get any worse, and in this year's capital improvement plan, if you take out the uh, North Branch Jail design, it's about 5% of our capital improvement plan. 
is in the Santa Maria Valley. And so um, I'm just concerned there that, um, you know, it's a different discussion. I know we have a lot of assets in the South Coast. We've been investing down here for years and years and years. So we, um, we need to spend money on some of these uh, deferred maintenance uh, projects and some of these buildings. But I really do think that it needs to be a part of our priority, prioritization that we're focused um, more on investing in the North County for some of our administrative functions. Um, on top of some of the asks that you've heard um, over the last, last two days, you know, our public defender and, and um, DA's buildings up there in the North County um, are in, in, in sad shape. Um, we have, you know, tens of millions of dollars of parks that have been on the books in the North County that have never even begun construction and trails. Um, so I just, it just seems that it needs to be a, um, something that's taken into greater consideration when we look at their capital improvement plan on where we, we are investing those dollars and how equitable, equ equitable we're being geographically. Um, you know, I don't want the deferred maintenance f uh, fund just to be the South County remodel fund. It needs to be spread throughout the county. And so um, that's something I'd like to see a uh, change. Um, I, you know, I would like to see personally the, uh, you know, I was looking at the list the, on the projects um, that did not make it. Um, I know the Clark Avenue um, improvements were on there that I think those should, should make the list. So as we look at spending this year, um, that would be one of my pieces of feedback is to add that to um, this year's list. Supervisor Hartman. Uh, yes, well, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what my colleague, Supervisor Nelson, has to say. I guess I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I think a lot of our assets in the North County are, are newer. We don't, is there any way to measure this or, or develop a measure uh, for the value and age? And, you know, I, I'm not sure that just a straight monetary evaluation, how much is being spent in each place, is, is adequate to explain how many resources and their age and how, if there's any way, and if it would take more effort to figure this out than to actually do work, I, I'm not interested. But I, I, it, it's a question uh, that you can think about. Uh, the other thing I have is quite minor, but uh, there was just a shade structure uh, erected on the park in Santa Inez, and I'm very appreciative of that. And what I realize is that a lot of play structures throughout our county, as, as the climate's heating up, uh, children are, are going to need these shade structures, so we need to begin planning for that now. The slides and swings and all the equipment will be too hot for kids to grab onto, so that's going to have to become part of our planning, I believe. So anyway, thank you for the great work. They're more expensive than we ever would have thought. Supervisor Williams? Yeah, I... I mean, I think this is an outstanding need and something that I think the, the three departments are continuously looking at. But I also think that it's unfair to say that last year was unfair to the North. Um, the, the reason why your calculation is only 10% is because you're excluding the largest expenditure in the North, uh, which was the Foothill Bridge in, in Kiama. The North-South split last year was pretty good, um, uh, but if you don't count Kiama as part of the North County, it doesn't look as good. So I'm just saying, it, you know. 100% uh, funded by the Fed still too. I, I get that, but it, it, it's a priority. It was a priority for the department. The department has to put energy to get those, to get that, to get that money. Uh, and, it, and it's a big deal to the residents of Kiama uh, because that's one of the routes that's easily blocked in, in, in bad weather. So I just, you know, uh, I. I just, your point is well taken, but I feel like uh, saying that it wasn't a good split last year is not completely uh, uh, the case. Well, I wanna give a little historical perspective from the old man in the room. And I know, I know Supervisor uh, Nelson was also involved in this, but can you put up slide three? You get a chance, it's the 18% from funding. So this all goes back to actually um, kind of Supervisor Nelson's idea at the time and Supervisor Adam. Um, for those of you who weren't around in 2014, it was a ballot measure, Measure M, to spend. Uh, the, the measure basically said you had to maintain all of our assets in the current condition. They could not deteriorate. So whatever we had to spend to keep that, um, we needed to do. 
uh, it failed. It was very close. The election was very close. But it lit a fire under the board at that time to say, hey, this is something that people care about, and we've got to start doing something, because this is getting out of control, our maintenance backlog. If you go back and you look at 2014 when we first, and I think you're alluding to this, which I've done. I've gone back and looked at this. The first year, we put in $2.1 million. We are now putting in almost 16 million. Well, and when you add, we didn't have SB1 at the time, and we didn't have uh, grants and additional funding we weren't counting, but now there's almost 30 million going in to a year. So we've, I think we've done a really good job of arresting the growth. The growth was exploding. Um, for a 10 year period, it almost went up about 250%. The backlog was just exploding. So we've got enough in there to kind of, we corralled it. Um, and it would take a huge infusion to kind of eliminate this backlog. I will not be here, but in 2029 or 2030, we may have a, an infusion of some cash from some retirement savings, and maybe this would be a good place to put it. Um, projections also can be a bit, little bit misleading. So by the way, 57 is fair, to be fair. It's not in the poor section yet, and we had a two-hour discussion one time in 2014 about what color the PCI was, whether we were in the orange or we were in the green zone or whatever. So we don't want to go back to those days. But So we're at 57 in 2016, the PCI was 60. But the projection was if we didn't spend more, by 2024, the PCI was supposed to be 43. So like I said, we I think we've done a really good job of arresting the growth. Um, I'm not going to get caught up into the, the I, I think we're, we're I understand Supervisor Nelson's position about equity uh, geographically. I'm more concerned about fixing whatever needs to be fixed. And to have staff rank these as the one, two, three, I think is very helpful. We might want to be part of that conversation as well about saying what is necessary and what is, but I'm not an engineer, so I don't really want to be part of that conversation. But um, this, out of all the time I've been here, this is one of the things that I think uh, we can point to as a real success of not getting caught up in whose project gets done or what happens. It's a countywide team of us growing up and saying we need to address this is a problem. It's not sexy. It's not fun to do. We'd much rather spend, I'd rather spend money on a soccer field or a trail or something else. But paving roads, fixing bridges, fixing culverts, doing hardscape needs to be done. And so um, I think this chart actually shows the commitment that past board members have made, our board members are making, and uh, I appreciate the CEO's office also putting in the additional $3 million that'll make a difference. So I wanna thank you, I'm glad we highlighted this. It's a, it's a, it's, I think it's important to all uh, department heads to realize why we spend this amount of money in this area is because the other thing that we didn't talk about today is that the problem and the reason why Supervisor Adams and Supervisor Nelson were so adamant that we needed to address it was because this exponentially gets more expensive the longer you ignore it. It's not one of those things that if it's $2 today, it's gonna to be $2 next week and we'll just buy it next week. If you $2 today, it's $5 next week. So the more PCI, degrades, the more these buildings degrade, the more it costs to replace them and repair them. So um, hats off to you guys for bringing the attention and to all the, the board members that have continued to funnel money into this. So are there any other questions, comments, where we're going on this matter? Okay, we've got our CIP list. I guess that will come back to us in June. Or are we approving it now? We were asking for your direction if you want to affirm the list. We heard that Supervisor Nelson would like another project on there. If there's, um, there's not additional evidently available revenue, but if there's something you want to trade off or if there's three nods to go forward, we would go forward with it. Okay, well let me ask first if there's any public comment on this matter. Speech to it. Chair Lavanino, members of the board, we have no requests to speak. No requests to speak, issue. okay. Does anybody want to trade anything? Want to Supervisor Williams? Well, just what what is the price tag for the Clark Avenue improvements? Is it that that's the project that you? Yeah, so it's a half million dollars, and I, 
I could. I heard the CEO said if there was additional funds available, maybe that could be the next um, project on the list. Supervisors, so we would like you to affirm this list. And again, there's $3 million extra that we're putting in for storm repairs. Um, and between now, and Mr. Clemente will get to this in our wrap up, between now and when we actually bring the um, the budget in June, we're still working with the auditor, seeing if there's any revenue, property taxes look better than we think. So there's still more opportunity. Um, I would go back to Public Works and ask the team to how they would rank these if, if there was additional revenue. You know me, I would put the additional revenue towards future deficits, but it's your board's decision um, and we can revisit this if there's additional revenue for other projects um, when we come back. Can we ask in the future, because I think this is something that's not probably gonna go away, the way, we, the way we're looking at these. I'm assuming everything that's unfunded is less than a, a three category, one, two, or three, right? Are these, because they were ranked one, two, three, have to do, must do, Wade, could you please come to the mic and our resident engineer and ACEO. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, go. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. So the way these are ranked in October, depart departments, they submit um, their prioritized list that's ranked internally um, for unfunded CIP projects. So. That doesn't include projects that are funded that are being brought to you in the CIP. For instance, uh, for 24-25, Public Works has over $96 million worth of projects that are gonna be funding next year. Um, CSD 11.5 million, and General Services 16.4 million. So these are for consideration of unfunded projects. With this year, we had a team uh, made up of CSD, General Services, ITD, and Public Works that ranked over 136 unfunded projects. And they ranked those across 10 different categories. Um, those projects were then prioritized based on the amount of funding the CAO's office um, specified that was available and established the cut line. Uh, that cut line was, we, I then sat down with the General Services Department and we took a look at those rankings and those rankings are a component of the overall selection, but we also consider timing, funding available, and overall priorities. And those overall priorities include the department's top priorities. They also include the county's priorities. For instance, the, there could have been projects that ranked higher than the North County Jail expansion, but we know we have to do that. And when we only have $10 million to work with, when you take $2 million, that's, that's a significant chunk. So the intent is, yes, generally it's one, two, and three projects, but sometimes there's projects that we just have to do that we have to take into consideration as a priority for an unfunded project. Okay. Let, let me Supervisor follow up. Yeah. So how many one, two, and three projects are not on the funded list? Public Works. Public Works project is not on the funded list. Um, there, because we uh, decided that we were gonna provide $3 million of um, additional funding so they didn't have to take away from their maintenance funding this year, uh, but their project wasn't funded. Got it. Supervisor Hartman. Uh, well, the board has approved um, how we define each of these priority areas, and you've just described the really exhaustive process of review. So it seems to me that uh, uh, for the board to come in and say this project should be inserted, um, we don't know what priority it was and we don't know what it would be displacing. So I'm a little <clears throat> uncomfortable as, as much as I appreciate what you have to say. And if I could, I think one of the things that I'm continuing to struggle with is when the balance between county priorities and community priorities, right? We all, as supervisors, we have districts and we represent communities. You know, I went from representing one unincorporated community, a large one, Orchid, to having seven unincorporated communities. I got to know uh, Supervisor Hartman's pain with that. And so there's, there's all these uh, priorities that are, um, you know, that are often number one for those, those communities. And so, um, and maybe this isn't gonna get solved in the CIP, but maybe this is a, a broader discussion for this board in the future, but some kind of maybe a unincorporated community investment fund or something where there are some funds there, because each uh, of these small communities have um, needs 
um, which compete with some of these larger um, needs. We have countywide needs like a jail. We have uh, mental health beds. We have so many other broad concerns um, that are always the most important thing. Um, but we also have unincorporated communities. I mean, like it or not, we, uh, we own that. We're their, their community, we're their, um, we're their city. And we have a certain responsibility to them. And that's where I'm continuing to try to be that squeaky wheel to see how we can deliver those services. There was a time in our county we did that. You know, you have things like the Page Juice Center, you know, the Goleta City uh, um, Community Center that was eventually a county building that eventually became, the, you know, once they became a city, they owned that. I mean, those are things that have happened down here in the South Coast that never happened in North County. So we're just trying to figure out a way to, you know, eventually deliver those same types of services. I realize it's a luxury to be talking about capital, and it only really is as Supervisor uh, Lavanino um, brought forward that we get to have this conversation now after so many years of, of finally starting to address some of the deferred maintenance issues. So I do acknowledge that. I'm, you know, I'm going to be a squeaky wheel because I do think this is an important conversation for us to have. But we have done a lot, a great, a lot of great work, and I do appreciate the departments and especially the CEO's office commitment to that. So I just wanted to add that. CEO um, Miyasato. Supervisor. Supervisor to the chair, I think that's a great comment to make. And when I think back of all the investment the county's made in the past, even in the cities of Santa Barbara, because that's where we are, um, I also look at that chart I keep showing of property taxes and property values. And that was all pre-recession when we were in a heyday. We've been living off our growth, which has been substantial and has helped us. And we funded, you, I, know you, I sound like a broken record, but I just want to be clear, we're living off of the growth of our property values, sales tax, and TOT, and that's funded the jail, fire tax shift, and the 18% poli maintenance policy, because those are things that have to get done, and they're priorities. But when and should things get better, and they will, as we know, I think it's prudent for the board, as Supervisor Nelson is indicating, to set some policies, and we could start that next year, on should there be a certain level of capital funding where the staff is saying, we really think you need to take care of things or really bad things could happen, and maybe another part for community projects so that we can balance what we feel like really needs to get done and then have some pot for should there be excess. I think that's a fair thing to do, and I think it's something we should consider. Okay, can I get a motion? Uh, to, not, we don't need a, do we need an official motion or just say three heads nod that we like this list? Um, in about an hour, hopefully, when we close up, you'll just okay, affirm we'll do the whole thing. Yes. Okay. All right. So that closes out our special issue, maintenance capital projects. Thank you very much to the team. This takes us to departmental budgets for policy and executive. Mr. Yee. We'd ask for public. Thank you, Chair Labanino and members of the board. As noted, the Policy and Executive Functional Group consists of County Council, the Board of Supervisors, the County Executive Office, and the General County Programs. The Functional Group makes up just 6% of overall county operating expenditures at 92 million and receives just over a quarter of the county's GFC at 105 million, largely due to the General County Programs Department, which receives GFC for a variety of board-approved policies and projects before these funds are transferred out to departments. The functional group also makes up just 2% of the county's FTE at 110. In the five-year operating revenue and GFC trend slide, you'll notice that the board and council are primarily funded by GFC and have shown just modest increases. The CEO, however, shows a significant increase in operating revenue in fiscal year 21-22, mainly due to the receipt of ARPA funding, but has remained somewhat flat since. General County Programs shows a steady increase of GFC in the first four years of the five-year period, but then decreases in fiscal year 24-25. These increases in GFC have been driven by increases to reserve funding and set-asides for a variety of uses, while the decrease in 24-25 is mainly attributable to the release of some of these set-asides that were intended to, to address future deficits and the release of these set-asides was used to help a number of departments that were being impacted by increases in internal rates and salaries and benefits costs. 
For operating expenditures, you'll see that the board and council have remained steady over the five-year period and mirror expenditures. I beg your pardon, mirror uh, revenues. For the CEO department, I want to highlight the fact that risk management funds are included here, given that risk is a division of the CEO, and therefore insurance premium payments paid by risk are included in the operating expenditures seen here. You'll notice the big spike in fiscal year 21-22. This was due to ARPA-related expenditures. In general county programs, we see some year-over-year -year variability that is mostly associated with contracts for items such as KPMG, Accenture and Workday, and the Courts Conflict Indigent Defense Contract, to name a few. Turning to the five-year uh, FTE trend, we see the Board of Supervisors uh, have held flat, while Council shows, shows just a slight increase over the two most recent years, where they added a Deputy County Council for litigation and a couple administrative support staff. The CEO department shows some pushes and pulls in FTE over the five-year period. Some additions include adding staff associated with a department reorg, staff to support cannabis licensing, and data related, to, uh, data related positions. While some of the positions moved out of the department include OEM positions that were part of the transfer to fire, and moving CSVTV to general services. Here we highlight the significant challenges and initiatives for the functional group. Challenges include the growing number of legal challenges and increased threats of litigation requiring support from multiple departments. <clears throat> Funding of increased litigation and settlement costs, state budget impacts on county budget, responding to new le state legislation, recruiting, retaining, and developing qualified staff, and effective succession planning. Major initiatives include providing legal trainings to county departments, leading the felony and competent to stand trial collaborative work group, facilitating a coordinated countywide rollout of care court, development of ballot language and completing the necessary steps for voter consideration of a change in cannabis tax methodology for the November 2024 election, and continuing to pursue broadband funding opportunities for infrastructure in underserved populations of the county. Next, we'll move into department summaries. In the county council department, you'll see the majority of their sources comes from GFC at 11 and a half million and funds their core legal services activities. Here we see that almost 100% of the board sources comes from GFC at 4.6 million and funds district and board support activities. In the CEO's office, major sources include miscellaneous revenue at close to 57 million which mostly consists of insurance premiums collected in the risk management fund. Intergovernmental uh, revenue is also a significant source at 22 and a half million, comprised mostly of ARPA revenue that gets transferred to other departments for board approved projects. And finally, we have general county programs whose primary source of funds is GFC that gets deposited in fund balance for board approved policies and projects. The fund balances are then drawn and transferred to departments to be used for their intended purpose. And that concludes the policy and executive functional group summary. Okay, I think next up is our county council, Rachel Van Mullum. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Good afternoon, I'm Rachel Van Mullum, county council. The county council's office is your in-house council. It's the county's internal law firm, and we are fortunate to have 47 staff members that provide exceptional service to your clients, our clients, your board, the CEO, all the county officers and departments that you've heard from this week, and special districts. We may seem like a fairly large firm until you learn everything that we do and the variety of the area of areas of practice. Every year at budget time, I try to think of a way to demonstrate that variety. So I looked at what our staff would be doing in any given week. We'd have two attorneys in court, one for probate and one for conservatorship calendar. Eight attorneys attending and advising special districts and commissions, such as the Air Pollution Control District, SBCAG, LAFCO, Assessment Appeals Board, Legislative Program Committee, 
Debt Advisory Committee, Planning Commission, Psychiatric Health Facility Board, Historic Landmarks Commission, Ag Preserve Advisory Committee, and Community Corrections Partnership. We'd have two attorneys at the Civil Service Commission representing a county department in an employment matter, four attorneys in dependency court handling child welfare trials on behalf of social services, two attorneys in court for gun violence restraining orders, pitches motions, bail bonds, restraint motions, and dangerous dog trials, multiple attorneys providing trainings to county departments on Public Records Act, Brown Act, CEQA, and litigation, three attorneys reviewing behavioral wellness and social services and public health contracts because it's contract season and it's almost the end of the fiscal year. One attorney in our conference room conducting a deposition in a personal injury case, five attorneys handling motions and discovery and advising on pre-litigation claims, and at least five attorneys reviewing board letters, contracts, and ordinances for each docketing week. For our last regular board meeting on April 2nd, this meant we had 15 attorneys preparing for closed session and reviewing 40 open session items that involved 15 county departments and special districts. And we have legal office professionals that assist all of these functions and keep up with required court filings. And that doesn't cover everything. That's just a typical week in our office. Our operating budget is the 13.4 million. Most of that is general fund. And I'm gonna skip ahead to uh, highlight some of our accomplishments. We had a great year. We litigated large time intensive cases in addition to our regular court calendars of child welfare and probate, conservatorships, and assessment appeals. And we did all of this while also advising your board, the CEO, county officers, and all of the client departments on major programs and projects. To highlight some of our major projects in this year, on this slide you'll see our work on the emergency medical services, the residential eviction ordinance, as well as the Isla Vista Bluff safety fencing. Our office handles a lot of litigation. Last year, our office resolved 25 civil rights, personal injury, and employment cases, with 64% of those case cases with no county payout. We prevailed in 12 out of 13 on our dependency appeals and four civil litigation appeals. We also defended other significant litigation, including property tax assessment appeals and our litigation on the Thomas Fire and 19 debris flow. Overall, we met our performance measures and implemented the KPMG recommendations. We met with the CEO and department heads to receive feedback increased our external trainings to departments and implemented more formal litigation debriefings with risk management. And we implemented our case management system. In the next year, in addition to continuing these, litigating these major cases and ongoing calendars, we're gonna continue these same goals with our case management system, training, and annual feedback. On performance measures, I'll point out our significant progress towards the county's goal of the 5% rebalancing by 2028. We saved over 200,000 with these efficiencies this year. And we met our goal of um, resolving 60% of our cases for no county payout. We also implemented the KPMG recommendations, including customizing our case management system software, um, implementing new caseload and activity tracking. And the final one on this slide, which is assessing the training needs of our legal office professionals. We started that last year by providing internal trainings, and this year we're adding additional program training using external trainers that will come in and assist with that. We had no service level reductions and that's in large part due to this general fund contribution, so thank you to the CEO's office, and thank you for the assistance to the budget team throughout the year. And before I conclude, I do want to give a special thanks to all of our staff at County Council. Um, they are so talented and hardworking and they really care about the work that we do. Earlier this year, 
our CEO asked each department head to pick a theme song for our retreat. And I picked this one, you'll recognize it from last year. And I was pleased that everyone was easy, it was easy for everyone to guess it was mine. <laughs> because it really does capture how we strive to support you and all of our clients and colleagues. But this year I was thinking I wanted to add an additional message. Uh, my predecessor, predecessor, Mike Gazzoni, used to say, three years from now, what will you wish the county had done today? So yes, bring us your problems and we will help you, absolutely. But also reach out to us and let us help you plan ahead and be creative. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, great job. <laughs> I, I think Thank it's you. really impressive the work that you guys do. Um, other counties um, farm out a lot of the specialties that, that we do in-house here, and it ends up saving us um, thousands, if not millions of dollars. And I know that um, you know the work that you guys all do uh, you know, helps keep our rates lower, especially um, with some of the um, claims that, that happen against our county. So you're, you're, I know I'm impressed, and I think the entire, I speak for most of us that really appreciate the work that all of you are doing. Thank you. Supervisor Caps. Yeah, thank you. I uh, just wanted to add my thanks as well and just the way in which your office jumps in with a crisis and there's that can do, let's help kind of, uh, we certainly had them in my district this last year and I really appreciate the, the help and the work and just sort of that, that attitude of like, okay, this is important, thanks. I'll just say I think we have the best law firm in the county. I mean, we've, we go up against the well-funded private firms, and uh, I think today was another example. With the, the I, I always get nervous when I get an email that says uh, update from Rachel, you know, <laughs> and you're like, uh-oh, what happened? But this was good news today. And uh, when Rachel calls me, I have her always start off by saying, okay, it's not bad news. And then we start our conversation. So I, I appreciate, um, after we, when you were reading through all those things that you guys were doing, the entire department was doing, I, I feel guilty sometimes of calling with some little stuff. But like you said, it's the little stuff that keeps us out of trouble. So um, appreciate all the work that all of you do. Because I do, we all attend SBK, APCD, and sometimes we forget, you know, there's somebody sitting there trying to keep us out of trouble. So it's nice. Supervisor Hartman. Just wanted to add, uh, I think there's exceptional teamwork in your department, and I think that we get even more as a result of that. You really know how to leverage everybody's ability to get greater than the, some of the parts, so thank you. All right, thank you thank so Thank you, much. thank you to the board. Yeah. Now you, gotta, now you gotta come back here and go back to work, so. <laughs> All right, next up is the Board of Supervisors, Nancy Anderson. Yeah, I'm, you know better than that. That's a massive increases. Good afternoon, Nancy. Good afternoon, Chair Lavanino and members of the board. Uh, this is the budget presentation for the Board of Supervisors. Uh, this information was compiled by Don Holden, our CEO um, business manager, and your district staff. Uh, so thank you to them for, um, for this information. Key services include all five district offices and the board general support budget unit. The operating budget for the Board of Supervisors is $4.6 million, and that is nearly all funded through a general fund contribution of $4.6 million. There are 19.08 FTE assigned to the board offices. This slide shows the staffing level for the past five years. The increase of 0.2 FTE from the last fiscal year is related to one position in District 4, changing from 0.6 to 0.8 FTE. This slide shows the operating budget over a five-year period. The budget increase of 343,000 from last fiscal year is primarily in the board general support budget unit and is related to general liability insurance costs. 
Uh, it doesn't happen often, but on occasion, there are claims that reference the board or board's actions specifically that is not associated to a specific department. In past practice for rate development, those have been assigned to the board general support budget unit. Uh, these increases are related to two cases, in particular Rancho La Laguna and ExxonMobil. Here are a few of the anticipated accomplishments noted by the district staff. The board adopted prudent budget policy and promoted long-term fiscal planning for sustainability, made significant investments to address homelessness, partnered with rural counties representatives of California or RCRC and SBCAG to obtain grant funding uh, for broadband infrastructure, supported investments in streets, sidewalks and lighting, and facilitated public discussion on numerous major community focus areas. Board district staff also noted a few department goals and objectives for next fiscal year. The board offices plan to efficiently and effectively use public resources and maintain long-term fiscal health and sustainability of our county, strive to promote equality and increase accessibility and inclusion efforts, support efforts to maintain and enhance safety net services that protect the most vulnerable within our community, Support efforts to foster countywide sustainability by promoting economic stability and environmental protection, and prioritize infrastructure needs such as roads, drainage, and water storage. Some of the emerging issues the board offices are currently facing include, but are not limited to, ensuring the long-term financial stability of the county while addressing community priorities and compliance with mandates, continuing to work towards a more inclusive and equitable future for the county, and addressing the lack of affordable and workforce housing near uh, job centers in Santa Barbara County. There are no service level reductions with the additional GFC allocation uh, to cover the insurance rate increases. In summary, the Board of Supervisors works to provide quality public services to the people of Santa Barbara County in response to their need for a safe, healthy, and sustainable environment and to establish and maintain a workforce which re reflects the diversity of the community. And finally, the quote for the Board Offices is from Matama Gande, the future depends on what you do today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. We were voting on which district came up with that quote. <laughs> we all guessed first. <laughs> I, I didn't. I As didn't. 14th century philosopher <laughs> once said. All right. Cool. Yeah, Thank mine would have been Jalalad and Rumi or something. <laughs> um, any questions for Nancy? All right. Great. Thank you very much. That moves us to the county executive office, which Nancy is also handling. Nancy will be doing that, but I want to just take the opportunity to introduce the item and just say a few words. And just, that's really, first of all, to thank your board for supporting the county executive office and all the changes that we've gone through. And also to thank your chiefs of staff. So people may not know that, but the chiefs of staff are those key people in your offices who really help the organization keep moving ahead. So I just want to say this thank you to them. Um, we wouldn't be a strong organization without them. And thanks to our department heads who work collaboratively or try to with us and help advance their own goals, but also the countywide mission. And I didn't hear too many complaints this year, at least to my face, so I appreciate that as well. Um, this has been a really challenging and exciting year for us. We've had a lot of changeover. If you see some faces you typically had seen in the past, they're not here because they've retired or they've left the organization. In the county executive office, the median number of years of tenure in my office is now two, the median. Um, so myself, Jacqueline, and Chelsea are the old timers in the office, which is hard to believe. Um, and when you look at your, our slides, you'll see a lot of the things that Nancy will review that you've heard from other departments, and that's because you know our office is responsible for what we're responsible for and then helping the departments along. And the, the top people in my office who do that, who direct, coordinate, mediate, cajole, and simply herd the cats, our assistant CEOs, Wade Horton, Tanya Heitman, and Jeff Brapwell and they're assisted by Nicole Parmalee, Lindsay Walter, and Ted Tabor. But as a department, we have our own responsibilities and mission, and you see the budget staff here as well. Um, Paul Clementi and his whole budget team, Jacqueline Alexander, the clerk of the board, who have expertly adapted to this new technology um, without too much of a hitch. <laughs> Greg Milligan and the risk management team, you've seen all the discussions among all the departments about the high insurance rates affecting all their departments, and Greg's had to manage that. 
Brittany Heaton and the Cannabis Licensing Team, thank you to them. Jasmine McGinty, who oversees our legislative program. Kelsey Butita, our Communications Manager and PIO, who just came off maternity leave, and I told her you don't have to be at work this week, but she couldn't stop herself, and so she's back. Jackie Ruiz, who helps her, Kathy Chizik and Helica Ramirez, and we said Don Holden, our business manager, and Stephen Yee, who put our budget together, and last but not least, Nancy Anderson, who through all the craziness helps oversee all the activities pertaining to the CEO's office. So thank you to all. Uh, Nancy has almost been full-time on the Workday Project as well, so I appreciate her time doing that. And so with that, Nancy will present our budget. All right, again, good afternoon, uh, Supervis uh, Chair Lavanino and members of the board. This is the budget presentation for the County Executive Office. Our department is comprised of two budget programs, County Management and Risk Management. Our total operating budget is $68.4 million, with approximately 81% or $55.5 million relating to risk management. Our general fund contribution is $7.6 million, and transfers from general county programs total $669,600. We have 44 full-time equivalents. General county program transfers include $100,000 for criminal justice consultant contracts, $431,500 for cannabis administration, $138,000 1,100 for Countywide Public Rec Records Act program in risk management. Here's a staffing trend for the past five years. We currently have 44 FTE, which is one more than last fiscal year. The change is one FTE that was added in risk management in the current year to administer the countywide PRA activity that was funded with existing budget resources. This slide shows operating, our operating budget over a five-year period. Uh, the operating budget increased $2.8 million from last fiscal year. That is primarily the result of insurance and other rate increases. And as previously mentioned, most of the operating budget, or 81%, is in inclusive of the man risk management funds. Listed here are some of our anticipated accomplishments for the current year. Under our goal to improve the criminal justice system, we began development and implementation of new diversion programming and strategies to, to support safe jail populations. And we obtained state grant funding to address incompetent to stand trial or IST efforts. To foster financial and organizational excellence, we hired and onboarded several new department directors, completed a regional comprehensive economic development strategy, developed and launched the Your County, Your Heroes video series, uh, and completed the final six department operational reviews through PP KPMG. The efforts to um, provide coordinated ec uh, community service delivery, we saw, we oversaw completion of, in, of construction and began services of Hope Village and La, La Posada sites, and issued an RFP for development of workforce and affordable housing options. To make strategic investments in facilities and infrastructure, we completed a debt issuance for numerous critical infra infrastructure projects, provided leadership oversight to the Workday ERP system implementation, completed the audiovisual upgrades in both hearing rooms and partnered with um, RCRC to obtain federal grant funding for broadband infrastructure to underserved areas of the county. A few of our department goals and objectives for next fiscal year include coordinating and leading a felony incompetent to stand trial collaborative work group, facilitating the coordinated uh, countywide rollout of care court, uh, continuing to advance criminal justice initiatives, continuing to pursue broadband middle and last mile projects, monitor and track prog progress on the COP debt issuance, uh, identify alternative solutions to mitigate general fund pr projected deficits, assess and monitor the implementation of KPMG operational review recommendations for departments, develop workforce and affordable housing options on county owned land, and support the implementation of CalAIM reform in the jail and juvenile halls. A few of the emerging issues we are currently focused on are the state budget and potential impacts on the county, responding to significant new legislation and addressing the growing costs of jail operations as, as well as other costs countywide. Here are just a few of our performance measures. We track and try to project general fund revenues consistently under a 3% variance. The estimated actual for the current year is very, very close to target at 0.1%. In accordance with board policy, we strive to keep the strategic or rainy day reserve at 8% uh, of general fund operating revenue. 
On the third measure down, we began tracking uh, this year, the progress uh, being made annually uh, to review each cannabis operator's compliance efforts with a target of 100% of the 46 operators for next fiscal year. And the last measure tracks the number and completion of, of rate, the rate of general liability claims received within the year to ensure responsive, timely processing. These are the top four KPMG priority recommend recommendations for the CEO's office. Strategic management and performance measurement is in progress. Renew 22 was reset this year with new big picture goals and renamed Renew. Uh, we plan to continue efforts in this area over the next fiscal year. Coordination structure um, between ACOs and departments was completed this year with the CEO reorganization and alignment of ACOs to functional groups. Uh, change management and continuous improvement is partially completed. The new Innovate SBC Black Belt Facilitation Program launched in late November and we have the first project is currently underway. Risk monitoring and reporting is partially completed. Risk management has created data reports and is working to develop department dashboards with this information so that it's readily available to them. We had no service level reductions with, this, with the addition of the $71,400 to cover the rate increases. And in summary, we plan to continue to focus on several large initiatives mentioned previously, monitor the state budget issues, assess and respond to new legislation, and continue to provide oversight to departments and carry out the board's policy and direction. And consistent with the budget theme this year, our quote is, prudence is the compass that guides us through the maze of challenges on our journey towards progress by Melinda Gates. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Supervisor Hartman. Um, yes, could, could you or CEO Miyasato talk a, mo a bit more about the big picture goals and, and eventually how the board will play into that? I, Supervisor Hartman through the chair. So um, knowing that the Renew 22 is coming to end, last year um, we had multiple focus groups, including um, a great deal of time with the department heads, uh, to come up with and revise what we call the big picture goals associated to Renew. So we extended them past the five years where they ended uh, in, in predominantly the same form so that we had a goal, those big picture goals that are across departments that make sense to track. So all departments are required to um, track those and they will be in the what we call the D pages of the, of the recommended budget. So you'll see those in totality. And then our, our office um, compiles that information so that we have a countywide look uh, at what that has achieved. Uh, so, um, so going forward, there's, um, there going, there's going to be more discussions around a really countywide strategic planning and how that builds into departments aligning with board priorities and um, that in, in gets um, worked into the budget and uh, so there's more effort that needs to be put there and we'll be spending some time on that. And supervisors to add on that. Um, in the CEO's overview this yesterday on slide 21, we actually list what those are. Any other questions? Okay, very good. I think that, thank you very much, Nancy. I think that takes us to general county programs and fund balances. We kick it back to Paul. Thank you, Chair Lavignino. So the purpose of the general county programs is to account for countywide types of activities. They're not typically associated with a specific department's function. Key services include funding support to other agencies such as LAFCO, debt service payments, and other board commitments, and contracts administration, including the conflict defense contract. General county programs also contains the key discretionary fund balance components for the general fund. <coughs> Operating expenditures for this program in 24-25 are 5.9 million. This amount includes budget for the conflict defense contracts, Ernst & Young Disaster Recovery Assistance, Innovate SBC program, LAFCO support, ERP implementation costs, and other operating program costs. These costs are offset by 4.9, approximately 4.9 million in GFC, as well as minor operating revenues and release of some committed fund balance. 
The capital cost of 1.7 million is the annual subscription cost for the Workday software. And there we see that. We see the preliminary 24-25 operating budget of 5.9 million, quite a bit lower than prior years. Uh, one of the reasons for this is, is that when this preliminary budget was loaded, there were still unknowns related to the Accenture Workday implementation costs next fiscal year. There's still work to be done before phases one and two go live, uh, which will require additional implementation costs and are currently being negotiated. So there are minimal contracted implementation costs loaded in this number, but the project team will be coming back to your board soon with an update on the project and a contract revision. Final numbers will be built into the final budget and uh, there are adequate funds in the ERP fund balance to cover the planned increase. The operating budget number is also lower next fiscal year because KPMG will be wrapping up the rest of their department reviews this fiscal year with just a remaining capstone project expected to be completed in 24-25. So those contracted costs will be going away. Accomplishments in this program include continued funding support for initiatives and projects, and uh, just point out the launch of a new Innovate SBC facilitation program, which connects trained black belt facilitators with internal county teams to tackle complex interconnected problems um, that, that might cross multiple teams, divisions, or departments. Next year, the goals of this program are very similar. No service level reductions. In summary, we will continue to manage these countywide programs that provide assistance to all departments, as well as funding for current and future uh, projects and commitments. And this last slide shows the key general fund discretionary fund balances held in general county programs. This does not encompass fund balances maintained within department budgets, uh, as all departments also have their own balances for specific purposes. Most of these accounts are associated with a board approved policy and are committed to specific purposes. Uh, many of the accounts are used to receive general fund contribution and then pass it through to other departments, such as the 18% deferred maintenance, roads baseline and facilities maintenance baseline, the hazardous tree mitigation and the Northern Branch Jail operations accounts. Uh, and just to point out a few specific accounts, the Capital account, that's where funding allocated towards capital projects over multiple years is accumulated, transferred out, and rolled over at year end. The technology replacement funds, uh, that funds countywide technology initiatives. It's where funding for projects like the transition to Microsoft 365 came from. It's also where we have earmarked funds for the DIMS electronic discovery implementation you heard about from the public safety departments yesterday. The ERP system balance is where we fund the ERP implementation project out of. That 24-25 recommended decreases will get larger and the remaining balance on the right smaller once the additional implementation costs I mentioned earlier will come back to your board. Uh, and, and the final thing I'll point out is a strategic reserve you can see on there with a $1.6 million increase to remain fully funded per policy at 45.6 million. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Nope. Do we have any public comment on this? Chair Lavanino, Great. members of the board, we have no requests to speak from the public on the policy and executive functional group. Okay. We kick it back to CEO Mia Santo for a budget workshop summary. Chair, I just want to make sure my staff are ready. We had something prepared. Ah, this is how good they are. We already have the summary well, done, and I'm. I was going to say we finish. just we just highlighted we just them thirty and seconds he, ago. Uh, so. Well, let me, let's see if Mr. Clemente did his magic or not. We were working on it, and let's see. You want to take a minute? I think they're just trying to make sure it gets onto the computer and posted appropriately. Well, I can ask you a question anyway that I was going to ask. Sure. But I know you know the answer, too, I'm pretty sure. So on contingency, where it said $5 million in contingency, so last year, I think... Did we burn through, it was like 4.7, we used it all though, correct, or pretty close to all of it? We roll that money over, so it's not like we reappropriate it, so if we haven't, we haven't used it, we roll it over for the next okay. year. Are we ready, Mr. Clemente?
Oh, we're ready to go. There we are. Okay. Can you give me a Can you give me a copy? So thank you board members. Um, thank you for these last two days of budget workshops. Next slide. And this is just a summary of the things we've already discussed over the last two days. We started on um, Tuesday that we are using prior year set-asides but continue fiscally sound budget. We've avoided service level reductions for the sixth year. We're releasing the ongoing $6.6 .6 million to balance in the general fund. We know that costs continue to rise without, um, while revenue growth has flattened, no expansions are recommended and um, we continue to make investment in the board's priorities and capital projects to meet community needs. So this is a chart we showed you at the beginning of the budget workshops and it shows this $33.8 million of general fund that was not allocated and we we're showing you how it was allocated and we discussed these through uh, the last couple of days. CIP projects list with the board just affirmed, Hope Village, um, capital funding to reduce ongoing debt service, Storm's disaster, uh, disaster Fund, which, which was in the CIP list, money for the jail medical set-aside, DRC, future year deficit set-aside of one-time money, and the courthouse funds we just talked about, we're using that for the courthouse roof replacement project, and Prop 172, we are basically using all of that balance, some for the Northern Branch Jail Pod, which was also in the CIP list, and more set-aside for disability rights. This is just to show you that although the board has not um, granted or we have not recommended ongoing expansions of staff from the general fund, next year you're gonna see 118 more positions than you did in the adopted budget. And that is because these positions were either authorized during this current year or they're going to be authorized in next year's budget and they're they are funded from other sources. So special revenue funds, grants, et cetera. And you see the largest one on that list if you look on the right is social services with 71 staff, which you um, largely already approved in this current year. So we took, we listened carefully to your board input and the one action item that we wanted to follow up on was about the parks, trails, and open space set aside. So in 21-22, you set aside funds for various uses and including the rec master plan projects which are yet to be determined. 1.5 million was earmarked for a, a recreational um, project in Santa Maria, that's still earmarked. Two million was set aside for the San Marcos Foothills project and that was completed and spent. And there's two million, there's two million in North County and 1.5 million in South County buckets. So if you see the current allocation on the first column, North County's two million dollars. The rec master plan, ex uh, CSD expects to use 225,000. Uh, they took a board letter earlier saying they would use it. They haven't drawn that money yet but they still intend to use it leaving 1.775 million left. On the South County, the same thing, 1.5 was initially allocated. CSD said they'll need 225 from that bucket as well for the rec master plan. There was a project for the Isle of Vista Bluffs for the fence, leaving 1,095,000. We heard in your board's discussion a, a request to allocate $800,000 of the North County bucket for the ATP project in Santa Ynez Valley um, and we, um, asked the first district what an amount might be on the CARP bluffs, and it was 800,000. That's for your board's discussion right now, leaving that remaining balance. So our uh, request for you today at this time is if you wanna refine those and then we can actually get them into the bucket, into the um, earmarked set-asides. It would uh, be in the, um, our reserve accounts, but if you want further refinement, we can do that. And so really it's for your board to make those decisions today if you'd like. Supervisor Hartman. Um, I, I don't have anything to say on, on this summary, but I did want to mention one other thing following up on the arts funding. Um, over the last year, Supervisor Williams and I have been chipping away at a strategy to engage the county bowl on uh, their bowl's arts subsidy contributions that support our arts commission. And uh, uh, the CEO of the bowl, Rick Bowler, asked us to submit a formal request from our board, ideally, um, that, that asks them to explore this. So the, the Arts Commission uh, receives a $50, 50 cent 
surcharge per ticket that sold at the bowl concert. This was added in 2011. It was only 25 cents at the time, so it was raised to 50 cents in 2015. There was a cap of $50,000, uh, but the cap is subject to CPI adjustment every five years, uh, so it'll be next in 2025. Um, separately, the Bowl Foundation has a dollar surcharge per ticket that it does to its own arts contributions. So the 50 cent subsidy surcharge is part of a lease agreement between the county and the foundation. And if it only lives there, it would require some agreed upon uh, amendment to the lease to increase the charge. So before the director can discuss that with his board, he really needs a request from our board to ask them to explore this. So as, as part of direction, um, I would like uh, a board, a, a letter to come from our board as a whole, asking them to explore this to see if we can uh, perhaps come on par with what they already do. That's fine, and we can amend that as a direction for today as well. Excellent, Supervisor Williams. Yeah, I just wanted to speak in support of doing that as soon as possible because the other thing the board, the Bowl Foundation needs to negotiate with is the is Golden Voice. Right, the, the, uh, and to make some kind of arrangement like that happen. Well, I'm looking at our director, Armas, out there, so I'm sure he will be eager to help and get that letter written as soon as possible. Okay. And the other, is there any, if, if the board is happy with this, this is how we will proceed. We will put um, in further earmarks on the ATP project, the San Inez Valley, and in, in hope that we get the project is that this would be the match. If we don't, it would go back into the balance and same with the Carpinteria Bluffs. I do wanna note to the board that would leave this remaining balance. We don't know what the um, rec master plan is going to say. The projects are still to yet, yet to be determined. It does reduce the amount that you have available for those potential uh, prospective projects. Cool, Supervisor Hart. Uh, just, so just a start. Uh, minor refinement, so it would be 800, uh, 300 would go to the grant application for pre-construction activities and then 500 later on if, if uh, we actually get it. That would be a second grant application, but it would be a match for that. Supervisor, I would try to give you the most, or give the project the most flexibility, so I wouldn't pinpoint it in case anything changes between now and then. Thank Supervisor you. Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Chair uh, Avenue. I'm I'm comfortable with that. I know I, I asked for it, get, you know, so we can see the numbers, but this seems very reasonable and appropriate. Okay, I'm happy and been encouraging Santa Maria to continue to move forward on their project. It's just like any other project we have in the county. It's tied up in a lot of other things, but they are moving forward. So, and I, I think for your, you know, for to just keep ourselves in a reality check. I think every year when we come to this okay. discussion, we will recheck these things or else they would continue to live on and Makes sense. people may not know about that. Okay. So with that, go to the next slide. That concludes our um, workshops. We will finalize revenue and expenditure recommendations. And again, things still could change as we work towards getting the, um, the recommended budget out into your board for June hearings. Like I said, the auditors in our auditor's office and our office will complete the budget. Uh, hearings are scheduled for June 11th and 13th if necessary. And like I said, we are continuing to look at revenue and expenditure projections. So the recommended actions to receive and file the preliminary budget. Um, you provided this direction about getting that letter out um, uh, to the, the Bull Foundation and the CEO. You've affirmed the priority projects. And uh, so it's really those that direction and the CEQA determinations. Okay. So before we proceed to general public comment, we need to act on departmental item number one regarding this preliminary budget and budget development workshops. Are there any requests to speak from the public on departmental item number one? Chair Levin, you know, members of the board, we have no additional requests to speak on departmental item number one. Okay, so then we will proceed with public comment. Chair Levin, you, you said there was none. <laughs> members of so the board. Before we proceed to general public uh, comment, can we? I read what they put in front of me. I am a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> can we? All right, so we a need motion? a motion. Motion for items A, B, C, D, and E. I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. 
Moved and seconded. Can we have a little further discussion? I would thought that a little additional feedback based on what we heard over sure. the two days would might be appropriate. So I'll let you lead off. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, one of the things that you know was a topic, of course, was um, the sheriff's request on the fentanyl um, team, and um, I just. I know that we don't have that in this budget, and I, again, we don't have any, anything for any expansions really in this budget. Um, but I would like to see us maybe um, examine something that incentivizes the sheriff to fill those positions that are, are empty. Um, and then if that those are filled, if there's some way with, if we have an excess Prop 172 dollars that we'd actually start to look at maybe releasing some of those for that fentanyl team. Um, I'm not ready to support it right now just because I think with over 100 open positions, it would be foolish for us to add additional positions. If he wants to reallocate resources to a fentanyl team, he, he can do that. Um, he's got, um, obviously, capacity because he's able to keep other positions unfilled right now. So um, that would be something I would like to see maybe come back uh, later on and if there's something we can put in place that can incentivize that for this board. Um, I'd feel a lot more comfortable in the, f in the future supporting that team once we uh, had those positions filled. Um, the other one was, you know, I brought it up earlier, was this, um, the capital improvement plan. Um, the Clark Avenue uh, improvements um, are actually in the public works presentation as one of their goals for this year, but yet um, a big piece of that's still unfunded in the capital improvement plan. It was actually on slide 12 as one of their, um, their projects that they were, had for a goal in 23, 24, or 24, 25. So um, I know there's no money right now in the CIP. Didn't, I didn't see the board jump at it, but um, as we evaluate um, the numbers as they come in between now and, and the June budget hearing, if, if we can take a look at that. Um, I don't want to delay that. That's only $500,000 of a two and a half million dollar project. We want to keep it moving along. Um, and so I'd hate to see it get delayed by another year by not having funding on um, this budget cycle. So um, I know that's not gonna be decided today, but I'm asking um, staff to consider those things as they evaluate the budget between now and June. Supervisor Hartman. Well, um, this year clearly is is a status quo budget, uh, and I think um, we we owe a lot to the CEO's office that, that the liability insurance that's kind of alarming to see how much that's gone up and how uh, you worked with the departments, and I think the department heads are to be commended for really coming, uh, respecting that. It, it's not pleasant, but uh, it's not just this year. We're looking out several <coughs> years, and so any extra money, one-time money, we, we really need to sock it away so that we don't have to, uh, you know, have service level reductions in the future. So, uh, you know, barring some great windfall, I don't expect that we're going to have a big change between now and when we actually have our budget hearings. So, I just, it, it's a, a, a tight three years, but uh, I, I feel like our CEO and, and budget director have been guiding us to withstand this pressure. So thank you for that. Supervisor Williams. Well, I, in the past, we have done a over higher trigger with Prop 172 funds. I think we're not, we don't really have much excess Prop one. 172 funds, you know, or at least you are have plans in the budget for the for those, correct? Supervisor Williams, through the chair, we do still have a pot of funds that we keep aside that we keep rolling over for the sheriff for overhire. Should he have an ability to overhire? Oh, be, so because the overhire incentive last year was not a, fully utilized, it's still there. Yeah, I mean, I think we should we we need to keep on finding a way to. Over, over higher um, because uh, again, it's um, our overtime costs are so large that we need to find a way. Of course, part of a, an over higher would be the sheriff willing to use some of those over high, o, overtime funds as as over higher if we, you know, if if the CEO releases 172 funds as over higher. I mean, I think that's a reasonable thing to. To ask supervisors, and just along those lines, to clarify, we have a pot of two million dollars that the board approved for overhire. We also use it for the incentives. We use it at the end of the year if he's over budget. Um, so that's what the fund is. And Paul says there is two million dollars there today. 
That's, that's correct, and we try to plan for and replenish that amount as possible. So there is a planned two million bucket next fiscal year as well from the 172. It is a one-time balance, but um, it is to assist them when they reach those over-hire situations to encourage them to continue hiring because of the turnover and to help them balance that out. Well, that's a good news, bad news thing. It means, it means they never got into a position last year to actually be able to use the funds or to, because they couldn't hire enough folks but at least it means that we have something in place if they can uh, this year, um, which, uh, you know, sounds like they hope that it will happen, and I hope, I share that hope because we, we desperately need more officers. Supervisor Capps. Yeah, thank you. I just want to acknowledge the diligence that went into all this work, and uh, as even though this isn't as dynamic as a um, workshop as it was, certainly last year and years past when things are flush and we're sort of jockeying on how to um, spend the remaining funds. Um, I just want to, I, it could be so much worse and I'm very cognizant of that with the, the sunsetting of so many funds related to COVID and the American Rescue Plan and so many jurisdictions, local school districts are issuing pink slips and so I am just very cognizant of the fact that this isn't as fun as it usually is or we hope it could be but it's certainly not the dire situation, and that really is a um, tribute to careful planning because of that, that those funds that came in. And with careful planning, I just want to reiterate my desired interest with the CEO's office. Uh, she knows this well, as does Nancy Anderson, but just um, a focus on economic development. And again, I don't know where that lives and how we do that. It's something that Supervisor Nelson and I speak about of just what are the pipelines for the future to bring in more revenue streams? REACH just came out with quite a bit of information, including a, a talent pipeline report for our county. So just, uh, again, I'm interested in, and would be a partner in any sort of efforts uh, to make sure that we're always kind of keeping, um, to, to Rachel's point, three years ahead, uh, where, are we, where are we headed uh, economically and how can we generate some more revenue? Thank you. And I'd just like to close on that. Yeah, it is a tight year, but it is, it, it, and it's because of a lot of things that we're doing. We're tackling an immense amount of, I mean, for people that come in here and talk about, you know, and I understand this, is, it, people show up for whatever they're interested in. But when we have a board hearing day and somebody shows up for an item and that's the one thing they're concerned about, it'd be great to come to the budget and see all the things that we have to fund and keep going and not all of it's exciting, uh, but it needs to be done. So, you know, if you think about, I was just looking at 5.5 million for La Posada and Hope Village. That would have been money that was going somewhere else, but a board made a decision that, you know, we can't live like this anymore. We can't have people living out in the street anymore. So we have to do something mental health crisis, uh, criminal justice reform, all the things that we're tackling are taking a lot of the money, and I think it's money well spent. We're not, you know, we're not buying <laughs> lottery tickets. So um, I think the money's going in the right place. And also a message to the employees. We're in negotiations. I don't want to get too far into it, but, you know, we understand Inflation. We understand what's what's happened in the position that you're in. You're being asked to do more with less. We we understand that. I also want to point out that I think this is maybe the sixth or seventh year in a row we've had no service level reductions. And there's a lot of people that work now at the county that have lived in a world where there never were service level reductions. But when they happen, they're ugly and it's super sad. And that's why, at least for me, and I think I speak for all of us, we're doing everything we possibly can to make sure that that doesn't happen. We're trying to take money, and when we see that we're short in the next year, push it out to the next year, because, you know, while everybody would like to get large increases, um, the reality is uh, m the number one priority for me is just to make sure everybody has a job, and everybody's here next year that was here this year, and we continue to do the work that we're charge to do. So uh, we're going to do our best. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. You know, we will see you in June. CEO Miyasato. Thank you, board members. And I just want to honor what um, Supervisor Nelson said to, so we're clear on your direction. 
Would you like that direction to come from the board? You want something to come back to talk uh, with the sheriff about incentivizing filling positions? And when would you like that to come back? Well, it seems appropriate, you know, that I guess maybe that we have the $2 million already there for him. It, it's already built in, but um, I think I'd like to understand that a little bit better when those triggers hit, you know. Um, and would you like to have that come back but with the budget, before the budget, or you're just? I, just think, I think with the budget, it's appropriate. I don't think it needs to be a separate item. And then your, your request to have staff evaluate the Clark Avenue project, is that? I'm just hoping that gets evaluated with the additional CIP projects. Okay. Um, it's just between now and um, final budget adoption. Between now and final budget, thank you. And and let's just make sure that that is a uh, within boundaries. So the, the 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 point is not to try to put more money in the two million dollar pot that didn't get used last year. It's to it's to to see what the criteria is so that that uh, you know um, uh, before before release. Yeah, I, I think we might be already giving him what he's asked for. Um, it might already exist. So I just want to understand it a little bit better. Okay, I think now we're ready for a vote, right? So can I get a motion? Small pieces of, sorry, I keep okay. doing this. Sorry, but, but just to let you know, the CIP book that comes to you, the Capital Improvement Program, is going to come to you in May. I'm looking around. Yeah, Chris is saying yes, it's coming in May. So just to let you know, the full book that has the projects that you didn't even see, so they're funded by the department's own um, sources, are coming to you. It's coming to you in May. Cool. So we need a motion for A, B, C, D, and E with you, all the direction that's been. Mr. Chair, you you have a, mo a motion on the floor. All right. Well, let's get to it. <laughs> I want to call for a voice vote then, just to make you guys go through an exercise. <laughs> Chair Levin, members of the board, that is a motion by Supervisor Hartman and a second by Supervisor Williams. Uh, roll call. Supervisor Nelson? Aye. Supervisor Williams? Aye. Supervisor Caps? Aye. Supervisor Hartman? Aye. And Chair Levin, no. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. All right. And we are adjourned until Tuesday, April 23rd. Are we here? Back here. Santa Maria. We are in Santa, in Santa Maria. Santa Barbara. Where am I? We're back. So we, we have to ask for general public comment on items not on today's agenda. Is anybody, uh, there's, uh, is there any general public comment? Chair Levin, you know, members of the board. Yes, we do have three requests to speak on general public comment. I, I do believe some or all may have left, but I will still uh, call on them. Uh, is Christopher Donati, great, to be followed by Christina Rubio. Christopher. All right. Hi, Christopher. Good afternoon, Chairman Lavagnino and members of the board. Uh, I know it's been a long day, so I'll try to be concise. Um, I've been a county employee for 15 years. I currently work uh, in the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office, uh, and I'm a supervisor for the Public Guardian's Office and Public Administrator. And uh, in case you're wondering, uh, Harry Hagen's a pretty awesome boss. <laughs> Um, so uh, my wife is also a county employee. She's a supervisor for behavioral wellness. Um, we have the luxury and, and the benefit of living uh, in Supervisor Caps's District 2. Um, we both greatly enjoy uh, having a career that allows us to be connected to the community and to give back and uh, be able to pay the bills as well. Um, unfortunately, I am here to talk about the paying the bills part. Uh, our last contract uh, saw us with a COLA of about 7.5% plus other factors. Uh, the California Legislature Legislative Analysis Office estimates that during that time, inflation was roughly 20% for California. Uh, we've seen our paycheck greatly, you know, dwindle in, the, in what we can spend our money towards. Um, I am a current member of the SEIU 620 bargaining team, and um, 
My goal today is to positively inspire you to empower your lead negotiator and their team to have additional funds in order to get a deal done. Um, and uh, the way I like to do that is with facts. So uh, really quick, uh, comparable counties, Sonoma County uh, recently passed a deal giving 5% in the first year, four and a half and then four in the following years. And Solano County recently passed a deal of five, four and three. Um, and then the ones that I consider more important are your competitors. Um, Ventura recently passed a deal for five and a half, four and three and a half. The city of Santa Barbara, five and a half, five and a half and four. The city of Ventura, 5% plus a 1.75 lump sum. The city of Santa Maria, five and five. And finally, this board itself authorized a very well-deserved 5% raise to an underfunded uh, under position. Um, and the reason uh, I was hoping to really get your attention was that common number that keeps coming up in that first year. And to just make you aware of it so that when the, um, your side of it comes back to you, you're just, you understand kind of where we're coming from, what our members see, and what they're hoping to, you know, start with in that, in that first year. Um, uh, CEO Misoto, Misoto, uh, talked about a, a theme of prudence and progress. And the definition of prudence is skill and good judgment in the use of resources. And a constant theme from this budget workshop was that some things aren't as fun to fund. They're not sexy, they're not uh, as, as uh, fun a headline, um, but they're necessary. Uh, they're infrastructure. And I really view us as kind of an infrastructure type of deal where we're, uh, we really need those funds in order to keep our positions and we like being with the county. And so um, I just want to say thank you. I know you're doing your best and I really appreciate it. Thank we, you. We will now go to Christina Rubio, who's our final speaker on general public comment. Christina. Hi, my name is Christina Rubio and I am an AOP with the Sheriff's Office. I am one of the many employees who work in support of our law enforcement officers. And I am here today to make you aware of the discouragement my coworkers and I are experiencing. We are discouraged because fewer and fewer of us can thrive as a county employee, and most of us are just surviving. For example, a coworker who had been with the Sheriff's Office for over 15 years, spent the last two years working as much overtime as she could to provide for her current and her future needs. Unfortunately, she no longer could maintain that type of schedule and decided to separate from the county. Last weekend, another, co another colleague who has over 10 years of experience with the sheriff's office shared with me that she could not provide for her children the way that was needed on her county wage and she also was making plans to leave the county. Myself, I spend $707 a month commuting to my work location this year's budget cannot be like other years. This year needs to be different. Your employees are struggling to pay for gas, to pay for groceries, and pay for health care. So I'm asking you to direct your staff to budget more appropriately for today's cost of living and show your constituents that you support those who support our law enforcement officers. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes general public comment okay. for today. Thank you, and I apologize for closing off before we got there, so it was confusing. All right, thank you very much. We're, we are done until April 23rd. The under.